The following is a presentation of the St. Louis Chess Club. Things are getting wild at the Superbet Chess Classic in beautiful Bucharest, Romania. Players are on the prowl and sharpening their claws to fight their way up the standings. Reigning GCT champ Alareza Ferruja got back to an even score with a solid win over Bogdan Dea. The battle of the former challengers did not disappoint, with Fabiano Caruana grinding down co-leader Jan Napomniachi for the win. There's a new king of the leaderboard. Can he be dethroned? Day five of Ferocious Chess, coming up next. Welcome back everybody to day five of the 2023 Superbet Chess Classic held here in Bucharest, Romania. We start the day in front of two iconic landmarks here in the center of Bucharest. The statue of Mihai Eminescu as well as the Romanian Athenian. While we've had some fantastic chess up to this point, let's go to the studio in St. Louis and start day five action. We welcome you to the first stop on the 2023 Grand Chess Tour and our coverage of Superbet Romania. We come to you live from the St. Louis Chess Club. Hello and welcome everyone to our show. Thanks for joining us again. I'm Nazi Paikidze and I'm here with my brilliant co-host Yasper Sarawan. My brilliant co-host is uh, Nazi. It's been great calling the action yeah. with you and Vart yesterday. We thought it was going to be a quiet day, right? but at the very end, <laughs> we had a lot of victories. Oh yes, and uh, we after the last round uh, emerged the sole leader, Fabiano Caruana, which makes tournament even more exciting. Absolutely. Hello everyone and welcome to our live coverage. Indeed, we are in round five and we have a sole leader. It was packed at the top. But one Fabiano Caruana grasped the mantle and is in sole lead. It's in, indeed, let's take a look at all the standings. Nazi, do the honors, right. please. Uh, so in the first place at the moment, we have American Fabiano Caruana with three points, followed by American Wesley So and Romanian Richard Rappert with two and a half. Nice chasing and, pack. <laughs> and with 50%, we have Ali Rija Firuja from France, representing Fide Jan Nepomnishi, New world champion from China, Ding Liren, wow. and Dutch number one, Anish Giri. And with one and a half, we have MVL from France. Defending champions not looking so good today. Uh, uh, yeah. Jan Christoph Duda from Poland. Right. And with one point, Romanian Bogdan Daniel Diak. And tell us about the format. Right, we have a 10 player round robin with a classical time control. 90 minutes for the first 40 moves, 30 minutes for the rest of the game, and 30 second increment from move one. Exactly. There are no draw offers, and there's a regular scoring system with one point for a win, half for a draw, and zero for a loss. Tell us about the remaining schedule of the event. Right, today players are playing round five, and tomorrow they will have a rest day. Everybody's looking forward <laughs> to tomorrow. <laughs> After that, they'll be back to play four more rounds, and the tournament will finish on May 15th. Wonderful, and of course, calling all the action alongside us has been Var. Var, good to see you this morning. Uh, looking forward to another exciting round of chess. Good morning, guys. Yeah, very exciting chess, and we had an um, interesting round uh, uh, last round and uh, two decisive games, Fabiano winning against Nepo in this equal end game and Firuja getting his first win. So I'm looking forward to the rounds today. But let's take a look at the standings. And uh, at the top, we have Fabiano Caruana with three points, plus two score. He is the clear leader of the tournament. And then we have two players tied for second place, Wesley So, who, who perhaps could have had even more points, actually. He had some missed opportunities and Richard Report. Now, 
Now let's take a look at the road ahead for this uh, the leaders here. So he's playing Deak. Definitely a big opportunity here for Wesley. Deak has been struggling. He's been getting into time pressure every game. So I see a big chance here for him in this round. In round six, he will play the new world champion Dingleren. This should be a very interesting and tough matchup. And of course, in round seven, he's playing the leader, uh, Caruan, uh, Fabiano Caruana. That should be a very, very tough American matchup. Then we have Richard Report. He is facing Anish Giri. Anish has been very solid so far with four draws. Then he will play MVL. And in round seven, I, I see a big opportunity for Richard here to try to win this game against Deak. And now the leader of the tournament, Fabiano, is playing Duda, who's been having a pretty difficult tournament so far. Even though Fabi is playing with the black pieces, I think he will try to maybe complicate the position and maybe look for some opportunities here. And then round six, he faces Firuja. Should be a very interesting top matchup. And round seven, he's playing Wesley Saul. And we're going to go to Romania to our colleague, Grandmaster Christian Cirilla. Thanks, Var, and welcome back, chess fans, to Bucharest, Romania, for day five here at the 2023 Superbet Chess Classic. And this is the day before the rest day, so you know the players are going to try to live it all on the chessboard. Every single ounce of energy they will try to muster in today's round. But one game that I'm definitely having my eyes on is a battle of champions. That is the game between Ali Reza Firuja, the defending Grand Chess Tour champion against the newly crowned king of the jungle, Ding Liren, the world champion. And this one is such a hotly contested matchup. No wins for either of the players, four draws. But you know, today, both of these players are going to try to break the ice. And as you can see right there, Ali Reza Firuja coming off hot from a very important victory with the black pieces yesterday against Bogdan Daniel Deak. I have to say completely different ways in which they got to where they are today at 50%. Ali Reza lost against Wesley So, but yesterday, as I already mentioned, bounced back with a crucial victory with the black pieces against Bogdan Daniel Deak. And I have to say, the last few rounds, Ali Reza is definitely looking like he is hitting up in this tournament. One player that is not hitting up is Ding Li Ren up to this point, but we know he's a slow starter. He had some problems in his matchup against Yanne Pomniashi, but outside of that, his tournament has been pretty tamed so far. Nevertheless, this one is going to be a huge clash, and we have so many others. The atmosphere here, guys, in Bucharest is just simply electrifying. The fans are ready for a day five. We, as commentators, are ready, and as you guys already saw, the players are coming in hot as well. We have some exciting matchups on our hands. Thank you, Christian. Indeed, a big clash there, as you've highlighted. But uh, yeah. lay the table for our viewers, Nanji, and tell us about all the pairings for this round five. All right, let's see today's matchups. We have Yanni Pomniche playing MBL. Both of those players are going to be looking for a win. Duda against our soul leader, right. Caruana. Right. Uh, Firuzpa against Ding. Great match. Wesley Saw so against Diak. Okay, Wesley is thinking, I got the white pieces, I gotta perform. Yes, the try. And Anish Giri against Rupert. Again, uh, Richie in good position, but uh, Anish, if he's gonna make a, a shout, now's a good time. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of fights ahead. What are they fighting for? As we get a view of the players uh, taking their seats and uh, shaking one another's hands. Uh, they're playing for a lot of money. There's a, a the total prize fund for this tournament is $350,000. And the first place winner is going to get $100,000. Second place, $65,000. And third place, $48,000. Very handsome prize fund all the way down to the 10th and final position of $10,000. Everyone's going to get a good paycheck. 13 grand chess tour points up for grabs. You win clear first, you get a bonus of one. Tie for first and you start splitting the grand chess tour points. The player with the most grand chess tour points at the end of the tour gets an additional bonus of $100,000. So grab those grand chess tour points quickly and early as we see our tournament leader there, Fabiano, with the black pieces. And, you know, even though there's four rounds, you know, a couple of players have got targets on their back. Mm -hmm. Dayok, Duda, but you can't always beat the targets, too. You no, know, right? definitely not. 
As we're getting ready, uh, we hear some of the public announcement. We've got uh, a couple of uh, first moves, if you will. Uh, three uh, people be making ceremonial first moves, I believe. And thanks again for super well. Make possible this great event in Bucharest, and not only in Bucharest, also, as Superbet uh, is also a supporter of the uh, Marshall uh, Rock. So, at the third table, between Jan Christoph Duda and uh, the current leader of the round, Fabiano so, Carmona. Albrecht, uh, the CEO uh, of Deezer, one of our many sponsors. Wonderful that Hans, look at this, E2E4. He's ready to go. Uh, makes the first move there. Thank you very much. It's very, very nice, not only when you do have sponsors, but when the executives come show up and, and, show up and, uh, and give it their personal endorsement, if you will. Uh, I always appreciate that, so thank you, Hans. Anna Maria Brunze is now a member of the European Olympic Committee, and uh, I'm glad to welcome her on stage for Owning the table of uh, Anna Maria Brinza. And this lady, Anna Marie Brinza. Uh, she is a Romanian fencer. Wow. Yeah. She's shaking all the competitors' <laughs> hands, you know, not just the ceremonial first move. Okay. Come on, Wesley. <laughs> Make a decision. D2, D4. Very nice. Now that I'm thinking about it, I don't think I have ever met a fencer, a champion Neither fencer. Have I. I've been missing out. I've got to get out more. <laughs> and we have one final person, I believe, who will be doing an opening first move. We're expecting Sasha, Sasha Dragic, who is the founder of the Supervet Group, the namesake sponsor. We might not have uh, Sasha today. And some uh, su surprising insight on uh, the head to head between these two players. Wow, MBL has a big lid. Whoa! That came out of nowhere. Only a single win for Nepo and six losses. Wow. Didn't see that coming. Didn't see that coming. The men draw, sure. And, uh,. Whoa, oh, look at that. <laughs> E4, C5, but uh, not an open Sicilian, the Aleppin, C2, C3, which... It's been a while since I've seen this on right. this level. Exactly. I'm trying to, I was just trying to guess myself when was the last time I saw it at the very highest level. Very popular at the club level, sure. avoiding, uh, you know, the Nidorfs and the Taimanovs and the Dragons. E4, C5, C3, is this something that uh, is a part and parcel of Nepo's repertoire? Do you think it may be world championship prep, uh, Var? Uh, it's possible. It's, you know, because you spend so much time preparing for the world championship, Yasser, and, you know, you look at some of the sidelines, maybe idea for one game. So perhaps he prepared for one game, this C3, and uh, he's thinking this is a good moment to try to play this and surprise NVL with it. Yeah, uh, and Nasi raised a really good point that it, at the very highest levels, uh, it's not a move that you see that often. Um, <coughs> for yourself, when 
what what was the last really 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 high profile game that you can remember featured the twenty eight hundred guys? I, th I think uh, I've seen it in Blitz more often, Blitz, but in classical, sure. I I can't recall. Yeah, <laughs> I am I'm I'm having a hard time. Uh, uh, finding a name. By the way, I remember this was like really hilarious. So at one time in his career, for whatever reasons, Hikaru uh, enjoyed playing f1, e4, e5, <laughs> queen, h5, right? Like, okay, just a terrible, terrible move, we understand. And uh, he was getting away with it. So against e4, c5, he came out with the outrageous queen, h5 anyway, which is like really mm -hmm. even more ridiculous. And I remember one opponent finally said, okay, enough's enough, and go ahead and have the pawn. And Hikaru went down in flames. It was really good. E4, C5, C3. I don't know why that inspired me to mention Queen <laughs> H5, but there we have it, C3. And I, I think MVL is just tanked for a moment. Yes, yes. He's right? trying to figure out what to play. Of course, D5 is the main, main line, and, uh, and Knight F6. So we have bo both options here. D5 or knight f6, probably gonna see one of these moves played. Uh, so he's just trying to maybe remember some of the analysis. He probably right. haven't haven't looked at this in a long time. Now a, a very decent option against uh, c2 c3, of course, is e7 e6 d2 d4. But when you do get into this position, you should be per be prepared play as black to play uh, against an advanced French, and that is why uh, d7 d5 takes, queen takes d5, and I remember even from the Garry Kasparov deep blue match wow. in Philadelphia, uh, uh, see, you can get this position or another very popular uh, line of play is to play d4, uh, pardon me, knight f6 and d4. Right. And uh, jump over to you, Var. And what do you, whoa, what do you, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, we have a sharp opening here, Archangelix, and uh, we have Duda playing with the white pieces, and he's in a situation where he needs to try to win a game, Yasser. If he Clear. wants to finish uh, high up, he needs to try to score a game. At this point, if he just makes draws, it's just not going to do anything for him. So he decided to play a very sharp opening. So let's take a look at the current position okay. and uh, how they got here. So it started off with. Um, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, a6, and uh, standard theory, and we see an aggressive move, bishop c5 here. Again, Fabi going for some sharp, uh, sharp lines here, perhaps also trying to have some chances to play for a win with the black pieces. Duda played a4. Now, after a4, you're threatening a takes b5, so you have some options with b4, or <coughs> rook b8 is another alternative here. Still a major theory at this point, and uh, I see over about 1,200 games played in a current position, d6. So we continue with d4. And uh, now a5 is played. So if you're, if you're wondering why, for example, black cannot just take, you cannot take with the bishop because of the simple move d5, deflecting the knight, and then you're going to lose the bishop on a5. And if you take back with the knight in this position, then actually the best move here is rook takes a5, sacrificing the exchange. And if you take back, you play d takes c5, and now the knight is under attack. And if you capture, white has a very, very strong initiative after queen takes d8, king takes d8, knight e5. In fact, a very, very big advantage now threatening to play knight c6 and knight f7. This would be a decisive advantage for white. So that's why after the move a5, Fabi played bishop a7, which is the only move here, essentially. So now we have h3. Important move here to prevent bishop g4 and also knight g4 at some point. And now we have bishop b7. Black is just trying to develop his bishop here. And we have a couple of more moves. Bishop e3 played knight e4 actually, sacrificing the pawn. Uh, still in theory here, about 50, 50 uh, games played. Rook e1 and knight e7. So this is the, this is the current position here. and. Uh, White is down a pawn, but the best move, according to the engine, is just to play knight bd2 and just continue with the development here. And if knight takes d2, bishop d2. And still I see one high profile game between Hare Krishna and uh, Gawain Jones here. And the white is a little bit better here after castle, d takes e5, and if you capture on e5, you have knight takes e5 move. Very sharp opening choice, and uh, 
ambitious, ambitious start. I think Duda is trying to generate some good winning chances for himself. Uh, I noticed that as you were going through your analysis there, Var, uh, Duda had a, a chance after knight takes e4. He played this move rook e1, I think to play the move d4, d5, and potentially win material, a variation he did not play. Could you tell us, because I, I can see that the engine is yes. suggesting the move d5, and he didn't play that move. How would that, how would that, have continued. Let's take a look at this, actually. Very good question, Yas. And in fact, in a database, there is a game of Duda with the white pieces against Vidit. Really? So, okay. Yes, from 2021 here. But the way the theory will develop here after this move, about 20 games I see here in a database. So bishop takes e3. Right. And if you, you take back with the pawn, this is just bad. Knight e7, black is just going to be up a pawn. So you have to take on c6 now. Now two black pieces are hanging. Are hanging. Yeah. But now white has this move, knight takes f2. Okay. And if Pause. you just, yeah, if you take with the rook, then I think after bishop, uh, actually, sorry, just bishop takes f2, king takes f2, bishop c6, and actually you have three pawns no, that's and a good. rook. This is to a lot of material here. Black will be much better here. But I was thinking queen d5 or in, after the knight takes f2, couple of moves, right? For yes, you have queen e1 attacking the bishop. You have queen e2 is the top move here. And Qu even queen d5? Let's see here, queen d5. Uh, That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, pretty crazy. I agree here. Black can play even queen f6. No kidding. And now protecting uh, f7. And um, if you take on b7, right? knight e4 check. This is winning for black now. Because oh. king h1, there is knight g3. Also the same problem. If you go to h2, there is a queen f4 check. Here. Nasty check. <laughs> so. You can't really take on b7 here, but you can play rook takes f2. Okay. Then uh, black can play bishop c8 here. You're going to take on f2 eventually and perhaps put the bishop on e6. Uh, it's showing actually a little bit better for black in this position. What an amazing variation. Wow. And it goes it's to show, sharp. right, yeah. how, how deep your analysis has to be, your preparation has to be enormous. And I beg your pardon, what conclusion did you reach about the current position, VAR? I mean, we're still in theory, are we? Yes, we're still in theory, Yasser, about 10 games played, and it's, <coughs> the engines are showing slightly better position uh, for white, but I think Fabiano is playing very quickly and confident. I think he's analyzed this position deeper. Okay. So I wouldn't be surprised if he comes up some, with some ideas. But uh, one of the main moves here is knight bd2. Just as I mentioned, just try to get the development. And another alternative is just to take on e5. And now this move actually forces the move bishop takes e3. And after that, white will uh, play rook takes e3. And uh, black just castles. And doesn't look like there are any problems for black here. Now he is, no. uh, king is already... Uh, castled and pieces are well developed. Uh, knight bd2, for example, could be played, but uh, black can respond with the move knight c5. And, uh, Looks and fine. like in black's knights in this position. Yeah. Have some knight, look, knight f5 ideas mm -hmm. coming up. So Looks it's, fine. Looks absolutely fine here for black. Yeah, well, Fabi definitely uh, seems to be relaxed mm -hmm. as he's doing the pacing as is uh, Nepo, and usually, again, Anish Giri are the pacers. Um, I wanted to say that as we came on the show, we were all highlighting uh, Ali Reza, uh, right. our Grand Chestor champion, defending champion, versus the new world champion, Ding Laren. Let's just uh, drop in on that game and see how things developed. Again, Ding Laren playing the black pieces, having a very quiet tournament, and as you pointed out, Var, uh, Ali Hureza getting in a shot mm -hmm. yesterday, taking a shot earlier, both players at 50%, looking uh, at that uh, pack of leaders in front of them saying, we need a win. Yeah. And somebody needs we a win. We have another Will Lopez. Exactly, with uh, Bishop with to a Berlin D3. Right. Yeah, it's a Berlin, yeah. And I always felt that after this move, Bishop C5, that black actually has what I would describe as a strategic threat, 
Which is? The strategic threat is that the knight on c6, strangely enough, is not as good as the knight on f3. The knight on f3 not only defend, attacks the e5 pawn, it defends the king, and in many cases, the black knight finds itself on the wrong square. Standing in front of the c pawn, you end up playing a knight e7, or mm -hmm. sometimes a chikor in knight a5. So if you castle, black gets to carry out this move, knight d4, attacking the bishop. And although a lot of games have continued mm -hmm. like this, knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, I've always considered that black got to carry out a strategic threat of trading a slightly lesser knight for the better knight on f3. It doesn't mean that he's got automatic mm -hmm. equality, but you can imagine black is about ready to play c6, d6. It's pretty e easy play. That is why I believe the move c2, c3 is not only m the most popular move, but in some ways, in my way of thinking, a necessary move. c3, castles, castles, d5. Now, whenever black gets to play d7, d5, if you don't punish him, mm -hmm. it's sort of like he's played in the black center for free. Mm -hmm. And so let's see if, in fact, uh, Ali Reza can punish a ding, uh, early trade on, on e5, a5, and we are still deeply in theory. And what does theory tell us uh, about these positions, Var? Is, is the opening move uh, still enough for anything serious, or? Not as much theory here, Yasser, but I see some really high-profile games here. So, for example, we have a game between Carlson and Kramnik, Wesley against Hikaru, Rajabov against Nakamura, a lot of uh, high profile games and it looks like mixed results. Black is actually doing okay in these lines and a couple of wins I see. Um, so after the move queen c2, black uh, plays queen e7 pretty much exclusively here. All the games I see here are after the move queen e7 here. The mm -hmm. idea is you want to defend your uh, e5 pawn because I think at this point already White is considering to take on c6 and maybe pick up the pawn on e5. So queen e7. And now um, white can play the move a4 here, which I think is a logical move here. Try to prevent black at some point from playing a4 and also securing the b5 square. So later on in the game, when you put the knight on c4, you're not gonna have, you don't have to worry about the move b5 here. Uh, but here, actually, the best move is actually very interesting. It's uh, you play the move knight b8. You're avoiding this idea of bishop c6, and now you want to just regroup here. Put the pawn on c6, let's say bishop on g4, and you can play knight bd7 here. Mm -hmm. And it looks like black is actually doing fine in this, uh, in this line here. Uh, knight b3, you simply play the move bishop b6. And uh, if you continue with bishop g5, if you just, just play a logical developing move, then c6 comes in. Bishop go back to e2 and uh, h6. So just a very solid position here. I don't see any, any advantage here for white. Yeah, and in their head-to-head -head clash, neither player has ever managed to defeat the other for only four games. And that's not that surprising because Ali Reza is so very young. Yep. I believe all of them are years old, but uh, there you see them. Um, when I see these E4, E5 structures, one player that I studied very seriously as a teenager, and I'm really, really proud of myself that I managed to pick that player, Paul Carez. Paul Carez was absolutely phenomenal on both sides of these E4, E5, where the deep pawns mm -hmm. are gone. And it was sort of like he really, really, really set a very, very high standard. And uh, from my study of his games, um, I've always liked um, the white side and uh, the fact that the knight on c6 is so oftentimes misplaced mm -hmm. as the pawn on c3 does this great job of controlling the knight and then uh, knight b8 is a demonstration of that. But let's jump to Bucharest and Christian with a special guest. Thanks, uh, Yasser. We are with Hans uh, Holger Albrecht, uh, the chairman of the board at the Superbet Group. Uh, Hans Holger, welcome to the show. Tell us a bit about the similarities, because you're big in the business world, the similarities between chess and business. Well, I think the, uh, there are many probably. I think the, one of the most important ones is um, that you have to, to think long term. 
in, in business as well. Um, quite often there's a risk that you go very short term. And I guess it's the same in chess. If you, if you just act short term, you may lose out at the end. So the kind of uh, long term horizon is probably uh, the first point. And the second point is um, when you're in a competitive environment, uh, know your competitor, try to analyze your competitor. And uh, in a fair game, try to outsmart him. I think that's uh, probably the most two biggest uh, comparisons you have. And we know that super bad, super bad group, super bad foundation, they're uh, big in helping the young generation mm -hmm. uh, aspire to these great heights of these players that we have here on the stage. Uh, tell us a bit about that and how important it is for them to, for the young generation to think analytically, to study chess, things of uh, this nature. Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's important from a company point of view that you, you take care of this. It's, it's, it's not uh, a big company like super bad company just for business and, and, and uh, for, for the product as well, giving back to society, helping society to develop. And uh, for young people, of course, when, when you talk about chess, it's, uh, I mean, A, it's focusing on, on something for, for a while, which is, uh, which the intention spam you have nowadays mm. uh, with your young generation is, uh, is very different. And secondly, as well, as I said, to train your brain to, to, to think various scenarios, to analyze, and then come to a conclusion as well. Uh, again, which is important in life because you can analyze things, but at the end of the day, you need to decide something as well. I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Who is your uh, favorite player in this competition? In this competition? <laughs> we have remember. the world champion, we have Ding Li Ren, we have Fabiano Caruana from uh, the US who is leading the pack. Ali Reza is my favorite. Bogdan Deak from yeah, Romania yeah. as well. But I mean, it's just my Ali name. Reza, okay, that's uh, a good Reza. one. I, that's I, a good one. So because I like his history and I, I spend a lot of time in business in, in France as well, obviously. So um, intuitively, I would say Ali Reza is my, my favorite. That's a great pick. Yeah. Hans, uh, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Guys, back. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Hans. Uh, Ali Reza, nice, nice pick. A lot of people's uh, favorites. Exactly. Again, uh, one of these E4, E5 games I've got in front of me. Um, uh, Wesley So uh, is uh, position against Diak. And just uh, here earlier, uh, this idea that this knight on C6 mm -hmm. is kind of a little bit of a problem piece. if. Black could just reach under the board and say, let me take away this knight, let me take away the knight on d2. And mm -hmm. the chances of equality just go really, really high. And uh, how did uh, Daniel uh, solve the problem of his knight? Well, he, he used a, man a maneuver uh, that Vladimir Kramnik, uh, Anatoly Karpov, and many, many others, uh, you, you move to e7, you move to g6. Once the knight gets to the g6 square, uh, likewise it defends the pawn on e5. It gives another measure of support to the black king, but more importantly, it just kind of gets out of the way mm -hmm. so that you're ready to play c7 and c6 in our much vaunted challenge in the center with the move d5. All of this is theory as uh, the players are still um, no, when I first yeah. uh, saw the current position, I thought yeah. this was also Rui Lopez because Bishop was on b5. Right. And I thought it was very similar to uh, Ali Reza Ding game. Exactly. But apparently they started as an Italian game. Indeed. With the Ita yeah, the opening. It looks a lot more like Rui Lopez. Yeah, <laughs> there you go, Bishop c4. And yeah. Because we also have a5 here, just like Ding just played. Right. Yeah, very yeah. similar position. Exactly. And Var, uh, what uh, games have caught. Uh, your attention uh, in the opening this far? Uh, there are a few, few games here, but in particular, I want to switch to this one game. It's a French defense answer. Okay. So it's the game between Anish Giri and Richard Report. And actually, the same opening was played in a world championship match between uh, Nepo and Ding, I was told. And uh, he, Report played a very rare move, actually, in the opening here. So in this position, so it's the standard uh, French defense, the Tarash variation. So Knight gf3 played, and now c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, and e takes d5, a6. This is a very rare move here. The main lines are queen takes d5 and knight takes d5 here. But he played the move a6, and uh, just to surprise Anish a little bit here. Question for did Ding also play a6 in the championship? Uh, I think it, it was, mm, I don't think a6 was played uh, in that game here. Knight, Knight takes D5 was played mm -hmm. in a world championship okay. game. Sure. So A6, again, this is a preparation, I think, between Ding and Richard, and we see them uh, playing the first <coughs> once again. So now, actually, Anish spent a little bit of time here, about four minutes here, and decided to play the move Knight D2 to F3. 
protecting the knight on d4 and now getting ready to capture on e6 here. So now you have to capture back, so queen takes d5 and c4 is played. Actually, uh, it's amazing that after only like eight moves, we we're in a very rare position here. Only one game I see in a database here. After the move c4, bishop d3, there are 17 games played here. Bishop e2, another six games, but c4 is, is very rare. Only one game between two um, grandmasters from Russia here. So the queen is under attack here, and we need to understand where to put this queen here. So you have, uh, we have two options here. Queen a5 check is one option, but even the best move is actually queen d8. Going back uh, there, and oftentimes you just want to put the queen on d8 here to make sure it's not going to be under attack. And if white is just developing bishop e2, we can just play bishop d6. Now let's say castle, and you can even play the move e5 here. Questioning the knight here, knight doesn't have any good squares to go to. You cannot go to b5, you cannot go to a5, and if you play something like knight, uh, knight c2 or knight, knight b3, let's say knight c2, and black doesn't have any problems here. Knight will go to c6, bishop on f5, and very comfortable position here for black, and a good control of the center as well. Harmonious uh, development to be sure. Once again, uh, the head-to-head -head matchups. Whoa, wow. <laughs> some real surprises in these head-to-head. -head. Uh, Anish Giri with a very uh, dominant four wins, no losses, five draws. Didn't see that one coming yeah, either. Yeah, surprising. And uh, as always, we enjoy your comments. Join the discussion, uh, challenge our panel, and send us your mm -hmm. tweets. Right, you can send us your tweets using hashtag SuperBadChessClassic, or you can tag Grand Chess Tour. You can also send your questions uh, via YouTube or Twitch channels on St. Louis Chess Club. Yes, and uh, we enjoy a good challenge. Uh, I must say, I have played the French defense for decades, and I have had this position in my tournament practice, and more or less, without too much discussion, I've always played knight takes d5 and not mm -hmm. really thought anything beyond the fact, well, I'm just recapturing the pawn. But when I saw the move a7, a6 for the first time, and I'm seeing it literally for the first time, mm -hmm. I'm sitting there saying, gosh, I wonder why I never considered that move. There is so much I like about this move because it basically is asking a question for white. White would love just to play bishop d3, castles, knight f3 and just get on with business. The problem with the immediate bishop f3 is now queen takes d5 is really brilliant. A lot of times you don't like to play the move queen takes d5 because knight b5 mm -hmm. really annoys you. And the problem is, well, a6 just stops that. Now queen takes d5 does all kinds of good things and the move a7, a6 is just so useful. So the main idea of a6 is to Present prepare, the position for you. Right, and prepare it, queen takes d5. And to play mm -hmm. queen takes d5. So even, I'm sure, Anish was actually even considering moves like c2, c3, anticipating that a queen takes d5, you might want to play queen b3. I'm not even sure about that. But I love what Farah was saying, that uh, once you go queen takes d5, queen d8, bishop, bishop d6, and let, let, let's again get to the current position, mm -hmm. c2, c4. If the Scandinavian was good for black, e4, d5. Mm -hmm. e4 would be a bad move because the Scandinavian, if mm -hmm. it's good, it just kills e4, right? And I always think about that when I get to such positions is if I were to transpose into a Scandinavian, and again, uh, Var is pointing out that the engine prefers queen d8, not the move queen a5 check. But as a person who respects the Scandinavian, if you could get away with a Scandinavian um, and make equality, I'm looking at this position. I don't think it's that bad uh, black seems for fine. black. It, it looks like a pretty decent Scandinavian to me. Anything like that suggests trades, trades, trades. I don't think you should really put this as a feather in your cap and say, you know, I've got a big advantage or something. Yeah. I don't feel that to be the case. So I'm not sure, uh, but I think Richie's opening problems, really, Var, they're behind him. And I appreciate Queen D8. Mention Queen A5 for a moment. 
What, what's wrong with Queen A5? And does the engine consider white to be better after Queen A5 check? No, you're absolutely right. Queen A5 is another very good move here. It's second best move in this position. I think it's just, again, pretty comfortably equalizes the game. I can show you a couple of uh, moves after Please. Queen A5. So, of course, uh, sometimes we want to play the move Queen A5 because also the tempo, because we go Queen D8, we can feel like we're losing some tempo here. But Queen A5, actually, we're giving a check immediately. So that actually forces the move uh, Bishop D2. Right. And now Bishop B4. Right. And here, uh, you can take, but also you can play, perhaps play the move A3 here. Computers, best move here is to play bishop e2. The choice is just to develop here. After bishop e2, yeah. uh, simply bishop takes d2, queen takes d2, and now we exchange the queens. And here, you can take with the king, or you can take with the knight as well. Both moves are, are just equal here. So if you take with the knight, for example, then I'm seeing king zeros e7. behind you. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, it's all zeros. King is very comfortable on e7, and then we can play the move b6, bishop b7, and just complete the development here. I don't see any any problems here for, for black. black. By yeah. the way, Richard has made a move, and he played bishop before check. Right. Uh huh. Bishop before check played immediately. Okay, so I think, guys, this will probably transpose into that line, bishop right. b2, and then queen a5 will be played. So I think this is forced. Now, queen a5. And if you don't me mind me being a little bit of a pest, after the move bishop e2 var, is knight e4 disconcerting at all? Is that a move that, uh, I mean, you don't really want to take on b4 mm -hmm. and be forced to move your king or something like that, right? Yes. Ah, knight b3, sorry. There, there is a knight b3 here. There is also... Um, knight b3, uh, apologies. Yeah. yeah, you can also play a3 here. But again, even even here, it just shows how comfortable is black's position. There, It's not like you have to play the only way to equalize. You can even play knight e4. You're still absolutely fine here. Yeah, sir. So a3, for example, right. one of the lines is you play knight takes d2. Right. And... Uh, if you take back with the knight, I, I will just go back bishop e7, and black has the pair of the bishops. If uh, you take on before, this is a pawn sacrifice here. Knight <coughs> f3 check, bishop f3, queen takes b4, and now white has to play the move queen d2, essentially sacrificing pawn for some initiative. You cannot take on c4. This is very important to right. note here because of the move rook c1, and now you're losing your bishop and a rook after. So. Uh, you know, you cannot capture more, more than one pawn in this position, so just after queen d2, uh, queen d6 is equal, queen b6 is another alternative. So I even here, you can win a pawn and just go queen d6, and you should be able to uh, have a very comfortable position. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for that, Var. And in just catching up on the game between Ali Reza and Ding Lerin, uh, just as you suggested, queen e7, and after a2, a4, the move knight c6 to b8, which again kind of reinforces mm -hmm. what I had mentioned, that sometimes in these e5, e4, e5 structures, the knight on c6 is misplaced. And uh, knight I'm b8. I'm going to assume Ding's Please. preparation in this uh, Rui Lopez must yes. be... Outstanding. Outstanding, Just, because yeah, this was Jan's main choice of opening in the World Championship right. match. So I'm sure he... He knows everything there is to know about exactly. this position here. Yeah, a, a career, if you will, uh, with e4, e5. Uh, just catching also up. I just noticed that in every game we have e4 today. And is that right? Yeah. None of my openings are being played. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. It's all e4s, yes. Indeed. Uh, just catching up also on the game uh, between Duda and Fabi. When we left it, uh, pretty much the position was uh, this one after castles. Mm -hmm. Bishop c2, chasing the knight. Knight uh, from e4 back to c5. And you were mentioning yourself, Narzi, if you get to play knight d5 for free, like mm -hmm. just make a, a soft move, knight to d2, for example. I kind of consider this a right. little bit of a soft move. Knight to d5. First of all, that's a tempo against the rook. And... You, you said, I, I start mm -hmm. liking Black's Knights, and I'm with you on this one. Knight comes to f4, and you start looking at d, knight dropping in in d3, and there's some yeah. uh, harmony going on in Black's... A little bit of Black's, pressure on the king side. Yeah, so um, probably knight d2 is not the theory. 
How is white supposed to get an advantage uh, uh, as we see the head-to-heads? A lot closer, yeah. by the way. Uh, one win, two losses. They also haven't Dito. played each other too many times yet. Not so many, mm -hmm. no. Um, yeah, but a nice head-to-head. -head. Um, VAR, clear some cobwebs for us. It's early morning here in St. Louis, <laughs> but after the move, Knight C5, what is, what's the rook doing on E3? Why, how is white supposed to get an edge? Well, white doesn't really have an edge. Okay. That's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the answer to that. But the knight 2 is fine here, Yasser. You really need to get that knight developed and get, okay. the, uh, get the rook into the game as well here. But uh, just the line that you guys were looking at after knight d5, we can go a little bit deeper here. I think sure. white actually needs to play some precise moves to make sure he doesn't get into trouble here. And again, we see Fabiano still one hour and 33 minutes, so he is just very, very comfortable. Duda already spent 20 minutes here, so... Uh, I. Yeah, I think uh, we will see how the game will develop. So let's take a look at the 9BD2 first here. Okay. And, uh, and there, there are some other alternatives here. But first, let's just look at this first. 9D2, 9D5. Right. Now attacking the rook. You don't want to put the rook only two because of 9 f 4 tempo. So rook E1. Right. And now 9 f 4 And now you have this threat of uh, knight to D3 here. And here, uh, white really needs to put this knight on E4 here. Try to exchange some pieces to make sure he's he, he's not actually worse here. So after knight e4, you can take knight takes e4, bishop e4, and here you have this interesting option here. You can try to go d5, attacking the bishop. Like and an when open, the bishop bishop yeah. goes back to uh, bishop b1 is apparently a better move than bishop c2. I guess with some ideas of queen c2 later on. Okay. And now you play the move c5. You really need to play the move c5 before white can put a pawn on b4 and control the c5 square here. So this is quite important. And now after queen c2, g6. And oftentimes in this position, this knight will just go back only six here. Does and that black uh, just look better here? <laughs> to my eyes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like an open Sicilian where black has no problem. Oh, 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 open, not open Sicilian, an open Spanish. Yeah, it shows zeros here in this position. Um, Remarkable. Uh, after, uh, let's say, queen d2, knight d6, the line goes on a little bit, queen h6, and uh, black can play here d4 or c4. I don't see any problems here. But I think there is another alternative here. Uh, let's take a look here. Perhaps the move knight g5. Let's look at this here. Try to put pressure immediately on h7 here. Okay. This is a very concrete move, and perhaps this is why Duda is thinking. He's trying to see if maybe he can play this move. So the h7 pawn is under attack, and I think we have only two options here, g6 or h6. Let's analyze both of these moves. So if h6 is played, there is a knight h7 move. Okay. Attacking the rook forcing the move rook e8 and after that <coughs> there are some options here rook g3 for example or queen g4 here well this is much more exciting <laughs> from white's point of view because at least in this position var the rook on e3 can become useful right now the rook is just a target that gets mm -hmm. pushed back to the first rank and the, the exact moment that you're showing whether it's queen g4 or rook g3 you start to get enthusiastic, right? Okay. Absolutely. Sorry, yeah. please continue. Um, Queen yeah, G4. Let's go, let's go a couple of more moves in this line here. Sure. Because this, this could actually happen, I think. Queen G4. Okay. Now we're threatening Knight F6 check. So again, uh, there are two options here. Knight G6 is apparently also okay for black. But just a logical King H8, just a more natural move. And here's Knight F6. Sacrificing wow. the Knight, attacking the Rook. So captures. Now rook g3. Very wow. concrete idea, just trying to give a checkmate on g7. And, uh, <coughs> and, and rook g8. And rook g8. And as we know, a lot of these lines end in a perpetual or repetition at some point. And I think this is, this is one of them here. Queen f4 or even queen h4. Both moves, I think, they lead to the same, same position same here. Same outcome, yeah. Rook g6 now. We need to play to protect h6. And now wow. <laughs> bishop g6, let's say. Knight takes g6, queen h6, king g8. If we take on f6, we're in big trouble after queen f6 here. Again, we don't have the development here, so I don't think white can really play for a win here. And uh, rook takes g6, captures queen g6. Uh, it's, it's very dangerous to go to f8 <coughs> because e takes f6. There could be some uh, mating ideas. So that's why we play the move king h8 here. And uh, 
here white needs to give a perpetual after. Now it's really hard to believe yes. that king f8 is dangerous because I'm up two pieces, well I'm up a piece and the knight's ready to jump back in to e6, defend g7. Yeah, right. let's take a look. Actually if you take and as it just takes and, and just now knight e6. Knight e6. Um, right. And uh, F4, so F4. very strong. <laughs> yeah, with the okay. idea F5, yes. It's That's alien. Yeah. That's alien. That's, yeah. That's not fair. Yeah. Uh, and the idea and is I F5. still have a tempo or two, so Queen E8 maybe? Queen E8, yeah. Queen then he actually gains a little time with this check. King F7, and now we see the problem because after this move F5. This is incredible queen G7 because is white queen. knight and rook are not even participating in the right. attack. Right, it's a queen and it's a pawn on F6. Pawns. And, and somehow they're winning. Yeah, and you're a piece up and, it, and it's winning. Again, uh, reminding everyone as we come into today's round five, we've got three players at the top, but Bobby has a plus two, three out of four, as he's uh, leading the field, uh, Wesley and Richard, a half a point behind him. That's a remarkable variation, and I liked you know, if I was in in um, Duda's shoes, Duda shoes you would go I'd be G5. playing knight g5 mm -hmm. because I don't like knight d2, knight mm -hmm. d5, knight f4. But that variation with knight g5, and you looked at one uh, variation to be to be clear, and I thought h7, h6 um, was the most challenging. Right. You know, you got to go knight h7, but you also mentioned. There is a g7, g6 uh, bar. Yes, let's take, take a look. Take us through those yeah. uh, lines, if you don't mind. Yeah, so if g6 is played, this, then now the idea is to blockade, uh, uh, the idea is to blockade this diagonal. Right. Um, now there is a move uh, e6. Really? Yes. And I'm it, surprised uh, by that, but okay. Uh, trying to capture on f7, so, and mm -hmm. it gets really complicated now, I think. Uh, if we open up the F file, let's say F takes E6. F takes E6 here, okay. If F takes E6, then I think just Knight takes E6. Take okay. back. Take back. Take back. Rook takes E6. Okay, I'm confounded. I would I have thought that, <laughs> that Black <laughs> yeah. is a happy camper that after, I don't know, Knight F5. Uh, yeah, Knight the, F5, the Knight D2. Is useful. Now, uh, white is uh, slowly catching up on the development, and it looks like Black's king is a little bit weak here. And uh, small, small advantage here for white. Some bishop b3 ideas. If you play queen d7, there is bishop b3, for example, here. Advantage white. That's okay. Yeah. I, wow. <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't think. That but this there was are many other alternatives here. To Let's, g6. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> af, uh, after g6, even, even I think there is a move here, knight f5. No, not, not here. I guess here is queen g4. The idea was if you capture uh, you take. Uh, queen takes, perhaps after the move g6, g6, e6, and here, yes, g6, e6, and here black is knight f5, which is the best option here. Yeah, wow. so if you get the queen into the game, attacking the knight here. He takes f7. And also attacking on uh, <laughs> e3 here. He takes f7, Right. king g7, actually. I think this position and these lines are convincing me to never play e4, e5. e4, e5. Because I am not this is crazy evaluating stuff. everything, Bar, anything th correctly. Th thank you for shaking the cobwebs this yeah. early in the morning. Let's jump to Bucharest and Christian can do more damage than we're already experiencing. <laughs> Just to give you guys a little bit of an insight about this position, uh, after a move bishop to c2, this game has been played once before in the database. I'm sure Varujan probably touched on this, and that game continued with f5. Fabiano played the move knight to c5, and at this point, I was in the playing hole just watching around, and then Nepo came out, stood up from his board, he was thinking about it, and started strolling around the playing hole, stopped at Fabiano's game and started looking, staring at Fabiano incredulously. He was like, why did you just play the move knight to c5? Isn't the Greek gift just right there in the position? Bishop takes h7, aren't you going to resign in uh, the next couple of moves? For a second, I was worried that Fabiano just missed bishop to h7, but of course, after uh, king takes h7, this just simply doesn't work because of one simple factor in the position, and that is 
the pawn on h3. If the pawn would be on h2, then this would be game over. Uh, because after king to h6, for example, of course, you're not going to go king to g8. Because of queen to h5, everybody knows how the Greek gift sacrifice usually um, finishes and is going to finish in a checkmate for white. King to h6, the problem is you cannot get the rook from e3 to the h file. With a pawn on h2, that would be game over after queen to g4, follow it up with rook to h3. The black king on h6 is going to get checkmated. Right now on the h file, you only have one square from which you're going to be able to target my king, and that is the square h4 in the position. That's why there are a couple of moves in which I can defend against your attack. One of them, and the most likely uh, the outcome in uh, this game would have been knight to g6 and the game is over. Uh, white would resign because you have absolutely no compensation for the sacrificed piece. You cannot get on the h file. You cannot uh, target my king on h6 and you don't have a dark square bishop either. So very interesting moment right now. Fabiano was his usual uh, confident uh, looking um, and Nepo was just simply incredulous. But you guys were mentioning knight to g5. To my eyes, this is not a practical decision because you're just simply burning all your bridges. After the move h6, and you know that, Fabiano, and I can tell you uh, a little bit of an insight, Fabiano has analyzed this quite tremendously. Um, so you don't want to enter this type of trenches with uh, Fabiano because after h6, knight h7, rook to e8, there's no way back. You have to find your way out. You start uh, getting tempted by ideas of knight to f6. It does look like you're getting very close to checkmating the black king, but it just simply doesn't get there. Fabiano with the black pieces probably knows exactly what he's supposed to do, and he would probably get uh, his way. For example, I was looking at some lines. Queen to g4 also makes a lot of sense to try to go knight to f6. Knight to g6, bishop takes g6, and now no, I'm not going to touch uh, that bishop on g6. I just used one piece. I used my knight. I gave it away so that I blocked the g file so that now you don't have knight to f6 uh, check and my g7 pawn is not pinned. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. This is, as you guys called it, alien chess in this position. You don't want to play this when you don't know exactly what uh, you're doing, when you haven't analyzed this position at home. And I can tell you from Duda's expression, uh, he hasn't analyzed this at home. He was kind of uh, bewildered about what's happening in the position. Right now, I can tell you what he's thinking. He's thinking to pull the brakes. How do I pull the brakes? How do I make a draw in the position? And that's why he played the move knight bd2. Well, probably the safest way, or at least what could be the safest way for white right now, is to try to get the knight to e4, exchange a bunch of pieces, go into the end game, and make a draw. Uh, but, you know, after knight to d5, the knight lands on f4, maybe on d3 as well. This is not that easy. So. Definitely, this is the mindset that I'm seeing from these two players right now. Duda, he got caught out of the opening. Fabiano uh, had tremendous preparation. Uh, took the right decision, not playing the move knight to g5. That was a very dangerous uh, bridge burning move. Uh, don't play that. Play the move knight bd2, get the knight to e4, exchange some pieces, and try to steer the game into the end game and make a draw as white. Fabiano probably is half happy with a draw because he knows he got um, quite a significant edge in knowledge in this position, not on the board objectively because the, the position is still very balanced, but in knowledge. He's analyzed this position at home, Duda probably hasn't. So this is um, the uh, dynamic that I'm seeing from these two players as of right now. Thank you, Christian. You know one of the joys of doing commentary and broadcasting, yeah. Nancy? is we get to sacrifice <laughs> the material, and if it doesn't work, so say yeah. la vie. Uh, Bar, that move bishop takes h7 check. Is it a dead end? Because, you know, those sacrifices can, you know, can be really awesome. And I was listening to what Christian was saying and the fact that Nepo himself kind of <laughs> stopped and said, are you allowing this really? You know, your king is going to walk the plank, right? Bishop takes h7 check. King takes h7. Knight g5 check. King h6, only move. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Christian was explaining, if there if that pawn were on h2, it'd be check and Game mate. Over. Queen g4, knight g6. There's no follow-up to this position. I mean, I was looking at rook g3 just for a second to threaten knight takes f7. 
uh, with mate. I saw the move queen e8, I stopped. But, you know, whenever you see the king on h6, you know, I, it, 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 it's a hunt. <laughs> Was there opportunity? Absolutely. No, I think it just doesn't work. It's it like, doesn't it's work. It's like minus six right now. For ah, black. just... And the move is queen d7 here. I think it's a very, even very, queen important, d7. A very important move because I see that you're setting up the knight f7 move. Right. With the queen g6. <laughs> and uh, it's it's a really clever idea, but just the queen, queen d7 is very, very concrete because now you're trying to exchange the queens. Right. And once the queens come off the board, the game will be over here. Clear. And, uh, and knight f7 now will be met by the move queen f7, just simply protecting the g6 knight. There's another alternative here. It's more complex here, but actually it's also winning here. Instead of knight g6, you can even just play the move knight f5 if you want to just simply, uh, you know, pick up the g5 uh, knight next because now the, uh, the rook is hanging and right. g5 is hanging and also you secured the h4 square so the, if you play queen takes f5 queen takes g5 this is another alternative so it right. just shows that uh, black doesn't even have to play the only move knight g6 there is also possibility with knight f5 and simply bishop h7 sacrifice doesn't work and as mentioned knight d2 was due to choice let's just uh, drop back in on uh, the game between Nepo and MVL, a uh, big, big heavyweight clash going on. And that was the uh, C2-C3. A lot of variation. Yeah. yeah. And, okay, MVL was a bit taken aback, took some time, did play the move mm -hmm. D7, D5, uh, main line, uh, knight A3, uh, knight C4. This certain echoes of the Richie Rapport game as well in mm -hmm. this, right? The queen is on d5. Sorry, Nancy. You were I about think to say. On, uh, since I I played this with Black before on knight a3, I haven't seen a6. I thought the main move was just drop queen, the queen back to queen d8. Queen d8. I think that's the main alternative. Okay. Yes. Yeah. A7, a6. If you don't get uh, uh, forked with the move knight c4 to uh, b6. Uh, you, you you may regret playing a6, <laughs> right? Okay, knight d7, a4. Okay, after knight d7, black is ready to play b5, a4, b6. And the players have reached, I'm going to say still we're in theoretical waters, a slightly better endgame for white. Yeah, more pleasant position for sure. You've got the queen side majority, and it's not easy for black to use a central majority, but okay. Uh, Sometimes you just uh, you uh, you don't have a good idea against the open Sicilian, and here's the surprising <laughs> lifetime results between these two players. Right, and BL has six wins, one loss, and ten draws. And one of the wins, yes, sir, you probably will remember this. So like a three Singfield Cup last round when yeah. NBL won in the Sicilian and secured the first place in the Singfield Cup and won the tournament thanks to that enormous victory. Uh, I, I've never seen MVL have such a great smile <laughs> uh, as he had at the end of that particular game. So knight d2, okay, we'll keep an eye on that. Dingler in? Sorry. Go back just for a moment sure. uh, to Geary Rapport game because okay. last time we looked, uh, we were talking about this end game where Richie could have taken on d2 and we said black has no issues. Exactly. We like this position. Bishop but takes d2. He decided to keep the queens on the board. Queen c7. And Anish responded with queen g5. Right. Forcing a castle. Yeah, gift me the pawn. And bishop b2. So do we think white's going to attack on the king's side? <laughs> uh, it's one of those positions where you could say right back here when uh, Richie decided to keep the queens on the board. And I agree. I think queen takes d2. Um, very practical decision. Mm -hmm. for, those of, for those players who really like Sicilians, they're probably sympathetic to keeping the queen on the board. In other words, once you have your pawn on a6 and you're not being harassed by knight b5 and or a dark squared mm -hmm. bishop, the queen on c7 is pretty good darn good. You know, mm -hmm. it just is kind of lurking and maybe on, <laughs> okay, just let me just play some bad moves for white, okay, just for a moment, b6, uh, castles, uh, bishop b7, and I want to just make uh, a bad move. How can I make a bad move? <laughs> yeah, something like this, right? Suddenly this queen on c7, you know, 
a move like knight g4 kind of might rock your world. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make some bad moves mm -hmm. to show that the queen on c7 can play some mischief on this uh, Sicilian style. Sicilian style. Uh, not to mention that sometimes the c4 pawn could be potentially weak mm -hmm. after a bishop takes. From white's point of view, uh, the queen on c7 is, let's say, nicely uh, hidden away. What's white's queen doing? Uh, one thing the white queen doesn't want to do is uh, become an open target along the d-file, like castles, castles, rook d8. With e5, the knight c6 yeah, threats. Yeah, you know, and you start to say, well, where should I put my queen, you know, do I put my queen on some silly square? So I think the idea wasn't so much to uh, start an attack with the move queen g5, so much as it was to kind of like maybe get out of the way, yeah. and maybe again to offer another type of queen trade with queen g3, or queen bishop e5 e2, maybe? or queen e5 maybe. Um, now having said all of that, I still have this overall sense that Richie's happy, like yeah. that black has traded off one set of minor pieces, uh, he doesn't have any targets, he has pretty decent development, you can see b6, Bishop b2, knight d7, or conversely, how do I develop this bishop? Rook e8, e5. And but more I'm looking at this position, I'm yes. coming up with ideas for white. Okay, please. Uh, I think white's going to castle we short and play b4 and uh, c5 and try Let, to let, let's get go, all let's the go. space on the queen side, right? Okay, uh, bishop e2, say I, I develop, okay. Say knight d7, right. Yes. Uh, castle. Okay, and again, uh, I look at my bishop and I say, you got, mm -hmm. you, you the naughty, you have to get into the game. Say b4. Okay, you've got your space, life is good. Bishop b7. And rook c1. Rook, a, presumably Probably. this one. Okay, rook c1. And let's say, am I afraid of c5? I shouldn't be afraid of c5 because I've got knight e4 kind of ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rook e8. I'm still not loving the queen on g5. Not at the of, moment. No, yeah. no, not yet, not yet. Yeah. And I don't know. My, my intention is to play rook to d8, complete Looks my fine. development, and just ask you, are you going to play c5? Or are you going to play for a5? Mm -hmm. Bar, jump in and tell us what game has caught your eye. Yeah, let's take a look at the, this game here. One thing I see uh, that uh, it's a little bit different, we see uh, Deak is actually playing very fast in this game. So he's got actually more time than Wesley saw here. And I wanted to uh, go over some of these lines here. So I think we left off around, uh, around here. Uh, so a5 uh, was played, so, and we continue now uh, h3. Bishop b5, again, oftentimes after bishop b5, white is considering to take on c6 and play the move d4 here. R bishop a7 played, knight e7, and now the, the idea is to transfer the knight on g6, as you mentioned, Yasser. And now knight f1, same thing, white wants to bring the knight to g3. And bishop d7 played, trying to exchange the bishops here, and uh, here we see the move bishop d3. Another alternative here was to play the move a4 to try to secure the b5 square. And if you take, for example, I think white will be happy to take back with the pawn here and right. open up the rook and put pressure on a5. But Wesley decided to retreat with the bishop here on d3. And uh, there, there is not so much theory anymore in this position, so players are playing on their own here. And now b5 played, trying to gain some space on the queen side and a4 by Wesley actually, sacrificing the pawn temporarily and now trying to create some weaknesses here. Deak actually took, because if you play the move b4, you will be, I think, <coughs> slightly worse in this position. Uh, the, especially the c4 square could be very useful at some point for the bishop to go to. And also, maybe knight will go there and attack the pawn on a5 here. So after knight g3, well, white is a little bit better here. Bc. B takes C3, for example. This A5 pawn could be a target. So Deak decided to take on A4. And uh, I think this is the current position. After that, Wesley just played the move Bishop C2. So just gave up the pawn, and now he wants to capture the pawn back, Bishop A4. And if he manages <laughs> to do that, this A5 pawn will be weak. And uh, I see a very slight, maybe very slight advantage 
for White. But once again, the fact that uh, Diak is playing fast, he's not behind on the clock, is I think <coughs> really a good sign for him for this game. Wow, I okay. I'm once again I'm mystified. I'm one of those uh, players who always likes a great pawn structure, and for me. Uh, Dayak's decision to play b5, b5 takes a4, and permanently, mm -hmm. I mean, what else can I say if it's not permanently ruin your queenside pawn structure? Because it, it strikes me that white is, you know, an overwhelming favorite, right. frankly, just to win this pawn back on a4. Once white has recaptured the pawn on a4, which I think is an inevitability, there's going to be a weak pawn on a5, there's going to be a weak pawn on c7, and why white doesn't have a long-term advantage is beyond my understanding. I, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at VAR's uh, chess engine, and it's just a slight, <laughs> slight, slight, slight advantage, and I'm sitting there going, uh, I really like your structure. Uh, let me show you how I one, give you a long-term uh, massage. Uh, one thing, Yasser, perhaps, is there's still some dynamics in the position okay. here. We can go maybe a couple of more moves to sure. see. I think Black is going to try to put some pressure on the center. So let's see here. Bishop so, C2, rook E8. Bishop C2, rook E8 first, yeah. This and is a logical move. Get the rook into the game, and some. it's in some lines you want to take on D4 and put pressure on uh, this pawn here. So White will have to play the move knight g3 because Agreed. if you take immediately then after the capture let's e4 say you capture e yeah. takes d4 and then you're, you're going to be dropping this e4 pawn here Agreed. so you, you you need to play the move bishop uh, knight to g3 first agree to secure the e4 pawn and now here's for example bishop b6 gift me the pawn yeah you take the pawn bishop a4 bishop takes a4 queen a4 and the bishop uh, on b6 is well placed because now the a5 pawn is protected. And here we can play the move even queen d7 here. Trying to trade queens here. If the queens come off the board, then black will have the opportunity to play the move a4 and advance this pawn. And um, if you take on d7, knight takes d7. Um, that, that's being too compliant, Var. First of all, there is a move knight h5 after queen d7, but there's also simply queen c2. Yes, let's take a look at the knight h5, for example. If you play knight h5, uh, this is a very nice move because now if queen takes a4, we have this in between in, in check mezzo. on yeah. f6, takes back, uh, and so rook takes a4, and white is, uh, white is a little bit better here. Just Only a little? little? Only a little bit. After oh my gosh, I'm thinking yeah. this is monstrously yeah. better for yeah. white. Look at the structure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, a little bit better. But uh, wow. after knight h5, black can play queen e6 uh, or queen. Uh, queen e7, for example. And now the knight is uh, uh, hanging here. Oh, if I you see. go back knight g3, I go back queen d7. And if you take queen takes f6, right. and again, we see some pressure still on d4, some pressure on e file and thanks to this dynamics i think black is just okay in this position wow okay i'm scratching my head here in st louis i gotta <laughs> tell you uh turning our attention to ali reza and ding Lorin because again uh clash of the champions i want to put it that way grand chess door champion ali reza defending uh grand chess door champion ali reza Ferruja against the new world champion from china ding Lorin. And we left it after this move, knight b8, h2, h3, just a kind of useful move, taking control of the g4 square, limiting uh, ideas of both bishop g4 and knight g4 as well. Uh, the pawn on h3, nine times out of ten, turns out mm -hmm. to be useful. Bishop back to e2. The bishop actually is in the way. This knight is anxious to go to the c4 square. If we leave, if we do it immediately, as desirable as this might be, putting pressure on the e5 pawn, c7, c6, uh, kind of ruined the day, you know, like yeah. why did we trap our own bishop? So I bishop, think bishop did his job on b5. It so. did. Uh, it, knight b8, mm -hmm. it provoked. Uh, rook e1, again, a very useful move. Uh, we always teased Vladimir Kramnik. We said when Vladimir didn't know what to do, he put his rook <laughs> on e1. And uh, the rook is very useful there. Here, idea is to yeah. play knight f1 next. Knight f1, 
the flexibility of even bishop. bishop f1 or I think the knight is going to c4 mainly. Okay. I think the knight is going to go to c4, swing maybe either to uh, e3 and to f5, in which case if the knight were on f5, the rook on e1 kind of makes a little sense mm -hmm. as yes. it opposes uh, the, the, the queen. Uh, rook e1 and we're caught up to the play, players, and uh, if you were to evaluate this position as we get ready for our, our break, what does the engine tell us? Zero, zero, zero. Get out of here. <laughs> you know you're off my Christmas A-list. I know. I, <laughs> unfortunately, that's what we see in a lot of these positions today, Yasser. Yeah. Just yeah. Uh, a very symmetrical position. I actually have a lot of experience playing this type of positions from the, uh, the perk defense I get sometimes. And, uh, right. Um, yeah, it's knight can go to c4, and then you have this option always from c4, you jump into e3, try to go to f5 and d5, but black is just very, very solid here. We can look at a couple of moves here, okay. uh, how black should play after the move rook e1. So one idea here is actually, we see that this b6 move is, okay. is, is, up, is playable here with the idea to put the bishop on b7 to target the e4 pawn. So Say knight c4. Knight c4. Uh, and now... Uh, we can play the move h6 first Maybe. to control the g5 square and uh, also prevent the bishop from coming to g5. Now we need a square for this bishop here. And uh, engine is suggesting bishop d2. I'm not sure about this, but I guess at some point the idea is to prepare the move b4. b4. Yeah. And uh, now bishop b7, attacking the pawn on e4. Now bishop f1. Yeah, that's the point of the move rook e1. Oftentimes you put the bishop on f1, and this way actually you solve the problem of defending the e4 pawn. Right. And queen e6 is a good move here because now you have this diagonal to go back. In case of before, you can always go back bishop e7 or bishop f8 here. And again, just a symmetrical position and... Uh, looks uh, solid. Looks, looks very solid for black. No problems for the world champion. Thank you, Vard. As we uh, prepare uh, for our break, uh, we got a uh, check in on our favorite chess shop, Q Boutique, and let's see what they're offering today. I think here's something you're going to love a unique concave board crafted from walnut and maple woods that feature chessmen with weighted rounded bottoms that wobble freely. Pieces feature chrome accents on the king and queen and available at qboutiquestlouis.com. I don't know, those wobbly <laughs> pieces, boy, they kind of throw me off a little bit, but that's no, something I, very fun. No, I've played on that board before, and it's Have surprising you? how pieces do not fall. Yeah. They're very hard to make them fall. Okay, well, that's good for <laughs> Blitz, I guess. Yeah. Uh, as we prepare for a break, we ha uh, there's a special. We ask the players their thoughts about artificial intelligence. As chess players, we've had a symbiotic relationship with computers for quite a long time. Uh, are you using the new technology, ChatGPT, all these new artificial intelligence solutions that we have right now? Yeah, we chess players use AI to change. I think it's an, it's an open secret. Yes, the uh, neural network is um, basically a must for uh, today's grandmaster. Uh, it was revolution, like some five years ago, I think. Uh, that Alpha Zero bit, uh, I think, Stockish Eight back then in London. That was very uh, unexpected, very big. Chess engine is like a god. I mean, it cannot be beaten. And here it comes, some AI, you know, who uh, day before didn't know chess rules and just smashed, <laughs> smashed Stockfish. So after that, I mean, uh, everyone was really like. Uh, fascinated, I guess, by it, and also was looking for ways to improve uh, their chess. Yeah, I mean, for me, personally, like, this Alpha Zero and, and, and chess-related AI stuff as, um, as a whole is, of course, it changed the game of chess the way we played um, compared to a few years ago when it came. But uh, I believe it's just um, sort of a test phrase, if you will, uh, like, a, like a miniature version of what's going to happen outside of chess in the real world. And I believe since chess is, you know, to, to me, it's a very important game, but it's, it's just a game, right? There are much more serious issues in, in the world. So I believe chess is um, showing that AI can come up with serious 
unexplored ideas in a game that people have been playing for, for you know ages. AI can really be a game changer. Mm, it's still progressing a lot. We, we don't know after one or two years what will happen, but I'm sure that if we can use it in a good way, it can be beneficial for chess. And as it was, for instance, a stockfish when it came out, everybody thought it would be dead, the chess, but it also grow the chess. So we can learn more and we study more, but I'm very optimistic chess and AI together. It's a very good combination. Computer has really revolutionized the game. Um, and so players, as a player, you need to adjust, be ready for uh, everything. But at the same time, I think that computers can only really do so much in the game because as a player, you can your brain can only take so much, can only memorize so many lines. So in that regard, I think chess has become more difficult than the old days. I, I personally, in my opinion, I don't think that the computer can change the game as radical as some people think it can. But I think you know, people still play the game. Uh, there's obviously a lot more theory nowadays than before. Yeah, the um, AI has sort of um, started with chess pretty much. Um, I think the big breakthrough was when Alpha Zero uh, was built, and that that also you know gave confidence to a lot of AI researchers, uh, as I've heard, uh, to to you know to see the potential. And now, building on that, there are so many uh, tools already in the making, and uh, uh, I'm sure within the chess uh, within the chess world, there are many uh, things you can utilize it for. Uh, you can definitely see. Um, potential in some sort of AI tutoring. It seems like it's lacking, you know, uh, power to answer these specific questions. And for now, and it seems like, you know, the engines we have now with Stockfish, with Alpha Zero when they, when they came out, um, there's the best AIs that I know to answer these specific questions. So for now, ChatGPT is no big use for, for us professionals and I suspect it won't be anytime soon, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I think over time that uh, sometime would pass and uh, they will combine maybe a okay, chat GPT or something else uh, with uh, the Stockfish and uh, uh, Lila Zero or something, yeah, and uh, it would be quite, quite a useful tool. Uh, but uh, I guess we are not at this point, but you know, things are developing quickly. Chat GPT itself, like we don't like a language learning model doesn't have much relevance at the moment for chess, but still like we've seen the, the computer revolution, it continues like computers are super, super strong in chess. And, and I think that we're gonna see that like across the board, not just in chess, but in everyday life, technology is going to continue to, uh, to, to expand and who knows what will happen. I mean, hopefully, more good things than bad things. <laughs> well, you never know, but in terms of chess, it's definitely changed the game quite a lot.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our live coverage of the Superbed. Our standings coming in today's play, Nessie. All right, we have a sole leader, Fabiano Caruana, with plus two score. Nice. Followed closely by Wesley So and Richard Rafford with plus one. Just a half a point behind, a lot of players trailing at 50%. And let's jump into round five pairings. All right, we have some very exciting matchups today. Nepo against MBL. Right. Duda against Caruana. Firuja versus Ding. Heavyweight. So against Diak and Giri against Rufford. Well, let's jump right into it because as we were on our break, we were talking about the game of Nepo and MBL mm -hmm. and the fact that, first of all, we had this Alapin with C2C3 Sicilian, not exactly Jan style, and yet he's played every single move perfectly, according to right. our chess engines, if you will, at that. And he's done it in a record breaking really, time. Really fast. There's so much so there's an yeah, hour difference between Almost an them? hour difference between MBL and Nepo. Uh, tell me about that. So uh, has has Jan gained time from the starting <laughs> uh, from the starting moments? He started I with think, 90 mi I minutes. Think he lost some time because he was walking around. Right. He's got to come back and he's got to <laughs> yeah. write down his move. So he has hour and 24 minutes. Var, uh, you, it's so intimidating, you, I, regardless whether you're playing at the club level, you know, the 2800 level, when you have a player, an opponent who's playing instantly and frankly playing all the best moves, you start to ask yourself, what hasn't he prepared? You start to get really, really worried. Tell me about this position and has MBL fallen into prep? I think he is actually, and the Nepo is playing very, very accurately. Yes, the evaluation is still pretty small here, but the difference is 50 minutes already on the clock. And one thing we know, MVL is actually a pretty fast player himself. He's one of the very best rapid and blitz players in the world. But the fact that he's spending so much time, it shows, I think, that he's just not comfortable with the position here. And, um, and yeah, he's definitely intimidated because, you know, this could be some really good preparation from uh, Nepo here. But let's take a look. What is the best thing Black can do in the current position here? So the last move here was knight b3 to d2. I think he's trying to uh, protect the knight on c4 here. And uh, one of the options here is to try to play a5 here, to try to control the b4 square. In this case now, white can play the move knight e3, putting pressure on the bishop. And if the bishop goes back, then this other knight now comes in on c4. And now putting pressure on b6. h6, for example. And you can even play the move h3. Nothing concrete here, but it's just a little bit unpleasant now with this b6 pawn being fixed like this. A little bit easier also to play for the white pieces here. Uh, you can play perhaps rook eight. Okay, looks like there is a move. There is a move here, guys. Rook fc8. And Whoa. this is an inaccuracy. <coughs> this is an inaccuracy because now white has a very strong A5. move. A5. Right. Now you are, if you take, you're always going to be much worse in a position like this because A6 pawn is terribly weak and this pawns are very, very strong. So this is a big advantage for white. And of course he's thinking to play the move B5 here, but now knight B6. Forking the rook, so you have to take. Pawn takes b6, and now the a file is open. The a6 pawn is very weak, and it's not easy to win this b6 pawn. And if you play bishop c5 to attack the pawn on b6, and now this is a very interesting moment here. c4, crucial here, to attack the bishop. And if b takes c4, right. knight takes c4. <coughs> The line continues. Bishop takes c4. Again, if you take back with the bishop after bishop b6, black is absolutely fine. But now you play b7, forking wow. the rooks, giving up the bishop on e2 here. And after the capture here, rook d c1. Wow. The rooks are forked, and now you're threatening that the move rook takes c5. <laughs> and it uh, looks like at the end of this line, white is going to be up at exchange. The best move is knight e4 here. Now bishop e3. I like how white has pawn on b7. And never right. captures and anything. anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's not even capturing it. And now right. rook bc8 takes on c8. Rook takes c8. And after the b4, 
we will get into an endgame like this, bishop b5, bishop c5, and uh, wow. nice advantage for white still. A lot of work needs to be done to convert a position like this. Wow, uh, <laughs> quite the variation. And through the magic of television, we don't like this move, rook c8, and we can see after MVL plays the move, Slaps the clock. I, it's hard for me to tell. And Neil time. has 34 minutes and 34. Nepo, our 24. Wow, what a huge difference. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, that, that invitation to play A4, A5. But it's uh, not that obvious. All these lines were, VAR was just showing oh, us. Oh, no, not at it's all. It's a lot I of mean, calculating. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not easy to play this move A5. And actually, it looks like uh, now the uh, evaluation is actually jumping. It's going back and forth and uh, still shows the white is better. But A5 is absolutely necessary here to have uh, this advantage here. The question is, if Nepo knows this, if he plays this instantly, now this is going to be a really, a really bad mm -hmm. sign for MVL. But if uh, he hasn't played yet, uh -huh. no. And nope. he played and he 93, played 93. Uh, a lot more cautious because you do play a5, b5, knight, b6. That's a one-way bridge. You, 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 whatever, whatever you're riding, whatever mm -hmm. long tactical winded variation there is, you're not coming back after a5, b5. 93, not bad either. Absolutely, it, yeah. It, absolutely. It's a tempo against the bishop. Attacking the bishop, bishop goes back on c6, and now the this other knight like jumps to, knight c4. to c4. Yeah, and we got the d6 square to work with. Also pressure on b6. Still some problems here for black here. It's a long ways away here from trying to equalize this game here. So there's king f8 move, but it's it's hard to play moves like this. You kind of want to have a concrete plan here, but nothing you can do immediately. B5 is always going to run into the move uh, knight a5, for example. So you right. cannot do that. And if this pawn was on a6, it would be a lot easier to play this position uh -huh. for black. With the pawn on a6, you have this uh, problem of the pawn on b6. Again, Engine wants to play this move a5. And now we see the main idea is just to prevent white from playing this move a5 as well and prevent the move b4. But that's, that's, that's why we see this move a5 uh, being suggested here. Early at the start of the round, we got ourselves all excited by the game that was going on between our tournament leader, mm -hmm. uh, Fabi, against Duda. Duda with the white pieces. Now, under normal circumstances, we'd be saying, you know, heavyweight matchup, and da 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 But because Duda got off to such a bad start, mm -hmm. we're sitting there saying, well, you know, can Fabi potentially increase his lead? And uh, we like the move at uh, knight d8, pardon me, knight d5, attacking the rook. The rook drops back, knight f4, and we were saying, okay, on a good day, we get to plant the knight on d3. We're really happy campers, but some forcing moves. Knight e4, uh, uh, a suggestion uh, Vara had made, uh, trading off some yeah, I think pieces. Christian also mentioned that, that, yes. that I can feel that Fab is extremely well prepared and maybe right. maybe it's time to exchange some pieces and, and equalize. And neutralize yeah. the position. Rook e8, b2, b4, uh, trying to force those trades. Now, a moment ago, we were looking at a position with knight takes e4, bishop takes e4, b d5. The bishop was coming back to b1. And we said to ourselves, well, don't allow the move b4 play c5, but mm -hmm. because the pawn is now already on uh, b4 uh, right here. Um, is there an alternative uh, for uh, Fabi not to go into that uh, trade? Uh, probably we're going to take. Yeah? Yes. We're probably okay. going to take. Awesome. Yes. Mm -hmm. And thanks to the fact that this rook is in a pin, we're not worried about an immediate uh, capture. We'll go back on g6. <coughs> Excuse me, and try to capture uh, the pawn on e5. I I hate to call it early like this, but I do see a lot of trades yeah. taking place, and the pieces literally getting vacuumed off the the board. Var, I think. Um, well, again, I don't want to jinx it, but draw kind of feels a little bit inevitable in this uh, game of hobbies. Absolutely, with accurate play, I think it's just. Uh Trade, Very trade, likely, trade. yeah, we'll see some <laughs> trades occur. There are some interesting lines here I want to show you here. Please. Um, so, for example, here, if you play the move, uh, uh, so we expect Fabi to take after the move before. Right. Uh, you don't really want to retreat because then white can take on d6. So I think we will see this. 
moves played. And here, if you play the move knight g6, I think there is a chance white might be a tiny bit better after the move queen e2 here. Really? Because if you take everything on e5. Right. So let's say you take. Munch, 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 munch. And now the queen is actually active only five here, and there's uh, targeting c7, and also a6 pawn is a little bit weak. And uh, after the move rook e1, you will be able to control the e file. I still think with accurate, pl accurate play, black should be able to equalize, but again, a little bit easier to play for white. The rook on b8 is also, it needs a couple of moves to come back into the game here. Uh, like let's say h6 is the best option, rook e1, queen d6. Um, and even endgame like this, maybe white can try to play a little bit because of the, the weaknesses of a6 and d6. Uh, but, the, uh, but Fabiano can play uh, better. All right. So let's go back here. And in this position, uh, instead of uh, yeah, rook e4, so here uh, he can play the move d takes e5. Mm. And now knight takes e5. And here, a very strong move is knight takes h3 check. Ooh. So if you capture check. queen g5 check, if we blockade with the queen, there is uh, rook, rook takes. takes e5. Same thing if you blockade with the uh, rook, queen takes e5 as well. Knight g4, then we're dropping the rook on e4 here. So king h1 is the only move. And now rook takes e5. F4. And f4, only move. Now there's a um, few options, queen h4 or queen f5. <laughs> it happening? will lead to the same position. Alien says. Queen h3 check, king g1, and now it becomes clear that you cannot go to f1 because queen f4 check <laughs> will pick up your rook. So you have to go back on h1, and this will lead to a perpetual here after queen g3. So this will be the most accurate way for Fabiano to equalize the game. The perfect game, perfect play, a lot of work for the draw, but uh, that move, knight takes h3, mm -hmm. forcing a perpet. Wow, uh, mazel tov, uh, great stuff going on there. I want um, to uh, draw our attention to please. this game, Giri versus Rappert. Okay. So I need to play Ritchie queen e5. with a half a point out of first, yeah. hoping for something good to happen. We left it here, <laughs> yes. please. Anish offered another queen exchange. So with bishop queen e5. e2, rook e8, and this is where I was saying there's two yes. ways for black to solve the problem of the bishop. Fee and shadow the bishop, or aspire mm -hmm. to play the move e5. And this is where you were about to say the queen trade was offered. Yes. And please. Richie said no again. <laughs> no again. No and queen b6. Okay. Uh, and white plays b4. Gift me the pawn, b4. Which I like, but. White hasn't castled yet, so that's making me a little, little bit nervous. nervous. Okay. So now I was thinking, can Black uh, attack the Queen with Tempi? Let's, let's say Knight. Absolutely. B two D seven. Let's do it, and that is a tempo. And where do we put the Queen? In I fact, I feel like wherever you go, I have another tempo move. Okay, so let me just. G three. Okay. Okay, I Keep I know. E five, E four. I know what you're talking <laughs> about as far as the Tempi move. Mm -hmm. I was hoping to get it, win it back if you will, with the There's move. There's also a knight e4 option. I don't know if it's, if it achieves anything. Knight but let's e4. Say, yeah. Okay, now I've got to move my queen again. You are, <laughs> you are bouncing me about. I will uh, give you that. But is it meaningful? At the moment, I'm not sure. Yes, I can play knight d2 f6, or I can play knight c3. Both look interesting. Knight c3, that tickles my bitch. It's like, Will you stop I'm harassing me so I can just... I'm kind of provoking bishop d3. You, you certainly after, are. After I defend h7, then e5, e4 is coming. On your agenda. Yeah. But it depends on how you defend. Uh, like g6, you're kind of inviting knight g5. It <laughs> Maybe might knight be... knight f6. Yeah, okay, fair. Uh, because otherwise I was going to say, you know... Now, your knight on c3 makes a yeah. little bit of a strange impression. Um, it's not trapped. It's not trapped, but it's close. <laughs> okay, I'm a little bit afraid of mm -hmm. E5, okay? So forgive me that, uh, there's something a little bit artificial about both players play here, but uh, the fact that I'm not castled, I, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit uh, nervous. Can we go back for a moment uh, to the current position 
knight d7, I, I started with queen g3. Did you anticipate that as being my best move? I, I was, or was something else bothering? So I was thinking about queen e3, just to offer a queen exchange again after e5. <laughs> like uh, like e5, yeah. knight, knight f5 mm -hmm. or something, and uh, another queen trade? Huh. Um, but wow. Richard, by the way, played knight g4 instead of knight d7. You know, just when you think you understand chess, <laughs> a move like knight g4 really shakes you up to the core and asks you, you know, what is the meaning of lie? What is my purpose? <laughs> knight g4, Var. Uh, did the computer engines like this move? Has that got a seal of approval? Uh, second best move here. I was also a little bit surprised to see because uh, same thing as you, right? Yes, I think you gotta develop your pieces here. Right. You know, I would be, you know, I, I'm already a little bit concerned with the queen on b6. You know, I would have liked to have the queen on c7, pawn on b6, and to get the bishop out. But this knight g4 is again just uh, not really developing the knight on b8. I was looking at the line with knight bd7, and it's, it's very interesting actually there too. Uh, but let's, look, let's take a look at knight g4 now here. Knight g4 attacking okay. the queen here. So the best move here is queen g3. Okay. Retreating and also putting pressure on the knight. And now his idea is definitely to play the move e5 here. Clear. Remove the knight from d4 and also open up the diagonal for the bishop here. So knight b3, <coughs> best move. Okay. And uh, white really wants to castle and then play the move h3 here. Sure. And uh, knight c6, for example, there is a knight h6 move here, but again, it's... Uh, it's a very strange way of playing knight h6 with the idea of knight f5. So let's say he plays knight c6. More logical. More say. logical, yeah. So he yeah. plays c5, attacking the queen, queen to c7. And now uh, you can castle here. Another option is to play the move knight fd2. The point is you attack the knight, and also that gives you the option to bring the queen to c3. And in the long run, this knight would be very well placed here with, because you can play knight c4 and go to the d6 square. So strategically, I think this is a little bit risky for black, this position, because if white can castle, consolidate the position, get the knight on c4 and d6, I see some chances for him to have an advantage here. Mm -hmm. There's some very strange artificial play, but mm, like nobody's getting uh, mm -hmm. uh, punished for it. Just uh, checking in once again on the game of Fabi, we do have that trade and it might happen. How how deep is Fabi's preparation? <laughs> well, Christian kind of gave us an insight when he said, I mean, he, Christian mm -hmm. who worked, has worked with Fabi quite a number of years, in fact, and now they're doing their podcasting together, uh, C Squared, check it out, everybody. Um, and he said, Fabi has worked really, really hard on this particular opening. And you look at the current position on the board and you go, <laughs> well, it kind of pretty balanced, um, you know, material wise. I can imagine that, for example, after knight g6, okay, Vara was mentioning a line that imperceptibly white might get some kind of an edge in a straight major mm -hmm. piece ending. It's a shocking. Uh, idea, oop, knight excuse me, knight h3 check, uh, sorry, that w black has a force perpetual. Mm -hmm. Are we going like, to see that? Like what? Think? I mean, you know, and oh, you, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that would be, how again, how deep is the prep? King h1, rook takes. What's more impressive is that he remembers it all. Yeah, exactly. Because we can all prepare with our engines, but right. to actually remember everything at the board exactly. <laughs> is a challenge. So a lot of uh, people just don't understand how very, very difficult it is sometimes to mm -hmm. play your opening novelty. Uh, and here, as Var was mentioning, you can't walk to the F1 square because that's your rook and there goes the game. You have to go to the H1 square and this is the perpetual check. So imagine there you are, you're you're, you're sitting there saying to yourself, I'm going to be playing Ding Lerin in the Sinkfield Cup, and I'm going to have the white pieces or I'm going to have the black pieces. And you look at Ding's repertoire, and you drill deeply, and you find this beautiful novelty. Oh, this is great. This is going to bring you glory and success, and you just can't wait to spring it on him. 
And then you notice that in the Rapid and Blitz mm -hmm. tournament, somebody plays your novelty against uh, the opponent that you had prepared. So it's one thing. First of all, you've got to work really hard. You've got to find some great ideas that really catch somebody off guard. Mm -hmm. Then you've got to deliver. And it's oftentimes other people get the opportunity yeah. before you do, and you're like, no, it's, it's not fair. It's not fair. Uh, and Has what's even been worse prepared? than that? What's, what's worse? What <laughs> when, could be worse? When you get lucky in yes. the sense that your opponent walks into your preparation yes. and then you can't remember the line. Oh. <laughs> okay, that is worse. That is worse. That has that, that happened. And that happens very often. Yeah. So we're, we think that the current position that Duda has after knight takes e5 may well have been in the laboratory uh, of uh, Fabi and that uh, Fabi's preparation could very well include knight takes mm -hmm. h3, perpetual check, will he remember <laughs> the whole line or not? That's, or maybe that's he wants to the question. test Duda and see if uh, he can get an advantage somewhere here? Mm. I doubt it though. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll see. That would be a big risk, unnecessary risk. What has caught your attention, uh, Var? Uh, let's switch to this game here, and um, Nepo against MVL, and actually he has to find the next move here to have an advantage here. So very important moment here, bishop b5 is the key move here uh, to be able to get an advantage. Let's take a look at some of the lines now after this move. So if we go back, uh, last few moves, so... We left off around here, knight dc4, right. a5 was played by MVL, knight to d6, knight is very active and annoying here, so he decided just simply to take, bishop d6, now knight c5. The pawn on a4 is under attack and you don't have the move b3, so you have basically two options in this position, either to take on c5, which will give you a, perhaps a very small advantage here. But you can play like this as well and then play the move bishop b5. Right. Since the a5 pawn is weak, c5 is a little bit weak, you will have a very, very small advantage here as well in this position. But the best move here is to keep the bishop on d6 and play the move bishop b5 immediately. Right. Now, uh, <coughs> black will most likely capture okay. on b5 and then you take back with, with a pawn. Uh, again, the b6 is the main problem for black in this position, and uh, at some point we have knight c4, knight b6 ideas as well. Uh, knight e8 would be a logical move to try to remove this bishop from d6, but in fact we can actually leave it there for now and play even a move like f3 or king f1. Just bring the king closer to the center here, because if you capture the bishop on d6, then rook takes d6 now, attacking the pawn on b6, and this will be a real problem, because very difficult now to protect this pawn. Rook a b8 will lead into the move knight c4, putting right. pressure on uh, b6, and if you play the move knight e4, attacking the rook and the knight on c4, there is simply this move. There are two moves here. You can play rook b6, but also you can play the move rook c6. He's extremely he's strong. Check, yeah. uh, and now uh, this would be a very, very big advantage here. Rook takes c6, pawn takes, rook c8, knight b6, rook c6. And again, the fact that you don't have your luft mm -hmm. is going to play a very big role here because <coughs> rook takes f5 will threaten the move rook 8 and white has a <coughs> big advantage here. So bishop b5 is necessary here to go for a bigger advantage, but bishop c5 will give him some small edge as well here. Nice uh, variation there, Var. Uh, the counterintuitively, as you were analyzing, I was looking at something very similar to what you were showing, um, and, and that was with the move bishop b5, like you said. Bishop takes b5, a takes b5, and when you played knight e8, uh, it's not that I'm anxious to give up my bishop or anything like that. It's just that I love the control of the open d file. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, I found myself drawn to this counterintuitive idea of capturing. Now, you never want to play pawn takes. 
conceding me a pass pawn. pass pawn. And, you know, that mm -hmm. is just really devastating. The knight on c4 is simply huge. You have to take with a rook, and you would do so proudly until you stop and look at the, think about the position just a moment or two after the move c4. At, at first, you, you're, you're, you're saying to yourself, oh, I'm doing fine with black. But look at another move or two. First of all, I do have a threat mm -hmm. of b4, so likely you're going to move the rook. And this is why I said I was kind of drawn to this idea, because I do have control over the open file. I'm kind of the first to establish, make a claim, you know, look at, look at this. And, and if you ever play knight f6, you know, I'll drop back and yeah. I will tickle the pawn. So I do feel that Jan has emerged with a better ending. Maybe it's not that great, but it just feels like a long-term something-something. And he has played Absolutely. bishop b5. And he has played bishop b5. Bishop b5 play, guys. And yes, no. uh, uh, Nepo is playing very well, and he's got an hour and 10 minutes. MVL on 29 minutes here. And uh, don't forget, MVL lost yesterday, so... You know, so did Nepo, right? Yeah, so Nepo's trying to... Right? I mean, they're both a bit vulnerable at the moment. Nepo is kind of like, mm, I'm finding myself getting interested in the game suddenly. Mm -hmm. Nice. Which game haven't we uh, uh, checked in? Uh, a little bit. Let's see Wesley So right. and uh, Deok's position, uh, Daniel Deok. Uh, I thought the decision to play b5 by Daniel, b7, b5, b5 takes a4 to be a bad one. I can't say it any better than that. I just love white structure, mm -hmm. even though I agree the bishop on b6 is doing a fabulous job at um, protecting these weaknesses. Long term, I think white's going to just uh, say... Most end games, white should have an advantage because exactly. of the pawn structure. And uh, petite, little moves, b2, b3, queen, c2, reinforcing, re re protecting. Maybe on a good day, the rook could come over. The bishop is always eyeballing this pawn. Mm -hmm. One of the worst strategic decisions black must avoid is by playing e5 takes d4, because that would be very helpful. The central pawn duo for white, as well as the good bishop on d2 attacking a5 would be terrible. I like how Let's kingside see. position is completely symmetrical. Yes, <laughs> both nice. Just, both players yeah. appreciate it well. <laughs> defended the king. Again, uh, nothing terrible has happened to Deox's De position. Nothing and but for the term. first time, he's not in time trouble in this tournament. He has more time than his opponent. Somebody just knocked him on the head and said, <laughs> you know, you can't do this because your first four games, you've seized the defensive almost from the get-go, and then you've put yourself in a hole mm -hmm. by playing on increments for the last ten moves of the uh, time control. And... Uh, Actually, These players we, won't we, let you get away with that. No, they won't. Yeah. They, 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 they're too good. And uh, we do have, a, a, we've prepared a little graphic. We'll show our audience, uh, Chris Bird, the international mm -hmm. arbiter, who always joins us here in St. Louis, uh, is shown as a, a little graphic uh, in the middle of the screen. Where am I looking? Right there. Yes. Yeah, there you have it. 40 moves in 90 minutes. Uh, with Sudden death. I minutes. think that's what he's trying to say. <laughs> the, uh, uh, second uh, time control, sudden death, that's all you get. You get 30 more minutes, and you always will have a 30-second bonus. As we've seen throughout this tournament, a lot of players mm -hmm. come to rely upon that 30-second. Uh, so even though I'm not saying, you know, like um, uh, Wesley's position is overwhelming or anything of that nature, no, 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 no. I just really dislike the fact that a player of Wesley's caliber, mm -hmm. who just really enjoys, you know, nitpicking the position and finding a, a, an awkward uh, uh, point here or there, he, the, for him, this is his perfect chess. Uh, there's nothing chaotic mm -hmm. about it. There's no crazy, crazy tactics. And he gets to build up the position from Wesley's point of view, this is his brand of chess. I, d I wouldn't want to be in Black's uh, shoes, even though the the engine will probably make the argument it's fine. As there, always. Yeah, the, but there are, there are positions that are easier for one side to play. In my view, 
this is uh, a position for white because I have a long-term target. What is Black supposed to do? Is he supposed to be playing knight h7 to g5? Yay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is he supposed to be playing for d6, d5? Is he supposed it's to be playing clear. for... It's not clear. Exactly. It's not that clear. So uh, uh, answers, uh, questions and answers to be, to be made. Let's jump to the game of Richie Rapport and Anish Giri because these two have been playing some original chess ever since we saw a7, a6, way mm -hmm. back on move six, right. I want to say. And after b4, knight g4, okay, that was a surprise move. Queen g5, I think our instinctive reaction was to play the move queen g3 to defend the f2 square after e5, but oh, he queen has g5? in between move c5. <laughs> You, Tom is going to say he has a swish and zoog? <laughs> e5, e c5. Okay, because again, uh, the knight cannot move. Right. The, the pawn on f2 is under duress, so you have to boot the queen away. Queen went back, and now Anish said, okay, knight f5. Uh, I have a mate threat. Pause for just a moment, because this is like, Kind of weird, bishop, right? Uh, sorry, knight on g4 is also <coughs> taken, so I have to take on f5. Exactly. So this is actually rather forcing. Right. Bishop f5, queen f5, but mm -hmm. on the other hand, helps my development, right? I yes. mean, the knight's been bouncing around, the bishop never moved, knight comes back to f6. So on a good day, black is ready to go knight c6, e5, e4, and maybe rook e5. I hate my king in the center of the board. <laughs> The white has to castle. Thank you. Can't wait any longer. Right? I mean, you know, you, you, you've delayed it as, as, as long as you possibly could. Knight c6, I'm yes. assuming. Rook d1, probably. A to d1. No? I <laughs> was thinking that I'm seeing e5, e4, right? And I'm seeing that the knight is coming to d4. I'm kind of wanting to get my pieces out of the way mm -hmm. of knight d4. So in case of e4, I was wondering, can I get away with this? Knight oh. e5, maybe? Aha, uh -huh. knight e5. Good point. So that was why you wanted to play rook a1 to d1, yeah? Yes. To meet e4 with knight to d4, yes? That was Lassie? the idea, yes. Um, I do like white's pawn structure on the queen side. That very, very chain. much. But can black ever exchange, force exchanges there? Yeah, we, you know, uh, a timely a6, a5 to break up the team. Yeah. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of creative play, uh, Var, but it, did anybody at the end of the day have s some great claim of advantage? No, actually, it's just completely equal, but it, it's uh, it's still some dynamics I see in a position. But uh, we can we can check some of the moves now. I was uh, analyzing to see if it, it looks kind of good for white, but somehow black has good counterplay in this position. So uh, let's see. At the current position, he just played the move knight c6, and uh, finally Anish castle and move number 20. It actually I was trying to see is when he castle move 20 white castle knight c6. And um, the best move here is to start with rook ad1 because black is trying to play the move e4 here and then jump in on d4 with a knight. So that's why rook ad8 is important. And here, rook, a, uh, rook ad1 and then rook ad8. And now bishop goes to c4. The idea now is to play knight g5 to try to put pressure on f7. So very important move here for black is h6 to control that square. And uh, it's... Uh, it's, it's unclear to see what is white going to do now here. It's uh, hard to improve the, the pieces here. So one move actually even suggested by Angel looks absolutely crazy is the move g4 here. What? Yes. The idea is to try to play g5 and take knight g5. And uh, if you play the move e4, g5. And again, if you take on g5, then actually white maybe has a little bit of an advantage here because the f7 pawn is weak here. Okay. And the e4 pawn could be a target as well. But for example, black can take on f3. Take on g f6. takes f6. And here black can play rook e5 immediately or he can actually capture first 
on d1, rook takes d1, and play the move rook e5 here. Whoa. <laughs> and the line continues, queen takes f3, right. rook g5 check, king f1, and now very important move actually, knight e5, attacking the queen and the bishop, so forcing the move queen d5. If right. white can trade queens after queen d8, it will be a, a very, very big advantage for white here. So queen, knight c4 is the only move, and now queen takes c4, queen takes h2 now, winning the pawn, and rook d8 check, king h7, queen e4 check, wow. and again, G, rook g6 is the only move in this position because if you play the move g6, that's a very, very nice finish here, guys. Rook h8 check. Gotcha. <laughs> Takes, queen e8 check, king h7, queen f7, king h8, and queen g7 mate. So you have to play the move rook g6 uh, after, uh, after queen e4, and... Rook g6 kind of reminds me, and it, this is also a pin in itself, so it reminds me of Ding's Nepo, win, yeah, the last did. round. Yeah, yeah. and uh, after taking on g7, king g7, uh, looks like uh, it's just a roughly equal position here. Perhaps it just could be a draw here after queen d4, rook f6, yeah, uh, queen 2. I That's highly a doubt lengthy, that lengthy uh, <laughs> variation uh, I, uh, there. Wow! I don't think we're gonna stuff. see this. I don't think we're gonna see this line, but yeah. it just it just shows you know, how balanced the position is. Still. I'll be amazed if Anish plays G4 in that position. Uh, just great stuff. And yeah. by the way, uh, Fabi did go for mm -hmm. the knight takes H3, uh, a perpetual check that we had envisioned a long time ago, uh, and I'm reminded of Christian's words that uh, the preparation of Fabi is so deep that uh, he, it could well be that mm -hmm. this has been all uh, prepared by him in his opening laboratory. Rook takes e5, and white has no choice but to play the move f4, f4. because at the moment, not only is white a pawn down, but his king has actually been uh, shattered. So if you don't have the move f4, you're simply much, much worse. So f f4 which does after all win an entire rook i'm forced to make a perpetual check but what a that's unique, a success for, for for black unique perpetual <laughs> yeah oh dear wow remarkable and there you go rook takes e5 f4 is coming up and it's going to be the only move um we highlighted at the very top of the show that the he uh, marquee matchup was ali riza Perugia, and I do believe that after F2, F4, the players are going to go directly into that perpetual check. We might just wait for a quick second. Let's just see if we're going to see a handshake because between uh, Duda, because Queen F5, there's no only move. Uh, only move. Rook takes E5 is again the only move, mm -hmm. and Queen takes H3 check, again the only move. King G1 force. And I think we're going to see a, a repetition uh, very, very shortly and a handshake. Wow. Once again, what preparation. I can't that's imagine how difficult it must be to play against Bobby. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's, that's really, really frightening. Uh, Var, you did, you, 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 you've seen uh, the type of preparation that Fabi uh, has enjoyed over the course of his career. A little bit, uh, forgive me if I say, I find this breathtaking. This is really impressive stuff. Absolutely. I've actually played Fabi uh, five or six games, and especially when I was black, I was just really stuck. I didn't know what to play. <laughs> and uh, I played the French. It didn't go very well. I played the uh, Scandinavian once also. I d that didn't go well. I played E45 in one game. I managed to make a draw here right. with the black. So, but uh, overall, it was very difficult to play <coughs> with the black pieces especially because his open, opening preparation is just phenomenal. Well, uh, definitely today a demonstration of that. Now we can jump to uh, the marquee matchup game that we were talking about uh, from the top of the show. Ali Reza Farouja, our defending Grand Chester champion against the new world champion from mm -hmm. China, Ding Lerin. When we, we left it, we more or less left it at this part. And um, this move, when you look across the board and you say, well, what's the weakness in 
blacks can't. There's really not that much to attack. Ferruja decided that he was going to gnaw upon the pawn on a5. He played the move knight b3, bishop b6, knight d2, and we Im immediately understand his idea is to play knight to c4 if the bishop is driven away. Mm -hmm. We munch. We're happy. Uh, Ding Loren said, no, 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 I'm not going to give you the pawn, but I will at least give you the two bishops making a little bit of an imbalance in the position and potentially something for, for white to play for. Nonetheless, 96, this knight is looking good. You know, it's got, it's got outposts that it can jump to. 96, g2, g3, taking control of the f4 square. I like h5. You like, I do too, mm -hmm. I do too. King g2, h4. Now you don't want to take that pawn. That's kind of like what Dayak did. Poison this pawn. Yeah, that's like ugly. You don't want to take that pawn. But on the other hand, you don't want to see black necessarily uh, eyeballing uh, the f4 square that much either. So queen e2, just to take control over the h5 square and d7, pardon me, g7, g6, idea of king g7, and white has the two bishops. Was that a good move, though? G7, G6. Uh, sorry? It G7. looks logical. Something. Yeah, I guess, I guess that, that, that's true. But it does uh, weaken black squares a little bit. A lot, actually. Uh, OK, G7, G6, fine. Uh, well, the purpose of knight B3 had been revealed a few moves earlier. At the moment, the knight is no longer working on B3. Let's give it a better roll. Knight d2, and I think we're up to date with mm -hmm. the players. Knight d2. Knight's looking to come to f3. Gift me this pawn or gift me uh, this pawn. But and white has the two bishops. Right, and black can take on g3, right? It yes. doesn't mess up black's pawn structure No. to exchange the pawns. Um, and then maybe king g7 and... Okay, okay, and I will fall for... Uh, happily uh, fall into whatever horrible uh, doom loop you've prepared for me. Uh, 90, knight f3, tickling the pawn on e5. I'm thinking, now see, if you do go knight c5, I do have a, a funny way of both defending the e4 pawn mm -hmm. as well as maybe, maybe attacking the f7 pawn. Knight f3. Can I sacrifice the pawn on e5? Yes. Please. yes <laughs> Let's say I forbidden. play rook h8. Just rook h8. Eight. Okay. Now I'll fall for it because I, I love cookies. <laughs> uh, knight takes e5. Now you can go knight c5, knight f7 g5, f7 still hangs, but it's a little bit sharp. Uh, you've got rook h5 ideas. Let's doubling, try it. doubling rooks, tickling me along the the fifth rank. Uh, wow. Uh, okay, enterprising stuff, and this is mm -hmm. the the kind of game we can sacrifice yes. bonds as well, as well as everybody. But let's jump to uh, Bucharest, where Christian is with Duda. We are indeed with Jan Shishtov, uh, Duda, after uh, his draw against Fabiano Caruana. Jan Shishtov, first of all, welcome uh, to the show. If not for that accident against uh, Richie Rapport, this would have been more or less a normal tournament, 50%. Now you're on minus one. How, how did you assess that game and how did you uh, try to bounce back? What did you do to bounce back after that uh, accident? Uh, yeah, indeed, the game against Rapport was terrible. Um, yeah, I mean, I totally in that game missed this idea, King T2. I mean, the move itself, and because I thought it's just uh, going to trade uh, everything and uh, and draw. But after King D2, it was suddenly very tricky, yeah. Bishop and game. So um, yeah, and I didn't have it at the time. Also against Dak, I think I uh, I completely outplayed him, but um, then I had some uh, some hallucination because I thought. After knight c1, rook b2, I can drop the rook. Actually, I mean, give out the exchange and then like, king d3, king c3, king c2, but then he has, of course, rook a1. And, I mean, and after knight c1, uh, rook b2, I mean, there was like um, no advantage whatsoever. So, um, yeah, it's a bit, uh, a bit annoying, of course. Um, yeah, but what to do, yeah? I mean, have to keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, also, uh, another brilliancy because I. Uh, 
totally, totally forgot to check 97 move, which is kind of the mine, Let's take a look I at think. That. And, uh, uh, which move? Knight to e7? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the mine move, I guess, of the rookie one, but um, for some reason. Um, uh, today I checked a lot of Varahangersk, I mean, some variations, and um, yeah, at times I was getting a bit confused because it's. Uh, like there are a lot of first and yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and Fabiano played many of them. So, yeah, but I mean, to forgot to check 97 is like uh, pathetic. Yeah, and me, I mean, yeah, knight, knight d2. Um, yeah, it is the move, of course. Um, yeah, what can I, what can I say? I mean, uh, but just you took only five, and sure, he was blitzing out your moves. You looked a little bit disappointed, but uh, this was <laughs> quite a funny moment because Jan was walking around and he saw the position, saw uh, Fabi play knight c5, and then he started looking, probably calculating bishop takes h7, um, then understanding that it simply doesn't work. Were you surprised about this move? Knight c5, you mean? Yes. Because uh, f5 mm, was played before. Uh, not, not really. Actually, I considered almost only knight c5 here for black, so. Um, yeah, bishop a7, I guess, doesn't work because doesn't, of yeah. king h7, king h6, and knight f5, I guess. Yeah, queen um, g4, knight f5, or yeah. h6, both of them. Um, did you spend any time calculating it, or you were like, okay, mm, I, yeah, I trust a little, you. a little bit, yeah, but um, I didn't believe in it, yeah. I mean, with uh, rook on a1 and knight on b1, it's like uh, never really working, I guess, for me. Yeah. So, um, another line they were calculating was knight g5. Did you consider this? Uh, not really. I was um, kind of looking to play very solid, you know, and at this point, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't considering an 5 at all. Just to try to pull the brakes, uh, uh, make make a draw. Yeah, and, and here actually, I mean, I thought uh, uh, like it's new position for me, but I, actually after this D takes E5, then D takes E5, I had this déjà vu that. Uh, I must have uh, seen this before. This is mm. very perpetual. Um, yeah, so after uh, knight h3, g takes h3, queen g5, king h1, also queen f5 uh, is the move, yeah, but then there is queen e2, I think. And the point is that after f6, there is queen a2 check, yeah, which is very <laughs> important mm -hmm. because otherwise I think I'm, I'm worse. And rook e6, rook a1, and um, yeah, again, like f takes e5, queen h3, queen g4, I think. Yeah. It's, yeah. And pretty much perpetual. Yeah, so I guess so. Did. I guess I guess it was. Um, I mean, the result is not so bad, of course. But um, like um, the feeling, the taste after this game is like. Uh, I mean, it's a very pathetic game and uh, one to forget. I guess. <laughs> Despite uh, sure a disappointing result up to this point for you for your standards, how do you like the atmosphere here in Bucharest? How do you like the organization? Talk to us about yeah, that. I mean, it's nice tournament for sure. Uh, but you are always kind of biased. I mean, uh, you know, you play well, then everything <laughs> is, you know, so great. Yeah. But if you don't, then, you know, you don't feel the same way. But still, um, I can't really complain. I mean, everything is top notch. So, um, yeah, it's nice. Still for rounds to uh, recover and get back, get some positive uh, vibes from your results. Thank you very much, Yashita, for joining us, and we'll see you in the rest of the games. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, uh, Duda. Indeed, uh, I can't wait to uh, ask uh, Fabi how much was preparation as we have one result. Yes, so we far. have one draw between Duda and Caruana. Right, and uh, uh, lots to play for, for in uh, the remaining games, and I uh, just want to bring the attention to the game of uh, Wesley So. And again, from my perspective, this is like a dream mm -hmm. position for Wesley. A lot of players will say, oh, it's, it's, it's even Steven or something like that. I don't believe that. I think that Wesley uh, just loves these types of position. Uh, a rich strategic fight where he has this long-term advantage of a better pawn structure. Last moves uh, were very uh, nice, I think, by Wesley. Move bishop e3, intimating that, hey, look, don't pay attention, but I want to trade bishops and win the pawn on a5. The bishop was forced to drop back slightly, <laughs> excuse me, slightly more past the square, bishop to c7, rook to d1, Okay, making the move, d takes e5, and now after the move, queen e6. If I'm in Wesley's shoes, the move that has my attention is C4. the move c4. 
okay, what I really want to do is I really want to clamp down mm -hmm. on the position totally with the move uh, d4, d5, and then all of these pawns are on dark squares. Uh, what you have to calculate is d6, d5. Yes, can black it, play d5? Yes, can black play d6, d5, and if he gets to blow up the center with nothing untoward happening, mm -hmm. uh, bad, that is to say, then uh, he'll be fine. Which brings up the other question, what happens if I just capture, and let's say capture, and I try to um, festoon mm -hmm. my knight on this very powerful c4 square where it's kind of looking at both the e5 and the a5 pawns. Um, again, I think it's Wesley So's type of position, something he'll enjoy with well, the clock. a lot of good options. The clocks? Oh, uh, Wesley's down to 25 minutes, and <coughs> Diak has 50 minutes, twice as much. That's Excuse surprising. Uh, yeah. And uh, jumping uh, to you, uh, Var, as you've been keeping an eye on the Nepo versus MVL game. Yes, absolutely. Looks like uh, Nepo is improving the position at the moment. He's already got a big advantage here, and we can see the really? knight on b7 is very awkward for MVL and the clock situation. Nepo is almost one hour ahead on a clock. MVL has 13 minutes left okay. and a very, very difficult end game here. We can take a look at uh, the moves now, how White can try to increase his pressure in this position here. So we left off around here after bishop d6, knight c5, and uh, he played the move bishop b5. And knight b7 was played here. So he did not he did not take on b5. And VL decided to play the move knight b7. But now after bishop a3, if we just look at it, the knight is really passive here. And the bishop on a3 is doing a great job taking away the squares. The knight can go to on c5 or d6 here. So rook c7 played. And now f3. I like this move. It's a really nice move, restricting the squares for the knight. And also it will allow you to bring the king on f2, bring it closer to the center. And rook ac8 again black is doubling up the rooks here but there is no target here just trying to bring the rook into the game and rook eight rook d2 played doubling up the rooks another very logical move here eight <coughs> rook ad1 so white has improved all his pieces perhaps can also play the move king f2 next and in the meantime it's not so clear to see what is white uh, what is black going to do here and he doesn't have that much time here he's got 13 minutes we still have uh 13 more, uh, 13 more moves to go here to make the time control. Very, very difficult position for MVL. I mean, G5 is one of the best options, but it's, it's very hard to even understand what is the purpose of this move. Let's take a look at more concrete moves here. Let's say if he plays the move Knight D5 here, try to liquidate some pieces here. Here, actually, White can just simply play the move King F2, right. which uh, that was the idea to play the move F2. So do you always have this option to bring your king closer to the center. If Knight takes E3... King takes e3 now. Again, the knight on b7 is really badly placed here. And uh, <coughs> if, you, if you take on b5, simply pawn takes b5. And now we have the option of going rook d7 here as well. White has a very big advantage in this line. If we try to keep the uh, d-file closed with the move uh, bishop d5, then white can try to prepare the move c4. First, start with the move rook d4. And uh, with, the, with, 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 let's say, black is just, just for example, if he's not doing anything, king h8. And we can try to even expand on this side of the board here, too, since black has no ideas. We can even play the move h4, king g8, even h5, just get some more space advantage. And eventually, white will be able to play the move c4 to remove the bishop here. For example, you can even go rook c1 and then play c4 or uh, perhaps uh, at the right time, maybe king d3 as well, and <coughs> to play the move c4. Very nice advantage for white here. Two bishops, uh, majority on the queen side here. Uh, I think Nepo has excellent chances to win this game, guys. Yeah, it sure feels the same way to me. When I think of the uh, Lappin uh, as an opening, mm -hmm. I always think of white trying to play for queen side majority, but that's like a dream position. White has everything. He has a queenside majority, complete control of the open file, and this knight on b7 simply makes a woeful impression. The knight on b7 is in a very passive square. The bishop on a3 
patrolling F8, mm -hmm. stopping King F8, King E7. I just start adding up all of the advantages, and I say, exactly at this moment, uh, who's ever in the 2800 club, I would rate that player as a favorite to win Absolutely. with the white pieces. Like, this is a type of position that a Magnus Carlsen, you know, Hikaru Nakamura, Wesley So, once they get their grip on you, mm -hmm. you're not getting out of it. And we just saw the move King H7, a kind of indication that mm, black doesn't really have waiting. a, yeah, waiting. Uh, and I, like, I love that incremental advance, King F2 and so forth. Uh, turning our attention to Wesley So. Wesley is on the outside looking in. He has a plus one score, very, very nice. Uh, hoping that maybe he could get plus two to did today and join uh, Fabi in the lead. You know, here I am sitting there extolling the virtues, you know, of a great pawn structure for Wesley and play the move C4 and play D5 or take on E5 and play knight to D2. Stick your knight on this beautiful uh, outpost on C4. B3, B4, inviting black to uh, trade off his, his pawn on A5. I find this move confounding. Uh, well, help me out. Uh, I think his idea is to open up C file and put pressure on the C6 pawn. Okay, fair. But let's do it, right? Right. Let's so we'll say take. black takes. Yep. White takes back. Right. And here D5 is looking awesome. very good. Not for black. Oh, pardon me. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, you <laughs> want to play the black side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, you think Wesley's idea was to open up the C file, that that maybe he underestimated mm -hmm. Black's intention of uh, playing D move D65. Okay, so now I'm going to be playing Wesley's uh, <laughs> side. Okay, first of all, I'm still confounded by the move B4, but let's say that the mm -hmm. idea was that I, mm -hmm. I, I, I want to focus my attention on uh, the C6 pawn, right? So away I go, like, give me the pawn. <laughs> uh, let's say I just defend with knight E7. Knight to e7, fair. And can I munch the pawn on e5 in this? So in this fashion, I'm thinking if you take twice on e5, mm -hmm. I'll have bishop d4. And maybe that will be a little bit awkward for you? OK. Um, there's so many pawns to take. Which one? Will yeah. I take? Well, this one, no, no, yeah, no, this one's not. Knight takes e4, let's take a look. Okay, so I got to take. Take back. Take, take, take back. And knight d5. Okay, I see what you're up to. <laughs> okay, but I'm a pawn grubber. Oh, no, you're not trying to take the pawn. You're trying to fork <laughs> me. You I noticed. was about to play bishop c5. You and then suddenly knight c3 is a, a game changer. Okay, so that's the so you want to play rough. Mm -hmm. You want to play rough. Knight to d4. Give me the pawn on c6. I'm trying to convince you to move your queen so I can play. Queen takes e5. Okay. Are we just going to be making the, the draw? Bishop. Yeah, like like. I feel like the cleaning, uh, the the cleaner just came in and just swept the whole Take board. B four. Yeah, good job. <laughs> that's it. That's that's the good move. You just traded everything off, and uh, a, a handshake I indeed is uh, what's in store here. All right, as we get prepared for break, please, once again, we would like to invite you to join the discussion. Your social media questions have been very, very well received over the first four days of broadcast. We've enjoyed your questions, so uh, get ready as we come back uh, for, from broadcast. And as we leave you, we have yet another special from Bucharest as Christian was catching up with more chess fans and asking them about the competition. Have a look. We are here at uh, the playing venue with uh, Berta, who is a chess fan and came here. Berta, welcome to the show. Tell us a bit about your uh, chess experience. 
Uh, I was here also last year. It was very nice, uh, very tension. When you see the players there playing all the time and we see in the same time many games, it's very interesting also, but tension. Uh, sometimes you keep uh, with uh, one of the players and not uh, yours will mm -hmm. be the winner. It's very nice and uh, well, uh, very well uh, organized. When did you start playing chess and what is your average level, let's say? Uh, my uh, level is 900 and some on chess.com, mm -hmm. but um, I'm playing every day. I'm trying to p get a better, better performance, but I don't know <laughs> how it be in the future. I'm also registered to a, a chess club, but I'm trying. What attracts you to chess? Is it the social aspect, going to the club and playing with other people? What is it yeah, that attracts this is it. you? What you mentioned is interesting to play with uh, colleagues, to try to catch uh, some uh, technique, to have a plus plus value. Mm -hmm. uh, this is my, uh, your, my interest. Uh, your interest in chess. Yeah. And tell us a bit about uh, this particular tournament. Who is your favorite player? Uh, in reality, my favorite pay player is not here, is Magnus Carlsen, okay. but from here is uh, Nepo. Nepo. Yeah. Well, that was a heartbreak a couple of uh, weeks ago uh, because yeah, he lost I against Ding. I was almost cry after the game. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> this is it, God willing, yes. <laughs> also. Well, Berta, it's a pleasure to see you here. It's mm -hmm. a pleasure to see the environment here um, with these amazing players yeah, at really, the Superbat Chess Classic. Really, really thank you very much for thank taking you. the time. Can, thank you. The Muni's premiere season bursting with comedies, romance, and magic begins June 12th with the Muni premiere of Beautiful, the Carol King musical. The epic summer continues with Disney's Beauty and the Beast, Chess, West Side Story, Little Shop of Horrors, Rent, and Sister Act. Single tickets are now on sale at muni.org. The Muni in Forest Park. St. Louis, the chess capital of the United States. It also plays host to an award-winning shop dedicated to chess merchandise, all occasion gifts, and plenty more. At Q Boutique, you can shop both in-store and online. From quirky greeting cards to luxury chess sets, there is something for everyone at Q Boutique. Enjoy a shopping experience like no other. Make sure to check out QBoutiqueSTL.com for a wide variety of gifts for everyone to enjoy.
And welcome back uh, to our live coverage of the Superbet Tournament. And we have our results so far. Right, so far we only have one result today. It was a draw between Dudai and Caruana. A very, very well played, <laughs> correct game, uh, I might add. Uh, the four games that do remain are all quite exciting indeed. I want to jump quickly to the game of Ali Reza and Ding Lerin. Because again, this was one of these marquee games as we came into today's uh, round saying, keep an eye on this one and check this out. Uh, I want to say a very intuitive sacrifice uh, here by Ali Reza. He decided to gif up his e4 pawn for, well, is it a serious attack? Knight f3, exchange on a g3 followed by knight takes e4. Okay, knight g5. <laughs> now please, take my knight, develop my bishop, and put yourself in the very, very nasty pin. No thank you, said Ding Lerin. Uh, I'd rather play knight back to d6, bishop a2, preserving the attacking bishop, your full pawn down, if you will, rook e8 to defend this pawn on e5. And there's an intuition, it's mm -hmm. an attacking intuition that uh, players have that you just, sometimes you get mystified by and you say, where did you come up with this concept <coughs> that attack could be had. Bobby Fischer had it. Gary Kasparov had it. Michael Tall had it in spades. And this is a type of position you just say, I don't get. You know, I'm a pawn up. And then you say, okay, your turn. I'm going to play rook f1. But just no immediate threats. No immediate threats, but if it was my turn, like, I'm going to make a bad move for you. Bishop d2 here, and you might just simply be lost. Yes. Like, rook takes f6, queen takes f6, rook f1, and oopsie daisy, this bishop on a2, knight takes f7, uh, harmonic convergence suddenly lands on f7, and you're simply gone. So uh, after, for example, rook e8, the current position, if I play rook f1 or bishop d2, I'm not even sure which is the best approach. I just say, I'm slowly, slowly, I'm about to play bishop d2 mm -hmm. and rook f6. Do something. Say king g7. Excellent move. King g7 and bishop d2. So rook f6 is a threat. <coughs> you start let's, to feel it. Let's have a threat it. now that king's not on g8. Yes. Because now, let's say, if it was white to play and play rook f6, I take back rook f1. You're At not taking, least the king right. is better placed on a uh, g8. Can I g7. play e4 here? e5, e4. Fair question. Let's just check if it's losing or not after rook f6. Let's have a, a look see. Rook takes f6. Queen takes? Rook f1. Queen e5. Queen e5. Pause. Uh, because knight takes f7 is a tempo, but I'm also find myself attracted to bishop f4, which is another mm. tempo. I also had knight f5, I just noticed, instead of queen e5. I don't know if that's better, you did? but... What? Huh? What? <laughs> knight f5. Knight f5. You, you <laughs> sure did. Knight f5. And you've got ideas of mm -hmm. e3, which uh, cuts me off. Uh, I can capture on f7, but I'm kind of afraid of the e3. Great stuff. I'm telling you, Var, uh, when uh, Christian said he highlighted this game at the start of the show, and he said uh, Ding Lerin and um, Ali Reza are going to play a marquee matchup, he had this kind of a fight in mind. It has Ali Reza intuited that he has enough for the sacrifice pawn? I think uh, he had a really nice advantage, and I will show you if we go back a few more moves. I think the current, current position is actually quite unclear, and I think the last move, uh, rook e8, might be a slight inaccuracy by Ding Lerin, Okay. and he could have played the move e4, for example. But uh, let me show you the, the critical part here. So after the move knight c5 here, yeah. this is a really nice advantage here uh, for white in this position. So he played the move knight f3. Uh, another option would have been to play the move g4. 
Okay. The idea is you don't want to allow any counter play. The next move, you play the move knight f3 as well. I really like this setup. For example, one of the only moves here is to play knight h7 now, and then you play knight f3, opening up the diagonal for the bishop, and now you're pressuring, uh, pressuring the pawn on e5, so king g7. And now you can play with the move b4 even here. And uh, now the knight needs to uh, go away. You don't really want to take on b4 because after cb, there will be also potential of uh, the move bishop b2. For example, take, pawn takes, knight e6 to try to get to uh, f4. But in this case, after bishop takes e6, queen e6, we play the move a5. And it's pretty clear that white has a very nice advantage here. Right. So this was one option here. Knight f3 move he played. G4 would have given him nice advantage. Knight f3 is fine as well here. So the game <coughs> continued. Uh, H takes g3. F takes g3. And now play the move knight ce4. And here he played a move uh, knight g5 here. This is, this, is a, this is a mistake, actually. He should have played the move here bishop a2 first. Mm. Very, very deep move here. And now let's say if you play king g7. Right. Now you simply play the move g4. With the idea to play g5, remove the knight from here, and now e4, a knight is hanging. And if you move the knight anywhere, you will lose the e5 pawn here. So simple. this is actually a very big advantage here for white. Knight f2 is knight f2 or knight d6 are the best options, but after uh, knight takes e5 here, white has a really, really strong, uh, well, actually, sorry, here, knight f2, queen takes e5 here in this case. and. Queen takes e5, knight e5, and there's a pressure on f7. There's a nice initiative here for white here. So advantage here. But in, <coughs> in the game we have, uh, if we go back to the game after fg, he played uh, knight g5. And logical move, but perhaps he missed this move knight d6 or underestimated this idea. Because after knight takes g5, bishop g5, white has a really nice position here. Rook f1 is coming. A lot of pressure here, f7 is really weak. But after knight d6, there is a tempo here on the bishop, and you have to move the bishop back here. And here, Dink had a strong move, e4. Really? Yes, and now you want to put the pawn on e3, actually, to simply shut down this bishop, and also you cannot move the bishop to connect your rooks here. So this is actually a big advantage here uh, for, uh, for black. Wow. Bishop f4, for example. Sure. And now strong move, knight h5 attacking the bishop, and if you take on d6, there is queen takes g5 now. Uh -huh. And uh, queen g4, for example, and here you can even play the move king g7. So this would have been a nice edge uh, for black. But instead, he played the move rook e8, and I think this is the current position here, and uh, white has only one move in this position. He needs to find a move bishop f4 here. Really? Abs absolutely necessary move here, otherwise he will be in big trouble here. So that's why Alireza is thinking here, he's trying to figure out what to do, but the move bishop f4 wow. is necessary here. You cannot take on f4 because the queen is hanging on e7, you will lose an exchange. <laughs> and it's a very sharp line after this, bishop f4, knight h5. And here you can play, uh, you have a few options, you can play the move rook ad1 which is a very logical move. Bring the last piece into the game, and now you have some potential ideas, rook d6, knight f7, or bishop f7. Knight takes f4, you play g takes f4. Again, now pressure, a lot of pressure we see on f7, and black needs to play this move, king g7, to move away from the diagonal of the bishop here. And here, queen takes e5. You can't take with a pawn because g5 knight is hanging, so you'll have to play the move queen e5 check, and with the king on g7 now, you have this excellent move, queen f6. Because you don't really want to capture on e5, because that will allow f takes e5, and rook will go to the seventh rank. But if you play queen f6, the knight is very stable on d6, blockading the rook and also defending the crucial f7 pawn, and black is, black is okay here, it's just equal position. Thank you uh, for our talk about cobwebs. Wow. Uh, positions are blowing up all over the place. Uh, Nepo's advantage may have slipped considerably, whereas Richard Rapport may have be uh, getting a serious advantage. But while all of these actions are going on, we have asked, and you have delivered uh, social media questions, and we've got an enormous amount of tweets. 
and we welcome them. So let's just go with the Queen Revival. The question is, what do you think of blindfold chess? Should it be incorporated into competitions like this? I <laughs> admire the people greatly who play blindfold chess, and I'll shout out to Ben Feingold and Larry Christensen, amongst American players who play blindfold chess really, really very well. I never thought I was any particularly good. I can do like maybe three games. Uh, Maurice can do 10 games. Uh, I just find it, you know, it, 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 it's really, really uh, amazing for audiences who don't mm -hmm. know that, you, you know, blindfold, it, it's a great exhibition. Right, yeah. but uh, chess is already tough when you can <laughs> see the board. I don't know, how about you? Uh, Nashi, are you a blindfold player? Can you play five games, for example, simultaneously? I've never tried more than three. More, never and more three than three. three was getting uh, difficult. Testing, yes. Yeah. But I always recommend it to my students. To play a blindfold right. game. Because yeah. it helps you with uh, calculating in your head right. in advance, like 10 moves or so. Because right. When you're calculating that far, you can't really see the position clearly. Right. And playing blindfold chess kind of trains you to be able to picture the position always clearly in your head. And that is what you do. You do picture mm -hmm. the whole board. And Var, jump in. Uh, uh, do you recommend uh, blindfold for your students? And have, are, are you particularly good yourself? I actually played a lot of blindfold chess when I was a kid, when I was traveling to some tournament really? with my friends. So we played a lot of blindfold with Levon Aronian, Gabriel Sargisian. We played a lot of blindfold chess growing up. Uh, the maximum I've played was about five boards. I think I once did a simul, but it was very difficult. I was extremely tired and uh, it was a lot of stress doing the blindfold simul here. Um, I think I, I recommend to my students to play, you know, try to develop that vision of the board. And the way I do it, I just try to recollect the position. When I'm playing the game, I always try to remember the, it's like I have the board, I can see it in my, in my head and right. uh, follow it through like that. Definitely I can play one or maybe two games on a good level, but uh, more than that, it gets very difficult. Sometimes you lose the, the sight of the positions. Exactly, exactly. But to answer the question they About also asked, should it be incorporated in tournaments like this mm. for the players? Uh, I think it would be fun to watch them make terrible blunders. Yeah, they'll, they'll struggle a bit. Uh, but it depends. Uh, if they do uh, some very serious training, like I've, yeah. I've been at numerous dinners, for example, uh, with Fabi, where I'll just ask him, you know, like, what happened today? And he go, Brrr, <laughs> and I go, well, what happens if you go like this? Brrr, and so on and so on. So they have very good sight of the board. Uh, one more tweet and we'll jump back into the games uh, as uh, Anish Giri uh, seems to be suffering. Here's a question. How, how do the commentators feel about this new era in chess where Magnus is sitting out more and the playing field is a lot more equivalent and exciting? Interesting <laughs> question. Uh, Nasi, jump in with, uh, you're missing Magnus? Magnus? Yes, of course I am. It's like uh, 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 King Kong is not mm -hmm. in town, right? But I wouldn't say he's really sitting out that many tournaments. No. Uh, he plays every Rapid tournament, I think, and right. we're going to see him play very soon in the Rapid and Blitz. Right. And uh, it is interesting to see tournaments without him because I feel like every tournament that he played, he won <laughs> pretty right. much. So I do miss him, but it's also interesting to see how other players play without him. Right, these emergence of, for example, Ding Liren and Nepo and so forth. Uh, for, for, for me, I mean, it's like I do see a lot of Magnus. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. I mean, he's online and he's playing, as you say, in a lot of Rapid and Blitz. And it seems to me he's keeping a pretty busy schedule. But yes, if you ask me, I would love to see him in the Grand Chess Tour. Yes, I would love to have seen him in the World Championship match. And yes, I'd love to see him in the Sinkfield Cup. I mean, I just think he is a generational player, a great world champion. I mean, nothing else to be said. And yeah, I miss him. Uh, jump in, uh, Var. 
Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's uh, always great to see Magnus play, and uh, we're going to see him in our next tournament in Warsaw, Rapid and Blitz tournament. And <coughs> after that, he's also going to play in a Super United Rapid and Blitz in Zagreb, Croatia. It clearly shows that he prefers this Rapid and Blitz formats nowadays. And uh, I, th I think I expect to see him do really well in these both tournaments. He usually wins them or finishes at the very, very top. And uh, I also agree, without Magnus, the competition is more even now and gives an opportunity to the other players to think, uh, why can't they win this tournament, for example? Why not, uh, mm -hmm. indeed. Uh, let's jump back into the games as Richie Rapport, half a point behind Fabi, saying, hey, look what you're doing, Anish. Your pieces are going backwards, my pieces are going forwards. We left it around these parts. And we expected Castles, Knight C6. This one was a little bit of a surprise for us. Uh, much more natural would appear to be the move Rook on A1 to D1, followed by Bishop to G, uh, Bishop to C4. And even there was a possibility of G2, G4 for White. Yes, which that was Barb pointed out. an alien you? move. Yeah, an alien move indeed. And then after Rook D1, I was a little bit uh, perplexed by this one, knight e1. I think Anish, well, first of all, he wasn't drawn to the move g4. That is very, very clear. And from his perspective, he's seeing the move e5, e4, and he's seeing knight to d4. And I think he's getting himself a little frustrated that he doesn't have an active plan himself. So he kind of got out of the way, if you will, of this coming initiative and well Richard said well thank you very much you go backwards I'll go forwards knight d4 e4 uh, grabbing space grabbing squares along the way and always when I think about these positions I come back to what you had said earlier uh, Nasi and that is should black play the move a5 mm -hmm. break up the team a little bit over there like I want to play knight d4. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. I really, really want to play knight d4. But maybe I can do it on my terms and try to get you to play b4 so that when, b4, b5, pardon me, so that when I get to play mm -hmm. knight d4, my Hell favorite living, yeah, exactly, my favorite living condition. Uh, Richard wasn't interested in tossing in the move a5. He went for knight d4 right away, and we'll catch up with the players. Queen g3, uh, HG3, Richard, I guess, very reluctantly agreed to the trading of the queens. He's played knight g4. I like this knight g4 move. I love this mm -hmm. move, knight g4. P prepping knight e5, getting out of the way of the f5 pawn, trying to use the majority, and finally, and much more directly, maybe just ready to play e4, e3, right up the gut. <laughs> and how big, I mean, it, visually, it looks good for Richie. How big of an advantage is it, really, Var? It's a very, very big advantage here, plus one here for uh, uh, Richie oh, here. Wow. And one thing I noticed, Yasser, Anish played so many moves with the queen in this game, you know? And yes. it started out with the move queen g5, and <coughs> the move that we, we were not sure about. And since then, I, I counted he played like at least, I think, about eight moves with the queen in this game so far. Out of the 30 played yeah. or so? Yeah, yeah, out of the yeah 29 moves. In the current position, by just looking at it, you can tell that he, all his pieces are on the back rank here. Literally, every piece he has, rooks the knight. It's extremely passive position here. And uh, Richie, I think, has good chances here in this game. He's a little bit behind on the clock, though, 29 minutes against 13. But the best uh, move here to continue, I think, is to start out with the move g5. Okay. Then you give yourself the chance to play uh, king g7, f5, and try to expand um, on that king side here. A very passive defense. Uh, for for white here, he can play perhaps a move like rook a b1, and uh, trying to at some point prepare a4 b5. And here you can play king g7. You can play right. slow and try to build up, but also you can play more concrete with a move e3 here. And now the threat is e2. It's extremely strong threat, so you're forced to capture. And now knight takes e3. Knights are very active here, putting a lot of pressure here. And after a rook let's say rook d3, which is the best move. You can play the move even g4 here, 
completely fixing the structure here. Very difficult uh, to find moves here. The knight only one has no squares. It's, you know, you were trying to maybe go to knight to f3 now, but after the move g4, you can't even do that. So very big advantage for your Richie report here. I think he has good chances here. Nasty cramp. It just feels like ugh, the knight on e1 and uh, a kind of an advanced Fisher random by White putting all of his pieces <laughs> on the first rank, you know, and mm, doesn't, doesn't feel good. Uh, I, I, I like I, Black's position. I'll also say it might be a little bit easy for Black, Black's advantage to slip away if Black doesn't play accurately, precisely. Yeah. Because if you he, play, for example, e3 right away, because uh, Varun is suggesting g5, which is not a natural looking move. For me, I, I like, I, I love playing with the majority, and mm. uh, it's my trump as black, uh, the kingside majority. So I find moves f5, f5 yeah. and g5 as the most natural moves in the position. I might slightly prefer g5 because oftentimes I like playing the king to g7. Mm -hmm. Somehow it just feels like in the game of Ding Laren, the king's like a little a bit more. Yeah, you improve yeah. a little bit. So f5, g5, king g7. But then, before I really start reaching for them, I start thinking about the e3, e4, right. e3, and maybe that's going to bring me glory right away. In fact, Richie played a little bit, well, a lot more sedate. He played the move rook to d5, bishop to c4, rook to d1, and potential? And he's just hoping for uh, a repetition. He would be very happy to get out of... Uh, uh, here and uh, again tomorrow is a free day and Richie's play so far does belies the idea that he's willing to accede to a repetition I don't think that that's what's going to happen Var I see you've got the Ding Lorin game behind you let's jump into it what's happening in Ding Lorin's game well uh, Firuja didn't play that move Bishop f4 guys the move that we were analyzing sure and now I think he is in uh, serious trouble here so let's take a look so the move that he had to play in this position was the move Bishop f4 which would have lead to a dynamic but equal position at the end he will recapture the pawn on e5 but instead he played the move h4 kind of a very calm move like uh, it's not like he's down a pawn he's just uh, strengthening the position here and now uh, rook a d8 is, uh, there, there are two moves here, you can play rook a d8 or king g7. So uh, Ding just played the move king g7. It's a very logical move, we saw this move actually played in a lot of the variations. You really want to step away from this diagonal where the bishop is just right. putting pressure. And also sometimes queen c2, queen g6 ideas can happen, so it's a really good a preventing move here. So king g7 is played and I think now Ali Reza is thinking, trying to figure out what to do. I don't see how he can continue here. So there, there are two options here for him. He can play the move, for example, rook f1 to try to put some pressure on the f file. But now black can continue with the move queen d7, which is the best move. And uh, queen f, uh, the idea of this move is now you're threatening to play queen c6 check. So for example, if queen f3, queen c6, and you will be able to exchange queens, and after that you have an extra pawn and a comfortable advantage here. So it's, it's hard to see where is the compensation here. At some point, this move e4, e3 will be played as well. Knight f4, knight f5 is another possibility. Uh, so after rook f1, queen d7, black is much better. If he goes back to this original idea of <laughs> bishop f4, now there are some options here for black here. And uh, for example, you actually can play either knight d e4 or knight f e4, blockading the e file here. They're both about the same uh, strength, this move. So let's start out with the move knight d e4. Now, the idea is if you capture on e4, that will allow me to move e takes f4, and now black is simply winning mm. because of the pin on the e file. So very nice idea uh, knight uh, d or f e4 here and now you have to come back play a move like bishop c1 mm -hmm. which is uh, not that great here so difficult position here for Ali Reza and he has 11 minutes on the clock with 14 moves to go Ding has 23 minutes I see a uh, good chances here for the world champion to perhaps to score his first victory in this tournament 
something he desperately needs. I'd like to turn our attention to the game between Jan and MBL for just a moment. I'm going to go back earlier uh, because this, for me, was very, very confusing. When we left uh, the position, we left it just about after the move king h7, king f2, g5. Now, exactly here, I look at this position uh, and I say, what are my trumps as white? What are mm -hmm. your trumps as black? For me, the fact that I have the double rooks on the D file, this is an excellent bishop that's patrolling this diagonal, and this is a terrible knight on B7. In my mind, white's majority on the queen side, that's my trump. So I really, desperately, I want to play the move C4. I want to play B3, which kind of fixes the queen side, so that I can play bishop B2. Once I eliminate this knight on f6, I get to play rook d7. It's like, sign the score sheets. So c4, b3 would have been on my agenda, and I find this move h4 very confounding, because when I play the move h4, I'm playing on the king side where mm -hmm. black has the majority. So I feel I'm playing in my opponent's kitchen, and I shouldn't be over there, I should be where I have an advantage. After h4, king g6, takes, takes, I've, I'm saying, well, well, haven't I helped black's position? The, the rooks on the half-open c file aren't very good, whereas I've opened up the h file, and maybe I'm just simply helping my opponent. And it feels to me that after quite an, a sequence of moves, we've reached a position where a lot, if not all, in fact, of the advantages to simply disappear. I mean, I can see that from MVL's point of view, the knight on b7 suddenly, well, in the very near future, has a square, mm -hmm. whereas the rooks have really good squares. Uh, the rook coming, doubling on the open h file, well, I mean, it's not that difficult to see rook h2 and rook mm -hmm. h3 mate. Where did, I mean, if that's not a self, uh, you know, um, created uh, <laughs> problem. problem. Yeah. I don't know what is. So I think Nepo's advantage has disappeared, whereas uh, take a look, if you don't mind, about the Wesley So uh, Diot position. Again, I've been extolling uh, Wesley's strate uh, strategic play, and it feels to me like Despite the material balance, Wesley, Wesley all the way. Absolutely, Wesley has a very nice advantage, <coughs> and this is a very difficult defense uh, for Diak here. Knight on f5 is excellent. The pawn right. on d6 is going to be weak the whole time, and even some knight end games with the bishops. Even if we take the rooks off the board, for example, which is going to be very hard for Black to do. White will keep that one rook to pressure on d6. It'll be very difficult to defend this position here. So I see some good uh, opportunities for Wesley to try to win this game and get to that plus two score and right. catch Fabiano here. Let's take a look what is the best way Diak can try to defend this end game. Right. So the first thing he needs to do, I think it's pretty clear, he needs to put this bishop on f8. Okay. So he, you have the freedom to move the rook because otherwise your rook is always have to defend this. And now I think Wesley has uh, two options. Uh, he can play rook a1 or rook c1. So he needs to try to get a rook on uh, one of the open files, so rook a1, for example. Now, after this move, you have rook a6 ideas to putting pressure on d6. Also, you can play rook a7 here. Right. It would be very nice for black to somehow exchange this knight on f5 or somehow play the move g6, but it's not going to be easy to do that. So if you play the move knight f6 here to try to attack the pawn on e4, now knight will jump in uh, to d2 here, protecting e4, and now you're preparing this move f3 with the idea of knight c4 to target this really weak pawn on d6. So you need to try to play actively. Perhaps the move knight f4 could be played here, but immediately we see problems here. Rook a6 now targeting the d6 pawn. You have to play rook d8 now. And uh, e even in this line with bishop takes f4, you have, you have a nice advantage here as well. Uh, the one thing it's clear that with the move knight f4, you are threatening to play this move g6. So white uh, needs to do something here in this position against that. So uh, if you take immediately on f4, pawn takes, you can play the move uh, f3. The idea is to protect e4, so you're ready to play the move knight c4 here. But now black has g6, 
knight to d4. Now again, we have an excellent square for the knight to go to on c6. Right. Still a, a big advantage for white, it's like plus one. But again, this is the very best way to play for block. And with all these accurate moves, you're still in a difficult position here. But if you don't find these moves, you could simply drop the d6 pawn and then after lose the game. Thank you uh, for that, Var. I, I really feel like uh, poor Diak, uh, his whole first four rounds, in fact, the first half of the tournament has been a little bit nightmarish for him because, you know, chess should be fun. <laughs> and all he's been doing is, you know, like fighting for survival, and it looks like he's uh, doing the same thing. Uh, once again, uh, by the way, in the game between Richie and Anish Gary, no repetition. In fact, uh, G7, G5, one of the computer's top choices, uh, not surprisingly, was played by Richie. But yeah. he has four minutes to make 11 moves, Richie. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Uh, the time management uh, makes a fool of all of us, but G7, G5. Yes. Great You're move. Ready for King G7, F5, and just gradual improvement. It's an end game, so it's not as difficult to make 11 moves with four minutes. Especially when you have an initiative. Sorry. Correct. But if uh, the position still requires precise moves, yeah. then that's when time trouble is going to be a problem. Exactly. But I liked also, like, it's very easy to get confounded by the fact that this knight on E1 really doesn't have a future at the moment. So imagine you were white and you thought, okay, well, what, what's the problem? I'm just going to use my kingside majority for, or queen's, pardon me. I'm just going to use my queenside majority for a moment. I'm going to go a4, mm -hmm. b5, and everything like this. And I think Var pointed out a, a very salient feature in the position, which is that after e3, e3 takes, knight takes, rook d2, d2 you're, you, you may be thinking, oh, well, you know, what's, what's so bad about my position? And you start looking at the position after g4 for just a second and go, where's my <laughs> active play? You know, the pawns on G2 and G3 just, just make a bad impression. So much uglier after G4. Don't they? Don't they? Yeah, and the knight on E1 looks really, really passive. And now after you've played a move like B5, even the bishop is starning to complain and saying, <coughs> well, I don't have a, a, as, as much range as I did a moment ago. The pawns are not threatening in and of themselves. But I just, like, I, I just think that white's pieces are simply passive. And for a player like Anish, who prides himself on his um, classical mm -hmm. understanding of chess, and he likes playing aggressive chess when he can, uh, he's not going to be happy uh, about the position uh, that's uh, shown up on the board. Uh, for Richie, wow, a victory today, uh, tied for first, uh, a free day. Uh, I mean, uh, the heart uh, skips a beat at uh, such a possibility. And uh, uh, we, we thank you for your social media, joining the conversations. And let's, let, let's take a tweet. This one is from Isaiah1776. Yes, sir. How can studying your own lo losses improve your game slash skill? Well, don't focus too much <laughs> on your losses. Uh, your wins are, uh, help you improve your game uh, as well. But it's absolutely true that uh, studying your losses will inspire you to get a deeper understanding of the position. Why did I lose the game? Why did I overlook my opponent's play? And if you can take away something positive from a loss by, by, by giving yourself what you hope will be uh, additional knowledge, then, yeah, you can kind of feel like that loss was fruitful of sorts. But in truth, I mean, uh, study your wins as well. I mean, uh, what, you do, what you do well, what brought you success. Um, study your games. <laughs> uh, you, you learned a lot from your losses, for sure. Yes. But you also learned a lot from your wins, right? Yes, because uh, if... If you win, that means your opponent made some mistakes. So from every game, you can learn something. Someone True. made some inaccuracies or mistakes. Exactly. Uh, and I think that's, like you said, the only positive about losing a game is that you're going to analyze and learn where you need to improve, what right. mistakes you made, 
and hopefully not repeat them again. Exactly. For me, the worst loss, the worst loss is it, it's absolutely, I despise myself when this happens, is when I lose because of a, a completely egregious blunder. I yeah, learn nothing, nothing. <laughs> from the and, game. And you know it's going to happen again in yeah. the future. <laughs> Hate it. Uh, uh, jump in, coach. Uh, I, I can't remember you ever losing a game, but uh, jump in. Tell us about wins and losses and learning from them. No, I, I've lost many, many games, Yasser. Yeah, and uh, uh, game analysis has been always a big part of my game. I've um, saved and analyzed all my games for the past 25 years. I keep a very a nice archives of all the games after each tournament game I analyze it and you, you, you improve a lot by doing that finding out your mistakes if you if you play the bad game and try to fix that to make sure it doesn't happen in, in the next game also if your opponent makes a mistake you recognize that in this certain positions this kind of move could lead to a difficult position so I would and I also spend a lot of time analyzing my students games and that's the big part when they come back from tournaments we go over the games try to uh, pay attention to the losses in particular where there were some mistakes sorry I have to jump in here Var and interrupt you for just a moment because I'm looking at what Jan is doing and uh, Jan is, we're gonna put Jan on suicide watch what the heck was this last move uh, by Jan. Uh, here, I already question much of his play. Why am I helping my opponent open up the king side with the move h4, h takes g5? Why am I uh, not keeping the h file closed? And after this move, bishop a3, knight to e5, bishop b2, this move must have just surprised uh, uh, Jan. Rook h8, and I can't understand. He was probably thinking in his mind's eye that you can't allow bishop takes mm -hmm. e5, like bishop e takes e5, I'll double your pawns. And MBL said, What's, what's the problem? Um, bishop takes e5 is not the problem. Like he lost the, 10 moves. Black improved the position significantly. Like, yeah, with and each white turn, made right? It worse and worse. Exactly. From Black's perspective, the double pawns. The, 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 there's nothing to fear. This pawn on e6 is doing a great job keeping the knight out. Furthermore, rook d6 is not a check, so thank you for the pawn. This Lastly, is one the of knight the rare gonna... times when knight on b7 is not bad. <laughs> well, it, it ain't going to last on b7 that much longer because I got to tell you, that is one of the sweetest looking mm -hmm. outposts. The knight on c5, never mind the pawn on b3, which I'm always constantly thinking yeah. about, but e5, e4, rook h3 check. I wouldn't be surprised if this position is simply is much better. Is black just winning? For black, very easily. Rook, e, rook h3 is a, a winning threat. By the way, we do that have MBL king. was in time trouble, but now he only has two moves to make and to reach the time control. Well, this just with feels such a great position. Exactly. By the way, you're talking about the knight on b7. After a move like rook h2 check, your knight might go to this g2 square where it'll yeah. disappear for the rest of the game like what's it doing on g2 uh, versus a fabulous knight on c5 var we're we're seeing nepo implode in these last two uh, games uh before the free day tomorrow absolutely yes sir i can't even explain the decisions he's making so far in this game i mean uh, in the past 10 moves, Black just completely improved his pieces and this opening up this H file, it was completely unnecessary. He should have never even played H4 in the first place because, you know, as you mentioned, clearly he allowed opponent to gain contraplay. Right. And, and this last few moves as well, now he's actually completely lost. It's like plus four for MVL here. Plus 95, four? Yeah, 95 wow. just played. Uh, yeah, it's uh, perhaps knight c5 wasn't even the best move. Rook h2 was the best to play in this position. Rook h2, check, knight g2, and then knight comes to c5. And, and suddenly all of the pieces for black are very active. Now b3 pawn is under attack. There are so many threats in this position. If you take only five, just try to reduce the pressure by eliminating one of the pieces. Now pawn takes back now. The question is how are you going to protect your pawn on mm. b3 right and uh, if you try to defend with something like rook b2 then e4 disaster opening up the position of the king and uh, it's it's very clear this position is going to collapse 
And by the way, this is a reflection, remarkably mm -hmm. enough, of, uh, well, we're not going to call it an adoption. <laughs> But uh, I, we do want to say that MVL rather owns uh, their uh, classical chess rivalry. I'm sure in rapid chess and blitz chess, uh, the different results. But one win only for Nepo versus and, uh, that many losses. That definitely affects you psychologically when you play an opponent who has a very good score against you. Absolutely. One You're, more thing, yeah. guys, I wanted to sure. mention. Once again, if we look at the clock, Jan still has 30 minutes to go. Mm -hmm. And the question comes, could he have maybe spend a little bit of time? Right. Because he, he still has this 30 minutes, but now completely ruined his position. And just spend a little bit of time at least to shut down when things are going wrong. At least you need to shut down the game. And now I think there's a good chance he's going to lose this game. And uh, from uh, essentially pretty much a winning position he had about 15, 15, 10, 15 moves ago. A uh, remarkable, remarkable turnaround. The double rooks on the D file are now like vacuous empty space whereas the double rooks on the h file very very menacing everything about black's position is harmonized and white's position is a complete uh, fail uh, let's go uh, jump uh, once again wesley so enjoying his position he's just played the move knight on f3 to d2 uh, ready to play f2 f3 knight c4 uh, wesley in control of this one but Anish Gary and uh, Richie Rapport, whoa, 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 whoa. We left it. We just saw the move. King G7, G5 and King G7 makes sense. A4. I was, a little, I, I was fearful this was my analysis because <laughs> I was saying that after F5, I didn't believe in mm -hmm. this expansion B5, A, B. Bishop takes B5. Maybe well, that wasn't the follow up we wanted when you right. played. Sorry. Maybe F5 was a little bit slow and you should have played E3 right away. Okay, F7, F5, uh, I can't be too critical. Uh, maybe E3 wa was a better choice. And, and G4, like the line we're looking at. Exactly, right? but B5, A, B, Bishop takes B5. And again, I'm a structure guy, and when I see uh, uh, White inflicting this damage to his own structure, I say congratulations, <laughs> well played. You show great, uh, great knowledge. Uh, knight takes b5, a takes b5. Ah, because we're not, we're not dominating the knight as we previously would have been when the pawn was on f7 and we could have played g4. Mm. Uh, knight e5. I still like Richie's position a lot, but did he spoil something by not jumping in there with that e3 move R? Absolutely. Now uh, the evaluation is actually just equal at the moment. Equal. And, yeah, Richie. Uh, he spoiled uh, it a lot. F5. Then. F5 was the critical uh, error, actually. He's only he's got a minute on a clock with uh, uh, still six, uh, uh, six moves to go. And I think that was a big factor uh, uh, in his decision to play F5. He had to play the move E3 in that position. I will show you some uh, key lines, I think, to, to realize why. Uh, in this position, he didn't have to play the move f5. f5, this b5 is actually a very serious uh, idea to gain a counterplay. That's why he needed to play the move e3 to now threaten the move e2. After capture, knight takes e3. And I think we had a similar variation, the variation that we looked at it after rook d3, g4. And right. now white cannot really move anything here. So this is a very pleasant position. Maybe you can play king f2, but even after knight takes f1, king takes f1 this knight is still stuck only one cannot go anywhere here knight c2 you cannot go i have rook f5 check so very very difficult position in fact uh i'm actually threatening to give a mate just an example you play this really bad move check king g1 knight e2 and now we see the idea behind this move g4 because you can checkmate nice. the opponent here so this e3 was very strong uh to play move 31 here but he's uh, he's got about two minutes on the clock so he played the move b5 a, B, I think it's possible he uh, maybe missed bishop B5, but even after A takes B5, you know, white is very slightly better after knight E5. So it's still playable like this. But the problem after bishop B5, you... It's a tempo. You tempo on the rook, and you can, in every line you try to move the rook up, let's say you play rook E5 here, you're going to run into this move knight C2, which is uh, crucial because now you're attacking the knight on D4 and you cannot capture it because the eighth rook is hanging. So you have to play in, let's say, knight e6 here. Right. And now a rook can take 
on d8, knight takes d8. Now suddenly the knight was only one and now it's on d4. In the centralized position putting <coughs> pressure on f5. And if you take here, just bishop d7 and white has a very good contraplay here. But we have a couple of moves here, guys. Let's catch up right. to see what happened here. Uh, it was uh, bishop takes b5, knight takes b5, a b5, and knight e5 has been played, Var. Yeah, knight c2 played by Anish, uh, trying to bring the knight into the game. Very logical move. Knight d3 and c6. C6. And uh, here, um, again, Richie is playing on 30 second increment, so he doesn't have time to get into the position here. So perhaps he could have played the move rook d5 here first. Uh, the idea is to put pressure, and if you take on b7, we have the move rook b8 here. Not, a, not an easy move to find, so he didn't play that. He played uh, b takes c6. Now pawn takes c6. And we do have, yeah. we do have rook d6. R rook d6 played. And after rook d6, uh, I'm going after this pawn, but... I'm thinking there's a weakness on f5, and maybe I got rook b7 check. I'm sensing that Anish actually might have some opportunities here because rook takes e6, I got knight d4. Mm -hmm. The pawn on f5 is a little bit weak. I've got knight e3 I'm ideas also as well. Thinking this idea might, might be bad, but let's say I push c7. Okay. If you play rook c8. Okay. I have knight a3, and I, I just want to put knight on b5, and then that looks winning uh, to me. And uh, secure the pawn on c7. Thank you very much. That uh, that's a that's a really powerful uh, passer. Black yeah. should probably take on c7 here and play down an exchange. With a knight on d3, yeah, probably be good drawing chances. But that is already a mm -hmm. demonstration of how quickly the advantage is turned. And again, I, I'm sorry, uh, Nasi. What is the clock times for Richie? I know Richie's in a. He, he looks nervous, mm -hmm. and he's <laughs> nervous for a reason, right? Right. He only has one minute on the clock and still has to make three moves, while oh. Anish has 22 minutes. And uh, a, a crucial moment right here: c6, c7, and knight a3. And again, I'm 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 trying to put together. Something like, for example, if I'm white and I play a move like whoop, rook b5, and I say, uh, gift me mm -hmm. the pawn. If you play rook takes c6, which mm -hmm. is maybe not a good move or not, I go knight d4, and what I want to say is, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, first impressions is, you know, I'm taking over, you know, like on a good day, I get to play rook g7 checkmate. <laughs> we all know that, the, the, those types of uh, winning um, procedures, if you will. So I'm feeling like Anish has opportunity, uh, Var, is, is the window there? Absolutely. He, I mean, uh, he made so much progress compared to like about 10 moves ago where all his pieces were on uh, the back rank. <coughs> And uh, now uh, I think Ricci needs to be accurate. With accurate play, he should be able to hold. But definitely the advantages on Anish's side, the, you know, big change in the momentum in this game here. Exactly. Now suddenly there is a pass pawn on the sixth rank. And I like the move C7 here, suggested by Nazi. I think that's right. the best move here. And I think we might see an endgame where Black will take on C7, lose the exchange. And we get this four on three with a strong knight on D3, right. which I think you're probably going to be able to hold with a precise play. But definitely you're going to have to be defending it for a while, which is very unpleasant because, uh, you know, he, he had a great position. He was probably thinking maybe he can win this game right. and, you know, tie for first. And now suddenly he has to work very hard not to lose this game. Well, precisely, two huge turnarounds as we're seeing Nepo implode, right. maybe Richie uh, as well. Uh, but we're seeing but I want to potentially jump to... a lot of uh, <laughs> decisive games. Please. Uh, right, I want to jump to our... Uh, Game Ali Rija against Ding. Uh, so by the way, rook like... b7 check, not c7. Rook okay. b7 check, king g6 was played quickly, but I'm with you. I'm I'm on the Ding. I'm loving Lurin. the pawn on e3. It looks like Black has uh, 
extra material and the compensation. Like, you're like right. Uh, uh, Roman Gingy uh, has really uh, one of the great. Sorry for uh, interrupting, guys. There was one uh, very interesting moment in this game, so I yes. want to show you this moment mm -hmm. here where he played Please. the move Bishop D2. The uh, in fact, Lorenz game. Of yeah, Ding Lorenz game here. Current position is actually losing, actually. Uh, it's a big advantage for Ding, but wow. right here he had a chance here to try uh, Firuja. Probably his last, last chance to complicate the matters. And in order to do that, he had to find some incredible moves here. So the first is the move h5 because he had played this move h4 with right. the idea to protect but also at the same time you always have to look for the opportunity to play this move right. so he probably didn't play this move because simply he thought okay what if his opponent just takes with the pawn you don't want to take with the knight because that will allow the move knight f7 but after this he has an incredible resource in this position Whoa. and that is knight h7 no so, way no way wow so uh, black has two options, can Water take move. with the knight or uh, with the king. If you take with the king, now you play the move bishop g5, pinning wow. the knight. Can I play knight d to e4? Knight to e4, and now this clever move, bishop b1, comes in into oh. play. <laughs> and now you're pinning, and king g7 <coughs> is the best move. Bishop, bishop takes, takes e4. e4. And black is still maybe a little bit better, but this would have been his best chance. Knight takes e4. Bishop e7, rook d2. Rook d2. Amazing. Uh, queen bishop takes d2. Check? Oh, sorry. Or, yeah, bishop f6 check, probably just king g6 there. Okay. So knight d2, and this end game is, uh, I think white has uh, decent chances to hold this position. It's, it's still very complicated. But the line what after. Line. <laughs> yeah, but the line mm. after knight h7, it's even more uh, crazy if you place the move knight h7. Because now you're down a piece and down two pawns, but you have some very strong attack here, and black needs to be careful. So for example, queen takes h5 now. Right. And here you can play the move king h8 or f6, but it will lead to the same uh, outcome, actually. f6, now you want to bring your queen into the defense. Now, rook h1, putting pressure on h7. And now black has to find the only move, king h8. Defending the knight. Now you play this move that is very, very easy to miss this. Queen g6. Wow. And rook g8, you think, okay, I can just play this move, try to get rid of the queen. I'm about to win this game. And now we see the, if bishop g8, you have rook g8 idea. But here, the very unexpected, rook takes h7. Queen takes h7. Oh, <laughs> And queen f6. You cannot play rook g7 because d8 oh, is hanging. No. And if you go to g7, queen h4, check. Queen h7, queen f6 would have uh, <laughs> saved the game for Ali Reza. You know, I got to tell you, Bar, that's a great variation. But I want my opponent's pockets to be checked <laughs> after he comes up with knight h7. Yeah. What a move. And what about the current position? The current position. The current position is he just played the move rook ad1. Six minutes for Ali Reza. Dink has four minutes, it's uh, uh, pretty much a winning advantage if Dink can find this move, knight d e4. Not a difficult move to find well, at all. The f7 is, is hanging, seven. that's the problem, that's why it's maybe a little bit, uh, he, he's calculating, but if this move is played, he's just winning because if, let's say, rook takes d8, okay. rook takes d8, now you have a very strong threat of rook d2. Precisely. And if you play the move bishop e3, just try to collect the pawn back, there is a tactic, knight takes g3. Discovered attack on yeah. the bishop on e3. And you have to uh, interpose this move knight e6 check, just to make sure you don't lose immediately. After capture, king takes g3, Bishop e3, but this is just uh, a losing position because Extra black problem. has a better king as well. And now e5 is coming up with the idea of knight h5. We have an update. Uh, Dink played knight e4, but the wrong knight, I think, to e4. Absolutely. This looks like an a inaccuracy. And now bishop d6 will allow Firuja to completely get back into the game here. Bishop what? takes d6, eliminating F7. this knight. Knight d6 is the only move because of the rook f7 threat. And after knight d6, bishop takes f7. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Stop for just a second because there is rook takes... D no, rook takes d6 and rook takes f7 is going to be met by rook d2. Rook d2 at the end of at that line, end. yes. So, sorry, can, please continue. So, uh, the best bishop way... Uh, actually, white has options <coughs> now even here, guys. You can also play knight f7 or bishop f7, but I think it will lead to the 
same um, outcome at the end. Bishop takes f7. Okay. Knight takes f7. A rook takes f7. Queen takes Queen his Queen takes four. f7. Knight takes f7. And now rook takes d1. Rook takes d1. Queen takes d1. And uh, e2. Uh, King f7 is the only move because if you play e2, queen d7. Queen d7. Ooh, wow. Go ahead and make a queen. You make a I've queen. I've got a discovered <coughs> And now knight e5 is nice. just a mate. Incredible. King f6, knight g4 is a wow. mate. Sweet. <laughs> so, and if you go to uh, f8, queen f7 mate, queen g8 will lose to the move uh, queen f7. And uh, if you. you play king h6 then knight g4, wow, knight g4 <laughs> wow. and now queen h7 takes and queen g6 checkmate and if you play the move king h8 instead of king <coughs> h6 <coughs> ah, then simply just take on okay. e8 and <coughs> queen f7 will Excuse give a mate here so that's why we cannot play the move e2 it's possible wow. that maybe ding missed that well, this is going to be an insane game because yeah. they have ten more moves to make, nine more moves to make. And now king 10. takes f7. Four actually, minutes. Yeah, sorry, queen e2 here, and Less here, than four minutes. Uh, white is a little bit better. White is the only one with uh, winning chances here in this uh, variation. Var, the the game's going to blow up in the next few moves, and both players are literally at four minutes for. Mm -hmm. Again, Masi, how many moves did you say? Uh, they just made move 30, so 10 more moves to go. I mean, they, they, <laughs> I didn't talk happen. about, you know, da, 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 <laughs> heartbeats per minute, you know, yeah. and everything else. Uh, this is a three result the, game. Yeah, the, we, Any, we've got to keep Anything can an happen, guys. One. Anything yeah. can happen here. Yo, yeah. We'll keep an eye on this as, okay, bishop takes d6, as you suggested, f7. And I don't know, but I just have the feeling that... Uh, with that last move, the way he played it, bishop takes d6. Confident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was also like happiness, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like he was doing it with a little relish <laughs> that we're ready to pounce on the f7 pawn. Knight f6 to e4 spoiled Ding's, all of Ding's advantage in one move. And uh, through the magic of television, we get to see a repeat. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Ding was reaching for the knight, but it was knight d6 to e4 that was going to bring him the yeah. advantage, not the knight f6 to e4. We're going to go back to, uh, well, just a second, here we go. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's Perugia with the, uh, with the little twist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He says that he can pick up f7 and... Course, yeah, of course. Uh, okay, we will, we'll, we'll get to that. But the point was that after e3, rook d1, this moment was key. Knight on d6 to e4, uh, voluntarily giving up this pawn on f7, you're welcome to take it. But those variations where you do take it don't work out very well uh, for the first player. And in the meanwhile, rook d2 is on... Uh, on Black's agenda, including also ideas of knight g3. The current position, Nasi, uh, you know, sometimes you get these kind of positions where you have a, desi a desire to be one, pl uh, uh, one side or another, but I've got to tell you, in that position where I get to play queen versus rook and knight, and I, I, I freely admit you've got a great pawn on now, E2. Ding might be thinking that after E2 he's just winning and missed that queen D7 let's do a checkmate. From afar he mm, could have from missed afar, that. Yeah. I've got to I got to say I would be surprised if white doesn't win this at the 2800 club level. The reason is because you're going to put your king on E1 mm -hmm. and at a certain moment your queen's going to be free. Free to pick up all the pawns. Exactly and I'm thinking black's king whether you whether you make a, a king walk majestically to the queen side or you stay on the king side, I think the queen is, is too strong. And white can also create a pass pawn on the king side, so that helps a lot. Thanks to the majority there as well. So we think, uh, Var, that after knight takes d6, the current position, 
We think those positions where you play the queen versus rook and bishop, uh, long term, uh, Ferruja should win. White should win. Yeah, he definitely has an advantage uh, in that end game. Right. Uh, yeah, he's, he's now he's down a, to a minute. A minute yeah. <laughs> And uh, uh, he, he, in that endgame, in order to win, he needs to regroup, uh, regroup with putting a king on it too, so he can move the queen freely. So bishop f7 play. I think this will lead to the uh, same thing. Well, uh, the problem is you have to take on f7 mm -hmm. because bishop takes f7 introduces the idea of knight e6 check, yes. which is devastating. So all of these trades, pretty much forced. And the players are going right down that line. And Rook takes d1 and looks forced. As long as Dink doesn't push e2 here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. This is the key moment here. Exactly. So you were suggesting, Nasi, that when in his mind's eye, when he played the move knight e4, he got to this position, did Ding Liren. And he thought, well, I could be winning with the move e2, and quite possibly forgot mm -hmm. queen d7 turns the tables completely. It's possible. He had to take the knight, and now the move queen e2, and eventually bringing the king to e1. But that I takes care of the time trouble, by the way, because yes. they played all of these moves. Mm -hmm. Please. Sorry. They still have five moves to go, but right now it's simplified. Simplified, very much so. Right. I do think black can still hold this with accurate play. You think so? I just, Tell earlier me Earlier I thought maybe white could pick up b7 and g6, but now I'm thinking black can just play bishop c5 and b6. Okay. So queenside pawns will be safe. So let's secure the queenside mm -hmm. pawns, as you say. Uh, by the way, I did notice that I did have a queen's bit. Okay, let's let, 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 let's mm -hmm. get to a position that we can both agree, mutually agree. And black rook is also free. It can move to d-file and try to play actively. Yeah, but it's one of those things. The power of the queen uh, is so... Uh, her ability to change directions, uh, whether it be on a diagonal or a file, Okay. King here, G7, let's King say. King G7. Now, in the immortal words of Nikolai Menev, gift me your pawn. <laughs> I guess I have to s defend with Rook D7. Okay. Which I didn't want to do. But <laughs> exactly. And now you 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 gave me a clue uh, <laughs> earlier when you said, but you can create a pass pawn as well as w White can create a pass pawn on the king side. I want to play G4. I want to play queen e5 check, I want to play h5, and I want to keep yeah. you busy. Yeah, it's going to be very difficult to hold for one. One, yeah, thing, exactly. one suggestion maybe, guys, uh, maybe the best is to keep the rook on an e file <laughs> at all times. Okay. And let's put the king on g7. So okay. as soon as we, uh, white moves the queen, we have this idea of e2. Okay. So like, let's say, in this position. Yeah. So if the queen moves, we play e2. And now bishop f2 is a serious threat. Exactly. So we'll just kind of... And now uh, maybe rook e7 first. And now some bishop e3 ideas possible. Bishop e3 ideas? Yes. Yes. So and that then you bishop can, d2. Oh. And can go bishop to d2. So if black manages to push e2, then that's holding for black? Yeah, I think this is probably the best way to try to hold this position mm -hmm. because now uh, it's little bit, you, you don't have a threat basically here. You can't take the pawn I have bishop... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. So uh, I I need to unwind. I want to put my king on e2, obviously, and course. to maintain that pawn yeah. on e3 for as long as I can. And by the way, queen e2 on the board, as expected. Uh, did that move bishop c5 injure you, by the way? Bishop c5, I noticed there was this queen check. Maybe I'm not losing it, though, king g7, because okay. you can't really afford take to it? take it. Yeah. Because E2, E2 is... Black uh, is winning? Is he? You, you should have perpetual. Probably, 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 yeah. Okay, so you can get away with the bishop c5 and... Uh, but probably easier just to start with the move king, king g7. g7. Just don't even allow Yeah, I was about option. to say, maybe even here, there is this move b4. The difference is, if I do capture the, <laughs> the, yeah. the bishop this way, I, I'll, I'll get my queen back to the E1 square. Um, 
All right, but King G7 might be the best way just to sidestep all of these variations, but this is what I wanted to say. If I could play H5, and the difference, oh, my king is Do I have on, rook f8 here? I was about to say, my king's not <laughs> king's on e1. Too, too far. <laughs> I wanted to be able to play queen takes h5 with tempo and magically transport <laughs> my king to e2 in one turn. I don't think the Fide yeah, rules rook allow <laughs> that. I mean, brilliant idea, though. Yeah. You, you have to admit, it's very insightful and uh, great understanding. I think king f1 is important. Yes. Otherwise, if black rook cuts it, the king off on f5, then the queen won't be free. Precisely. And I do want to get my king, uh, obviously, to e1. I think, thanks to the simplified position, we can uh, take a look at some of the other positions. Has Nepo's self-destruction been completed? When we left it, we more or less said yes. Uh, he did play the move king g3, f2, knight c5, takes, takes. Perhaps rook h2 check earlier was better, but in any case, this still looks like it's all on one goal, if you will. Yes, MBL looking very good here. Can he just push e4 now? e4 looks really excellent. I'm still, sorry, help me out here. If I go check for just check a second. Check looks very good too, and bring the other rook. Yes, exactly. <laughs> King G3, I'm like, oh. uh, am I made it? Am I made it? Uh, maybe, maybe. Your your ideas of E4 uh, are looking at oh. 10 times better now that you know your rooks are somehow in the game. I don't know, this it's is looking hopeless. terrible. Uh, hopeless, in fact, for uh, Nepo. So on rook H2, I would have to play knight G2. Exactly. Knight to G2 and then I've got the B pawn in my pocket, but again, I think that E4, well, okay, uh, not the, 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 the clean victory I want. You mentioned E4, also, did you mention Rook E2? Something no, to be didn't said. didn't notice Rook E2. Something to be said for, mm -hmm. you know, doubling Rooks on the second rank, something like Rook Knight E2. Knight F1. <laughs> <laughs> Looks grim, doesn't it? Knight F1, oh boy. Yeah, yeah so just unpleasant. everything. Uh, Anish, Anish and Richie. I think they reached move 40, yes. Okay, when we left it, we kind of felt that with the move C7, Anish, slightly better because you're going to force mm -hmm. a win in the exchange. He went check, Knight B4, C7. This looks, this looks definitely drawn into now, a draw. uh, but, uh, if you're getting uh, these, uh, these endings and the clocks, are they still a factor, uh, <coughs> Nelsie? No, they just made move uh, 41. Okay, <laughs> cool. And Wesley So, wanting to join his compatriot with uh, a plus two score. How is he doing? When we left it, he was really enjoying himself. He had this... Uh, Wonderful night, uh, Diak mm -hmm. defending as tenaciously as he has been throughout the whole tournament, but not enjoying the tournament. I mean, just like, you know, you, you, if you walk away from a tournament for argument's sake, it doesn't matter, with seven draws and two losses, and you go, wow. But of those seven draws, five <laughs> you were, you know, like worse at defending, you just feel like, ugh. Terrible. This, the, the, this is uh, one of those positions where, uh, you know, Daniel's not going to be happy. But I'm sure coming into this tournament against these guys, he was yeah. expecting that he would be defending some, most of the games. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, hey, you know, <laughs> I've got my ambitions too, of course, you of know. Uh, I, I enjoy the opportunity. We're going to sneak in a break after this uh, time control has been reached, and uh, we will see you on the other side of the break. We are with uh, Vlad Gitsov. Vlad, first of all, uh, tell us a bit about yourself. I know you're a pretty decent player as well. Um, okay, uh, this is on a relative scale, depends how you define decent. I'm a 2000 rated ELO player. 
I love the game very much and I'm very happy to be here amongst the true professionals. But you're also a coach as well. Do you have any players? We know that there's some youth competitions going on around here. Do you have any players uh, here, any students? So not at the moment. Actually, I've been specializing in coaching a subset of adult improvers, as they like to call themselves on Twitter using the hashtag chesspunks. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of my students are adult improvers. And right now I'm trying to scale down a bit on the number of students because I just started a new job. You've been here since the beginning. I remember I saw you in the first edition uh, of the Grand Chess Tour held here in Bucharest. How do you feel uh, like this has progressed in the four years that we've been holding this tournament here in Bucharest? Well, actually, that's a very good question. Uh, I don't remember my first time when I was uh, visiting the Grand Chess Tour, but I have to say that I really loved last year's edition. It was my favorite. Of course, we're hoping that this year's edition is going to surpass that. But uh, the one reason why I really loved last year is because I got to hang out with Levon Aronian and his wife. We just had a great time and I really missed them. Yeah, but this year we have the world champion for the first time in Romania. We didn't have Magnus previously in the previous years, but now we have Ding Liren. We also have uh, the challenger. They just battled it all out in a world championship match. How do you feel? How do you sense their energy uh, right now? Well, I'm not surprised to hear to see that Ding made a draw in the first round, and it looks like Jan's position, despite having a very you know like active king on d4, it looks like uh, Black might have some chances to hold. But then again, don't rely too much on my evaluation. Please trust Stockfish more. <laughs> Vlad, thank you very much for joining Thanks us. Thanks so much. The St. Louis Chess Club Scholastic Program brings the educational value of chess to kids and schools across the St. Louis area. Active in over 100 schools throughout the St. Louis city and county, the St. Louis Chess Club has been able to reach over 85,000 students in both in-school and after-school programs. We view chess as a valuable educational tool. Learn more about our scholastic programming by visiting stlouischessclub.org education. Over the roughly one and a half millennia of its existence, chess has been known as a tool of military strategy, a metaphor for human affairs, and a benchmark of genius.
Welcome back, and uh, here are our results. Right, while we're on a break, we had another result, another draw between yeah. Geary and Robert. And Richie might rue the fact that he let something slip today. One definitely got away. Of the three remaining games, on the other hand, we are seeing something absolutely, absolutely remarkable as challenger Nepo, with a very big advantage, is now in a losing position. Champion, world champion Ding, Again, very big advantage is now on a losing position as both challenger and champion implode. We think tiredness <laughs> might be a factor, but boy, that's a big, big, big turnaround, uh, Var. And then you've got the remaining game of Faruja versus MVL, where we think, pardon me, uh, you've got the Nepo game uh, in front of you. Apolo uh, Absolutely, apology. yeah, I'm, I'm still a little bit shocked how Nepo yes. Uh, turned his uh, really big advantage into this position here, and we're about to see a win for MVL. He just played the E4 move, which yep. makes a lot of sense to try to break that pawn chain. Yep. And after the capture, he can even play a move like Rook H4 to bring the Rook into the game and attack on G4 here. So I think it's just completely hopeless, but we can go over some of the lines to see how MVL can actually bring the point home here. So after E4, you have to take back, otherwise, uh, F, uh, e takes f3, so for example, take and rook h4. There, yeah. there, are, there are other options too. Rook b3 is very good as well, but I like this move to include this piece into the game here. Now the threat is simply to take on g4 and... Um, With meaning ideas. Yeah, yeah, if you play knight e3, try to protect that pawn. Now simply rook takes b3, attacking the, in the knight. Suddenly we have if a passed pawn. If the knight moves, yes, we take Terrible. on g4. If you play uh, rookie one, and now you just ignore the fact that your b-pawn is saying you just continue pushing, for example. Knight d3 is also not a winning move, but here you can just, again, continue advancing. But now you're threatening to play a2 and rook b1, and uh, you should be able to win the game pretty easily. Nepo took, rook takes b6, and... Uh, e4 takes f3 on black's agenda? Yeah, you can take e takes f3, or also rook h4 <coughs> is another option here in this position, but let's let's just take. Let's just take, now the threat is mate. rook g2 mate. <laughs> so you need to do something against that. Rook d2 is the only move. If you play knight d2, you will simply lose to the move rook d8, and you will be losing your uh, knight on d2 here. The so you're gonna have switch. to play the move rook d2, which is the only move here. And uh, here actually, you have to find the only move to win. Oh, it looks pretty b, obvious b1. to me, rook b1. Yeah, yeah. B1. very natural. Yes, and uh, let's see, rook c6, trying to put pressure. Ah, and now we have this nice tactic, guys. Rook takes f1, yes. takes check. rook h1, check. King f2, check. knight e4, check. If you go king e3, uh, maybe rook e1. Maybe rook e1, or just e even, yeah, rook, I like rook e1 here, actually. Rook e1. It's better. The knight e2 also wins yes. uh, as well here. So, uh, so if you take, knight takes d2. I'm just trying to see if there are any chances to get some right. counterplay here, but I think it's just simply <coughs> losing after king e3. You take this pawn on b3, um, rook takes e6, king f7, um, rook takes, rook to, c, rook to a6. That's a very important move here. Rook, I think h3 check because you cannot go to e4 of the knight c5. So eventually, you just, mm -hmm. these pawns are going to be blockaded and uh, black will consolidate and win. But uh, it's not the only move here. Actually, in fact, there is a stronger move in this position for black, and that is the move rook h4. Not an easy move to spot. The point is now after you take, you immediately threaten to move rook to g4. And white just doesn't have a good move. Yes. Rook, F, rook c6, pardon me? Rook c6, yeah, that's then the, the main F3, line. Right? We just take. Uh, and then the difference yeah. after rook d2, g4 is hanging? Yes, yeah. now rook g2 rook is h4 in is so strong. <laughs> yeah, and if you go here, rook takes g4, check. Oh, looks terrible. Yeah. Devastating, actually. King h1, and now just simply rook b1, and I pick up the knight. Devastating. Uh, Jan is going to be so uh, distraught with himself after this game. Let's turn our attention to a game uh, where Wesley So is threatening to mm -hmm. join the lead. 
uh, remember that Wesley uh, had uh, clear uh, first at one uh, moment, and when we left, he's it, only half point behind the leader right now. Precisely, so. and if he can uh, win can against Daniel Diak, Diak, uh, knight b3. Uh, pardon me, h4, f6, knight b3. We understand from Wesley's perspective what this was all about. He wants to play knight a5, mm -hmm. knight c6, and simply target the fact that this bishop is so passive. Uh, after knight b3, rook c2 check, the I maybe maybe we're giving. Are we giving Daniel an opportunity to kind of like pin ourselves? And if uh, we try this? to play king d3 and king c3, I think problem is rook g2 possibly. Yes, probably there. So rook c2 check on the board, bishop d d2. Again, we understand what Wesley's aiming for. Uh, Rook b2, um, how close is this for Wesley? Has he? Uh, it looks like he just he blew his advantage here, guys. He and now messed it up. Yeah. Now yeah. some f5 ideas coming up for black to generate counterplay with the knight f6 at some point. But yeah, it's just rook is very active and this pin is very unpleasant. Also, yeah, you have, you're going to be able to get some counterplay here. You can even maybe play the move g5 at some point. But right here, he had a very simple idea. Yeah, sir, he could have played the move knight f1. Knight f1. Yes, the point is now you want to play bishop d, d2. And we know we want to bring that knight to e3 here. It's, it's the best square for the knight because you're going to have the knight f5 and the desired square on c4. Right. And you don't have to worry about getting pinned or anything here. And this is actually a very large advantage here for white. And the next move is bishop d2, knight e3, and your bishop can go to b4. You can apply a lot of pressure here. I think very, very unpleasant position for black, and uh, good winning chances would have been for Wesley here. So I think he just simply overlooked this idea. So knight b3 was just a step in the wrong direction. Exactly. Yeah, he probably thought knight b3, I play king d2, then I go knight a5, and I will just slowly win this game, and he just overlooked this rook c2, rook b2 idea. Interesting. Uh, I was attracted to a completely different approach myself for white. I'm looking across the board and I'm seeing this horrible, horrible setup of these four dark square pawns and this terrible bishop on e7. And I'm thinking to myself, let's, let, let, let's uh, help my opponent mm -hmm. keep his pawns on the dark squares. I was attracted to an idea of g4 and let me just point it, point <coughs> Pardon me. Boldly point out the whole conception, which was to to just totally mm -hmm. keep you cramped, uh, you know, and I love swing that the all knight. All white pawns are I on know. the white squares. Exactly. All black pawns are on the black square, and the bishop, black's bishop, is just so uh, bad. Right. In, uh, G in, four would have been also a great plan. Yes, uh, sir. A very uh, good plan. G four with the idea to you know weaken the light squares. Yeah, in the northwest, uh, the barbaric northwest, we refer to such a bishop on e7 as septic. <laughs> it's the septic bishop that just stinks to high heaven. F7, F6, but this is a this is quite the swing, guys, because uh, Wesley uh, is doing fine. He's undefeated, plus one, everything's going well, but we've, we've been saying he's leaving points on the table and that he could have even had a greater score than he currently has. He had a good position against MVL. He acquiesced to a, a, a repetition and a very good position today that he may have spoiled with his we last few moves. Give DX some credit. He's so good at defending worse positions. <laughs> he really well, is. Against these guys, it's sure. so difficult. It's a skill that you don't kind of run. I, I know when Sergey was getting the Minister of Defense ranking <laughs> and all of that good stuff, still, it's not something that you're supposed to be <laughs> that boastful about. Look at me. I get, to, I get to defend better than anybody else. Well, well done. Well done. Um, okay, we'll keep an eye on this one. Tell us why Ding Lerin's position is so bad that the computer is giving him a minus five advantage. Um, the, the main problem for him is actually he should have put the rook on e7 and try to defend uh, uh, with the king on g7, try to create a fortress. Uh, and every time you move the queen, he can play e2. But in the current position here, let's take a look. 
the problem here, uh, white is going to advance g4, g5, and pick up the g6 pawn, and uh, then the pass pawns will go through. So, so, so in this position, for example. Uh, so king e7 and rook f2 was cause was. King. The whole the whole concept yes. was completely king wrong. King seven was the blunder. And the current position here, yep. after the move king f6, you just simply play a g4. G4. Yeah, you just want to put a pawn, uh, you know, g5. You also you can play h5 next. So let's say you take on b2. Yep. Right? You, you can um, rook f2 to try to win a pawn. Right. G5. Right. Now. King g7. King g7. Yep. Queen e5 check. Got me. Have to go back, back to uh, G8. G8. Sure, and check again. Well, I can, I can, and I can already win the G6 pawn. Exactly. Yeah, I can already win the G6 pawn here. Um, and that's just devastating. Yeah, Queen E6 check, for example. And when I pick up the G6 pawn, I'm also covering <laughs> the B1 square. Yeah. Uh, you can, you can even give me a check. And uh, in this position, even if you push, let's say this pawn, <sighs> you still don't have a move. You don't have Bishop F2. Does some black so. have here rook b1, rook b2 checks? Yeah, that was why I, I was playing h5 flippantly, but uh, Var was boldly pointing out the mm -hmm. obvious. Queen takes g6. Just, just cover the b1 square. b so. square, and you win the pawn. And by the way, black's king is in a soon to be mating net. So actually, the rook on f2 gives no play. Yep, g4 is played, and I think. Uh, uh, we're gonna see uh, resignation pretty soon. There is just oh. nothing wow. you, you really can do. You don't have any plan here in this position. Okay, we're about to win second game in a row. Well, we've seen uh, you know, Fabi uh, all smiles after two wins in a <laughs> row. I, uh, my suspicion is we're gonna see a lot more smiles from Perusia yeah. <laughs> as well, uh, thanks to this back-to-back uh, -back wins. But uh, again, this is a big turnaround, uh, Dingler in. At one moment, we were talking about a very significant advantage for our newly crowned world champion, and a swing. Yeah, and know. I can show uh, how uh, how he could have actually win the game. Please. Uh, so move number thirty when he played knight f e four. This was the blunder, and instead he should have just played knight d e four in this position, and he might have missed this idea. Rook takes d eight. Yeah. Rook takes d8, knight f7, because, uh, actually, excuse me, knight f7 right away. Because it may seem <coughs> you're just losing the pawn here. But it's very, very nice idea. Rook takes d1. Yeah. You, can, you cannot take back with the queen, because then you're going to lose to this nice tactic, knight g3. King takes, or bishop takes. You're losing the rook after the move e2 here, forking the king and a rook. Nice. So you have to take back with the rook, and for a moment it seems like you're controlling everything, and now knight is going to come back to g5. But then this very strong move, knight f2, attacking the rook here, and uh, queen e4 checks. Queen e4 check, but first you have to move the rook. So rook let's f1. say rook f1. Yeah. yeah, we have the queen e4 is winning. Also, you can play a very subtle move, queen d7, now threatening to play queen 2 h3, and also you have a some ideas with queen c6 as well here too. Knight g5 forced, Var? Knight g5 is forced. Well, a4 pawn is also hanging here, but <laughs> can, can start with this check first. Spoken like a man uh, <laughs> true to my heart. Yeah, a4 now knight hanging. f3 and uh, uh, you can play. Uh, knight h5 is very good as well here. It's just, I like knight h5. Yeah, now yeah. f4, you're gonna take on f4 and uh, this is a very strong pin. Just, just concept is very strong with pawn on e three, knight on f two. It, it, it looks extremely strong here yeah. uh, for black here. Wow, uh, a, a really a huge missed opportunity, and I just, I mean, the resilience of Ding as he showed during the World Championship it was nothing short of superhuman. But I got to tell you, a, a loss like this will really, really sting. Because you know it's it's such a huge turnaround uh, to go from uh, a winning position uh, to a lo lost position. By the way, I'm looking at the game between a Nepo and MVL. We were we were lauding the fact that uh, Rook H4 mm -hmm. was really strong, but I got to tell you, when you give me this position, give me the pawn, <laughs> grab the pawn, threaten mate in one. You know how can you how could you possibly stop yourself? 
from uh, doing this. Rook d2, only move, rook f1, and we've seen that there's a combination in the offing that begins with rook takes f1 check followed by rook so h1. So can white play rook f2 to avoid that combination? Let's take a look. Rook to f2. And dun 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 dun. Maybe rook h3. I know, I was about <laughs> to say, it looks so good that I'm wondering about the move rook h3 just, you know, reminding uh, uh, white of the fact that he can barely Barely move. Can only move the other rook on b6. Okay. None of the other pieces can move. Exactly, the other move. And then the knight could jump to d3. <coughs> Excuse me. Pardon me. I've had this nasty cold for some time. And uh, once again, uh, it's it's that that, that same uh, combination of Option knight d3, can I play b6? Just hope for some miracle. Oh, sure. Sure. Knight to d3. Now, uh, some very nice checkmating combinations. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I sorry. I don't even think I need to be fancy. I think I can just take on f two, check oh, you, you have rook B3. and take on b three. Uh, I, I, I wanted to be you know stylish, if you will, but I don't think even uh, it's necessary to be stylish. I think I can just simply capture, be be gross about it. And take a knight f2. I was gonna play b7, but oh. it doesn't make sense because you still have rook b3 simply, right? Knight d7, b7. I'm somehow <laughs> I'm still kind of like looking for mates, yes. I'm kind of shocked that there, oh, there must be, yeah, something like this, right? Takes queen. queen and da, 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 da. <laughs> may I introduce nice one of the one of the many checkmating patterns that I mastered <laughs> as a 1200 and felt Or you can very start with proud. rook h1 there, yes sir, in that line. Rook See, H1. I was waiting for Bar and the coach to come in and say... The, the deflection, deflection. The deflection, deflection. Nice. Uh, however it ends, I'm pretty sure Nepo is not going to be a happy man uh, here after this move rook b1 and you know, what you were just saying about being so tied up. Once I got into a position where I was in an eternal pin, mm -hmm. and I felt so helpless, this physical sense of being bound, and it was just a terrible feeling. I said, never again. I will never, ever allow mm -hmm. uh, these eternal pins again. This pin of the rook on the first rank, this is really, well, devastating. And Jan knows it incredibly well that he has spoiled uh, a, a, you know, as, as a, a player I, I can feel his pain right now oh after absolutely yesterday's loss and then today spoil in such a good position and for Ruja the yeah. opposite the euphoria mm -hmm. of winning back-to-back -back games we do believe that uh, Ali Reza is close to that and once again let's go to Wesley so because how how badly did he blow it uh, I want to put it uh, like that to you Var uh, isn't it possible that I can somehow kick this rook out of b2 so that I can make knight to a5 to c6 in eventuality? In other words, can I play the move king to d1, king to c1, and boot this rook away from the, the, the b file? Uh, you can, actually. You probably need to try to do that, yes, sir. But okay. uh, black has two options, even not even one here, how to generate counterplay. One is to play f5. Right. Try to create a weakness on e4 and then play king f7 and jump in with a knight on f6. And the other option is just different. g5, actually, you can do. Because, g5? Yes. A little bit surprising for me as well. But if you take, uh, yeah, if king c1, just uh, uh, rook a2. Okay, rook a2. And can't I, some, uh, I'm just dreaming, Var, of knight a5 <coughs> and um, knight c6. Yes, let's see here. If you bring the king to b1, now I can play uh, rook a4 or rook a6, let's say. Um, okay, I want you to be as cooperative as, okay. as, as, as possible. So Let me rook play a4, rook a4. Rook a4. And then knight a5. Knight a5. He has rook a4 on his board. Instead of rook a6. Oh, he I, I, wanted, I wanted you to be cooperative okay. and play rook a6. Let me play rook a6, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Play rook a6. Uh, be passive. passive. Like, be passive. Yes. Please. Knight a5. Yes. Uh, now takes on h4, creating a weakness on h4 first. Good for and you. And when you capture back 
f5. Again, this is a critical move. You need this move f5, otherwise you're just simply losing here. So f5 gotcha. is very important. And you're just in time thanks to uh, the h-pawn. I, I mean, knight c6, I was trying to trap the bishop, yeah, but I'm just saying that... Yeah, bishop h4. Looks right. Like. And you just you just escape, you know, my my wrath. So say bishop b4. Bishop b4. Yes. Bishop b4 and just uh, king f7. King f7. Still looks a little dangerous for black. I know, right? Rook but b7 check. Rook b7. And now the concept is you just put the king on g6 here. Away you go. Away you fly. Hmm. Yeah, it seemed like you might get mated, but it's your take is actually just taking back with the king. Now, rook f7, just knight f6. Wow. And now the pawns are also split now. It's going to be, a, you know, very easy to attack yeah. d5. And, but again, I don't think you should, we should put the rook on a6. We can put it more active square on a4, sure. of course. So in view of these ideas of g5, gh, as well as f5, yes. does uh, it make any sense... Four is to start with a G4 bar? A G4 in this position. <coughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. If we play G4 in this position, um, black can play G6 first. Okay. Now I go uh, queenside. Let's say king D3. So king D3. Get... Yeah, now just takes. Um, <coughs> G4, okay. take, take. takes back, and this again, this very important move here, absolutely necessary move is to play F5. F5. Black pieces activate very quickly. Yeah, and... Well, uh, well, 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 <laughs> uh, G5? He takes and then G5? No, just G5. G5, G5 immediately. I, I, I want to try to keep Black's pieces But as then I take on E4. Ah, uh, gummied up as possible. Yeah, yeah. King take, take. four, and then I go king f7 with the idea to get knight g7 and bring the knight to f5. Gosh darn it, I just can't. Now, uh, white king might get made it in the center. Well, it was one of those things I was trying to get in h5 and g6. So let's try taking on f5 first and then going g5. Okay. Fair. So, so from the position where you played f5 a move mm -hmm. or two ago, yes. we're going to take. Which, which pawn? E4 takes okay. F5. Yes. G6 takes F5. Now we're going to go G5 to try to keep yeah, the knight. Yeah, this is sharp. This is a lot more sharp because now black has two connected pass pawns, white has two connected pass pawns as well. But uh, it looks like it's just equal. So let's see, F4. Angels, engine's F4. still giving Four. triple zeros. And now we have this knight C5 move. Uh, but just that, that will just uh, trade... Uh, Trade rooks here just to get rid of this pin. Well, uh, it's so close. Yeah, yeah. Uh, king e4, perhaps. King. Try to uh, blockade, but now king g7, king f7. Only I've got rook. g6 check. G6 check, and now just it takes. Takes. Yes, what? and if you take on e8. Even even bishop h4 actually uh, block no has. Way. Black has piece? enough enough contraplay here because you can't really move the knight. The bishop is hanging, and the knight back. is under attack. So let's say you go rook b8, and now black can just simply sit here with the move bishop f6. It's very dangerous. If you move the king, king f5 comes in, and then e4. There is a, there is a risk involved in this position if you let this e pawn go. So just probably have to sit with rook b6, bishop e7. And, I'm... Uh, I'm Confused, let's say. <laughs> uh, for a Ding Lirin fans, we have uh, bad news for you if you're joining us late. Uh, he is uh, suffering against Ali Reza uh, Faruja, as we're expecting Ali Reza to pick up this G6 pawn, mm -hmm. which is a very juicy pawn, and away uh, the, the white pawns go. There you see it. Queen takes G6. And I wouldn't be surprised if a, if a, a resignation... Uh, a short shortly uh, yep. didn't happen. King yeah, it's e five completely winning now. Okay, you play king e five and with uh, the queen patrolling the uh, diagonal to stop rook b one. I mean, even something to be suggested like, well, 
I don't know, age five, age six, just getting those pawns m- m- rolling, mm-hmm. roll them. Yeah. Time yeah, is not is a factor over. anymore, mm-hmm. right? No. No. No, no, not at all. And what about Nepo? Uh, bring us up to date on the so, game. So, just one sec. So, Ali Reja will be the first person to defeat the new champion? Yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember uh, after Anatoly Karpov won against Viktor Korchnoi in Murano, Viktor, who was very uh, angry with uh, the Soviets and angry with Anatoly Karpov, gave $400 to everybody and anybody hmm. who beat the world champion Anatoly Karpov. And I got these $400 checks from Victor <laughs> with a, a congratulatory oh. note, you know. I don't think anybody's doing that for Ding Lorin. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a very sweet uh, person, but uh, you're right. He will be the first player to defeat the world champion. Queen E8 check on the board. Let's see, King F4, what's the big concept here? You can simply push Just G6. G6. Yeah. And, oh, because the queen is behind the e-pawn, uh, then the king can, can move go. away. Yes. Makes sense. That's Th- a, a there are just a couple of checks there, uh, but then eventually king will go to c4. Exactly. So, so queen e8 check, king f4, g5, g6. Is, and you're welcome to give me a couple of checks. And just as you were saying, Var, white's king is very happy to step. Yeah. And actually, if you play e2, yeah, sir, it's interesting. Uh, it's fun line there. You just okay. right, right here. Uh, g6, e2? E, uh, no, no, f check, rook b1. Oh, pardon me. Uh, g6. Yeah, rook b1, check. Yep. King e2. Yep. Uh, rook b2, check. King d3, e2. e2. You can actually play even queen takes e2. <laughs> Well, that's pouring salt onto the wound, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, you don't have to. You can just yeah, play G7. Yeah, there's no way yeah. to stop uh, a future G7 and a new coronation. So maybe Rook D2 check will be played there, and then just King C4. Yep. Uh, yeah, and just uh, E2 and G7, and we could see the resignation after exactly. this. Exactly. So this bishop is really out of place on B6. So it's just you know not, the only thing it's doing is just basically defending the E3 pawn, but it's not really helping in any way to prevent the G-pawn from queening. Exactly. It's not playing uh, in any way an aggressive role. I think role. this win will mo- motivate Ali Reja to come back to chess more because defeating world champion must feel it's the so best. inspiring. It, yeah. it, 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 it's the best. <laughs> so it, motivating. It, it, it truly is. Uh, it's what I think every chess grandmaster in the world motivates them is their dream of becoming world champion to begin with Mm -hmm. as well as their dream of defeating (laughs) the world champion and it's if you are a grandmaster it's what you know like what I lived for that was what uh, I wanted was um, to play against them and I remember this very vividly I was walking in Hyde Park on my way in the Phillips and Drew tournament to uh, the Parliament building in London, and I ran into Boris Spassky, a former world champion, and as we were walking, 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 we were talking about this, that, and the other, and he says to me, who do you play today? I said, Anatoly Karpov. And he said, yeah, sir, enjoy your day in the sun. And that's exactly what it was for me, you mm-hmm. know, playing against a world champion. It was like the spotlight mm-hmm. is on you, uh, as well as the world champion, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that, enjoy your day in the sun. <laughs> By the way, I won that game. That was, uh, that was, that was really <laughs> so good. Really that was a good day. It. That was a really good yeah. day in the sun. And uh, here we, we catch up. Uh, this is the position G7, pardon me, G5, G6 on the board. G7 is coming up next. And Ding. Uh, a few spike checks before we we give it a rest, or he's seen enough. What do you think? Maybe a few more moves. Spike checks. Yes. Yeah. Do you call them spike checks as well? No. No. <laughs> no. One last great act of defiance before you resign. <laughs> you know. Before you accept your fate. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. 
Well, G6. All right. Uh, we'll keep an eye on this game. I do want to just check on Nepo because, well, he's still kicking. The pawn, okay, how do, we, we, we saw a number of different ways of how uh, white could continue. That is to say, Nepo could so just continue. Just rook h8 and rook b8 now? We were thinking, there was a reason why we might get in a rook check. Oh, the one rook was on b7, king couldn't go up. Right, but exactly. I think right now it doesn't apply. So. It doesn't apply. Okay. It's rook h8. Rook h8, and uh, be, be prepared to swing the rook around. I don't know. I. It's still a little... Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wait a minute. I mean, I, I want, you know... I want to have a cake and eat it too, right? <laughs> there's uh, there's something about uh, being a piece up where you really want to play more forcefully. Do you mind if I play rookie one check? I just want to uh, take a King look at it. D3. Okay, now I want to put my rook on B1. So you're not afraid of King C2? That was the dream. Wait, I will take rookie six first. Of course. Rook takes E6 first. And maybe then I can play King C2. I'll take your rook. You'll take mm, my rook. No, it doesn't work. And I'll yeah. jump back. Um, it's winning. It's not as clean necessarily as we would like. I like your move, rook h8, perfectly well, by the way. There's Just nothing solid. wrong with it. Yeah. <laughs> Good play. Uh, good moves. As Bobby Fischer said, I believe in good moves. I think the Hulk. Full he, quote was, I don't believe in psychology, I believe in, in good, good moves. moves. Yes, yeah. that's exactly right. Rook check. So there was a, I, there was something about wanting to uh, misplace White's king. Obviously, e2 is a Is there a some landmine. idea if king e4, he can play king f6, and I'm almost made it, but I don't know how Oh, this how is to perfect. This is what I want. I want my pawn. Mm -hmm. I want to give you a check. You're right. It's almost mate, but it's not necessary. I don't need That's mate. Mm -hmm. This is just enough. Uh, attack the pawn and this guy. Um, wow. And in their head-to-head -head match, we have to say at the top of the show, one of the really uh, extraordinary things for us is in classical chess, at least, MVL, there's Huge almost win. adoption. Uh, one victory only for Nepo. Ten draws, but look at that. Six losses. That's pretty huge. Well, we can add one more to that total as we do expect the Frenchman uh, to win and make it seven. And we do believe that Ding, uh, the last few, few minutes, has kind of been shaking his head and resigned himself to the fact that, well, there's nothing, there's nothing more to say. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the worst feelings when you lose a game and the day after that is a rest day. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Now Ali Reza left the board, so yeah, <laughs> he can't resign. What do you do now? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, first of all, a big shout out to our, our friend uh, Vichy Anon, but it's very nice when Vichy, of all the players in the world, is talking about chess commentary mm -hmm. for a world championship match because talk about a player who's won so many world championship titles I think he told me and apologies Vichy if I got this wrong but he's won over the course of his uh, illustrious career eight world championship titles when you start adding these blitz mm -hmm. and rapid and da, 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 da. and he said one of the worst things that can happen in world championship chess matches is you lose the game on the day before the rest day, because then it's perpetually with you, whereas mm -hmm. when you win <laughs> on the, the day before the rest day, you're carrying yourself uh, so much happier. And, uh, and uh, he gave us some very nice, well, he gave the world some very nice insights with his comments. And I think Ding is really waiting for his opponent to return at this moment. Nope. But you can also say that since this this will be second win in a row for Viruja, maybe he yes. doesn't want to rest there. He just wants to keep rolling. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you get in that uh, in that mode where you're mm -hmm. winning day after day after day. 
Don't stop the yeah. tournament. What's your longest winning streak, Nasi? Uh, no idea. <laughs> no idea. You no. never thought I about never, that. I never, never counted that. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Var, what's your uh, longest uh, winning streak? I mean, you know, in Grandmaster play and stuff. Uh, seven games. Bravo. Bravo. Uh, me too. Twice seven. <laughs> Seven games, and you said, and you felt like, don't, don't stop. Let's, let's keep the tournament rolling, right? Yeah, absolutely. In the U.S. Championship was four in a row in 2014. Nice. And uh, it was a really good feeling. You just, uh, after a while, you get the feeling that you can't lose. Again. Exactly, exactly. The world is your oyster. Every, yeah. Everything is going great. No, so my, there my, is one trick here. Maybe he, uh, Dean can try to play King F3. Uh, just trying to set up a background checkmate here. Yes, king f3. Uh, but then uh, you threatening have to Threatening mate in one. Yeah, threatening mate in one, and then you have to play some accurate uh, checks, like queen f7 check. Okay, first of all, just kick yeah. that qu yeah. king, queen. King e4. Okay, somehow you might be threatening perpetual, possibly. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, you are, maybe. But th then you just play queen c4 check. Queen c4 check. Okay, yes. king you got f3 again, you have to go. Yep. And then queen d5 check. Again. To make sure there is no back rank uh, ideas. And let's say king f4. King f4. And now it's finally time to play g7. And we're saying we are no longer worried about yes. our checks. Rook b1 check. King e2. Rook b2 check. Yep. And here you have to find a move king f1. King F1. I found King D1, but King F1, huh? Yeah, King F1, and uh, if Rook B1, you can just go King G2. Rook B2, just King goes to H3 simply. And if you play the move E2, you simply return to E1. Nice. And Rook B1 check, you will pick up the E2 pawn. Bishop F2 doesn't work because of uh, King, King takes F2. F2. And you don't have King G3, actually. I have a G8 queen with a check. And the last uh, uh, move would be king e3, and then queen check only five, king f3, queen f5 check, king e3, and now b1 square is covered. There is no bishop f2. Time to queen. Uh, yeah. We nice. might see it on the board. Well, I mean, you know, I, in, in view of the fact that the move king f3 does give you a chance to checkmate your you should opponent play one yeah, move, you should right? Play. You should. <laughs> you should play it. You then. should get in. It's, it's better than a spike check. I mean, the threat of mate in one. By the way, while we're... Respect the threat <laughs> of mate in one, yeah. While we're waiting for Ding to make a decision, if we jump yes. to Wesley's game, it looks yes. like a complete draw now. Does it? Like things have really, ooh, uh, the rooks, rooks have are off the board. And Black's Knight is actually in the game. So after Rook B2, the, the line that Wesley allowed, F5, perfectly, what a great time to make that break. Wesley acquiesced to the trade of rooks. And now, OK, it's still. Okay, slightly better, but yeah, I mean, oh, the, 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 the lion's share of the advantage is gone. Mm -hmm. It's just gone. Yeah, because of the counterplay against the e4 pawn, you cannot freely move your king, let's say, to b5, because you're always going to be bothered by move knight f6 or knight f2, putting pressure on that uh, weak pawn on e4. Wow, another, well, I mean, I really felt that, that Wesley, more or less from the late opening, early middle game, if you will, and gotten the kind of strategic position that he's so good at. I mean, mm -hmm. once he gets his grip on you and he gets the type of position he wanted and he got it today, he usually doesn't let his opponents escape. And it was right here where he got seduced by this idea of knight b3 to a5 to c6, imagining himself to trap this bishop, overlooking the fact that when he played knight b3, his opponent could craftily put his rook behind uh, and force the trade of rooks as we've seen and that's quite the save and somewhere in his hotel room I'm sure Fabiano is applauding <laughs> Daniel Diak and saying good game well done uh, nicely played uh, I'm glad you didn't uh, give Wesley a big point today 
Ali Riza versus Ding Laren. That is winning. And finally, let's go back to Jan. Oh, wait a minute. After, oops, excuse me. After Rook check, King here. Rook King, check? He did so play King Rook A check. Up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Check. And we've caught up. Yeah, I was wondering that. Yes. Nice. And yeah, thanks to the A pawn, Black is winning. Yes. Yes. There is. If you play rook d6, I can even bring my king over even more, king e7. Right. Exactly. But uh, the whole point of being able to play rook mm -hmm. b8, and as you say, get that pawn rolling, uh, is decisive. Somehow, whenever I see an ape on, I'm always reminded of this article by Jan Hein Donner, Grandmaster Donner, where you know he's giving this lecture on this most puny a pawn you've ever seen and he <laughs> said it's all about you ode to the pawn you know go little one go and bring me glory and uh wesley repeating uh, in this <coughs> this game with uh, daniel dak uh, <coughs> ding laren is still taking his time Right. Last few minutes. Yeah, I don't see any other ideas except King F3 for Dink here. Exactly. So. So we are expecting two decisive results today. And, and even we more. almost thought hey, I, I was almost ready to get you know to go for the trifecta <laughs> and say you know we're going to see three decisive results. So, yes, two but decisive results. It's just results. Uh, amazing that the two decisive results we're expecting will be losses for the world champion and the challenger. We said coming into our day one of broadcasting, this was a very, very strong tournament. <laughs> and I think uh, today's results are conclusive proof yes. of that exact point that when the world champion as well as challenger lose in the same round, it means you've got a competitive field. And uh, by the way, I want to just thank our audience again for sending us your social media tweets. We really enjoyed that. And one of them today was, what do you think about such events when Magnus is missing? Well, <laughs> when Magnus is missing, you know, it's one of those things where the field is so strong. Go ahead and, choo and you choose, choose your player and tell us who's going to win it. Okay. I but think we might see a resignation in the Nepal game as well soon because uh, I think now he will just he'll just consolidate bring the king to d6 and uh, so and I sorry to interrupt you uh, Var I'm just looking at Ding Laren and he, while he his eyes might be towards the board it's almost like his thoughts aren't about the current position Somewhere else, it's yeah. like he's like he's remembering and he's saying you know like where Back on move, you know, 24, I should have played this, and that was probably where I missed it, you know. Like he's carrying the baggage of all of the previous moves, and uh, and he's just yeah. he's, he's struggling with uh, his decision to resign or to continue. He decided to continue. Rook check. King e2 and king yeah. d3. Yeah. This makes it a lot easier. A lot easier. Simply just king goes to c4 now. Yes. Can he play? I know white is winning, but after king c4, if I play rook g2. So king d3, rook d2 check, king c4, rook back over to g2 to get uh, out of uh, My idea g7. Is e2? g7, e2. Yeah. Pausa? It's almost like I. You can take queen e2. <laughs> Yeah, well, to I want to be able to, I want to, yeah. sorry, I, I guess I was being a little bit too uh, overjoyed. Queen f7 looks actually easier. Maybe queen. Because I think you can pick up the rook. That's what I want to mm -hmm. do. I just want to be able to pick up the yeah, rook. Queen f7 so, check. I mean, I, I, yes. Because if I go to g file, then you promote with a check. That's and if correct. I go to e file, then queen d5 just picks up the rook. Yeah. Thank you. That definitely clears the cobwebs there, doesn't it? Queen f7 check. Yeah, that makes it. E easier, easiest of all. 
Do yeah. we have a rook check on the board, by the way? We have rook b2 on the board. Okay, so king d3 is a, let's say, an automatic? Probably king f1 is also in it instead of king d3. Also, I didn't see any reason really why I have to squirm <laughs> my way, you know, uh, <coughs> on the first rank, but I, uh, but really, king f Yeah, I, guess I so. always have checks. King g3, queen e5 check. You're right. You always have checks. Yeah. True. King f1, I guess uh, it's a choice. Uh, for me, king d3 is he went king simplest. D3. Yeah. Simple. Again, the queen on e8 is doing a great job at uh, covering the promotion square, while at the same time doing a great job of supporting the pass pawn. And now the players have picked up their pace a little bit, rook checking c4 on the board. Well, that was fun. Three checks in a row. <laughs> I mean, in the variant of three checks. <laughs> they would have won. Yeah, and we could claim. By the way, do you like uh, chess variants? Some of them, yes. They yeah. can be quite fun and challenging. Yes. Especially yes. ones where you don't, uh, you cannot, you shouldn't play like regular chess. Yeah. It's confusing because I'm calculating like normal chess, right. and that's usually a bad thing. A bad thing. So it's a challenge. By the way, rook g2 inviting queen f7 check, mm -hmm. and I think that that is absolutely a resignation. Yeah. There's nothing to decide uh, after queen f7 check, because as you mentioned, if you go to the e file, then queen d5 check picks up the rook. Conversely, if you go to the g file, g7 is about to promote with a check. Uh, with a check. And because the king I'm is... I'm just curious if, of yes. course, Ali Reja plays queen f7, but if okay. he played g7 and he thing resigns... Yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah, is g7 not winning anymore after e2? <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, uh, <laughs> I made it a little bit tricky yeah. for myself. I, I suspect it might still be winning, but I mean, you know, you kind of feel like yeah. a jerk if, you know, you, you show off. <laughs> and then it turns out not to be winning after all, and the player's there. Well, we do have a win, and what a win it was, and what a turnaround as Ali Reza. I mean, he took some risks unnecessarily, and, well, it paid off it when paid Ding Lorin moved the wrong knight to e4, and we have the return of the Grand Chess Tour champion. He was at minus one. Now he's uh, plus one. Yeah, he's a plus one, half a point behind our tournament leader, Fabi, uh, with everything to play for, with four games going. For Ding Lorin, my choice in tournament, uh, this was a painful loss. It, it really is a setback. We know that Ding's a slow starter, but wow. Uh, as the two players sitting at the board, I think both players are still, you know, uh, <coughs> reflecting on yes. uh, quite the result. Uh, jumping to Nepo's game for a moment, because this oh. is another game we're expecting a, like a resignation. A3. Oh, is that and nasty? And an insult to the injury, yes. Oh, B3. Because, oh okay, no, oh no, A3, threatening A2 and A1. And if you take the old shish kebab, rook H3 check picks up the rook, on a B3. Um, okay, I have to say that's winning with style, Var. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very nice move, A3, and I think we will see the, as soon as Ian comes to the board, we will see the resignation here. And my pick coming back in the tournament from minus one. Nobody <laughs> that's not to talk about your picks. I mean, it, it's not important, I see. You know, it was, it's the fact that you could participate, you know, sure, with the sure. world's best, <laughs> right? Oh boy, I picked Ding Lorin. I mean, okay. Uh, and you're right. Uh, oh, no, I thought that was a flourish of the signature by Nepo uh, there for a moment as he re returned to the board. And I thought he. What's he got? He got some tea, uh, teapot going on? Looks like a tea. Yeah. I think it's been a very long time since he lost two games in a row. 
in a classical tournament. Yes. Yes, uh, very much so. As he came into the tournament, he was talking about get a rejoining, if you will, the 2800 mm -hmm. club. And as he got off to a good start, I said, uh, Nepo, you're going to have to raise the bar <laughs> a little bit there. Uh, get, join the 2850 club, <laughs> you know. That's something you should aspire to. And uh, now I think this loss is going to knock him right back out of the 2800 uh, club. I don't know what the what the live ratings will show, but this was not good. Now Nepo, much like Ding, I think is not looking at the current position, more like reflecting on... What went know, wrong? Yes. Uh, boy, have we been there before. Yeah, what an idiot I am. Why did I wake up? Uh, <laughs> why did I fall out of bed? I should have just stayed at home. But by the way, nobody uh, abuses himself quite like Nepo. Nepo will tell you he's that he's the worst player ever, that he shouldn't even yeah. be playing chess. And we're all saying, dude, you know, like you've won two candidate matches, and there you go. He's had There's enough. resignation. With the white pieces, too. And for MVL, who's been playing like an idiot, he loses yesterday to, Fo uh, to Fabi in a miniature, or whatever it was, whenever two he lost. Yeah. Two days ago in a miniature. What a stunning turnaround today mm -hmm. is. Again, uh, Nepo had all of the advantages you could ever dream in an Alapin, and... Chess can be really cruel sometimes. And then you <laughs> die. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's the other game is about to finish as well. I think Diak, uh, they exchanged the knights, and now uh, the bishop d8 has been played as well. So we're going to see a repetition in this game soon. And let's uh, go to uh, Christian uh, in Bucharest, Romania. Alireza, back-to-back victories for you, but uh, most importantly, I think it's for the first time that you're uh, beating a world champion. You've tried against Magnus uh, quite a few times. You didn't manage to get him while he was a world champion, but now you got uh, your first scalp of a world champion. How do you feel right now? Yeah, I feel really happy. Um... Yeah, for sure, it's an easier world champion than Magnus, but um, of course, Ding is very strong. And, um, I'm really happy to get this victory because now I moved to plus one and it's really important. And this game was not easy. You were actually under pressure out of the opening, out of the middle game, and I think at one point he was even winning. He showed you a move at the end of the game. What was that move? It was, um, should we go to the yeah, position? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was around here. I think uh, here I, he, out, he got outplayed here actually. Um, I think g6 is a terrible move mm -hmm. to, weak, to make the king weak, but already I don't like h5, which or just knight c5 is just equal. But he was a bit aggressive and maybe he felt to be like he has to be aggressive because he doesn't have two bishops so. But yeah, he took here. Here I couldn't find the best move. Bishop a2 is really difficult. Oof. First I thought I'm So what's the plan of this bishop? Um, it's just prophylactic, uh, pre preventing knight d6, which was the whole problem for me the whole game. Uh, first I thought I'm winning with queen c2 in my calculation, but of course queen c5 and I lose. This was the first cold shower. <laughs> yeah. and, and then... Um, I felt knight g5, yeah, bishop a2 probably I'm winning. But yeah, knight g5 is not a good move on here, he's okay. I couldn't make bishop 4 work for me because knight h5 is probably just nothing. Queen e5, queen d7, very important. Yeah. And so I decided. He's hanging on with right. his knight on d6, defending yeah, everything. But yeah, but I felt like I should not be worse here, bishop, my bishop on a2. So h4, rook f1, here are normal. But yeah. I'm probably like, my bishop on d2 is very bad and... And in fact, uh, I want to uh, chime in on this position. How did you assess it at this point? Because I came into the playing hall and you were, I think, down to your last yeah. six minutes. He still had around yeah, double was, your time. Yeah, it was getting out of my hand. Um, it was getting out of my control because in Pre few previous moves I was in control and then I lost the control and I got down on time. But you still looked comfortable. Yeah, because at least from the outside. Yeah, because practically there is always a chance here because with the bishop on a2. But 
Um, so he was also going down on time, so it was very important moments here. And yeah, he told me after the game, knight d4, that he probably was winning, but still, I said knight f7, and he told me rook d2 after the game, but I don't think it's a good move, yeah. Rook d2, and this seems to somehow. Yeah, he told me rook takes d2, knight takes d2, bishop h6, king h7, rook f4. He told me he has knight h5, but I told him I have these, and I win again. But it's such a complicated position. Yeah, right? yeah, it's really complicated. And understanding, for instance, the computer says rook takes d1 is winning here is really crazy because you're giving up the d file for no like. And then you plug it with knight. Yeah, knight f2. Okay, no, no, knight f2. Knight f2. Okay. Yeah, and for a human, for instance, to all I have all this bishop h6, knight g5. It's difficult. Yeah. So, um, yeah, for was it only move knight d4? I think it was among the only ones. Yeah, it's such a complicated position, and if you don't do something as black, then you know, right. bishop d6 is coming, yeah, yeah, yeah. you have always problems Here with that. He thought for, I think, like six, seven minutes. He, th he thought for a while. Yeah. yeah, and he settled for draw, I think, in his mind. He, he thought he's not better anymore. Yeah, of course, if you see knight d4, you win, but uh, he couldn't see it. And yeah, here, I think he missed, calculated knight e5 check in his. Mind like he checked all of this, and I think he maybe here he wanted yeah, to go yeah, into. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'm maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe he saw all of this, but he probably missed ninety five. Covers everything. Here. Yeah, this is so nice. So, but maybe he <laughs> saw it and he voluntarily went for this position, which I think it's really hard to assess. But I thought I'm winning. Yeah, but maybe it's draw. <laughs> Um, it's draw, but even if it's draw objectively, it's much easier to play for yeah, you. Yeah. You have always checks and... Yeah, and here I was still lucky that he didn't gain the time that he needed. He has two, I think two minutes here is draw. This is move 36, yeah. he still has yeah, yeah. four moves to make. I think, and he has less five. time now, five minutes here. Five minutes, yeah, drop he, down to his last minute right, in fact, right. with this move. Yeah, I felt he has to keep the king here, but it's still, um, I wanted to go here Oh, maybe activating bishop, bishop to d6, yeah. So explain to us the decision between him going towards the center and him going towards he just the king got, side. I think he sat here for three, four minutes and he thought that he's just lost and he gave up, I think. <laughs> and he just wanted to make some move in the last second and he didn't understand that he has a still chance probably. Mm. Which is also, I thought also that I'm winning now, king comes to e1 and so I don't have a good explanation for Kingsan because he left the g6 pawn very weak. Ah, so um, that's why probably just yeah. to defend that g6 pawn. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, and the rest is just easy. I just pushed and, and I pushed the two pawns and it's just. Me. Well, Ali Reza, it definitely uh, feels like you warmed up and you're finally getting uh, your type of play uh, on the board. Congratulations. Big victory for Thank you today. You. Go enjoy it and we'll see you in a couple of days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Ali Reza. Well, let's take a look at our standings after a very eventful round five with some really, really huge swings. Yeah, Nancy. we have... Uh Few things change in the leaderboard. Yes, we do. So Fabiano Caruana is still in a solid lead with three and a half points. And but guess we have who showed <laughs> up? <laughs> Our top seed Firuja joined uh, Wesley So and Richard Rappert with exactly. plus two, plus one, plus one score. With a plus one score at fifty percent is Anish and uh, MVL. Yeah. Uh, quite the surprise. And uh, world champion and the challenger moving down in the list with minus one. Crazy. Tomorrow is a free day, everyone. Uh, don't tune in tomorrow, <laughs> but, uh, but thereafter, we do have more exciting pairings. Right, we'll have uh, Maxime Achille Grave against Rapper. Well, there you go. Uh, talk <laughs> about a leader's group right there. Diak against Giri. Mm -hmm. Ding, wanting to come back in the tournament, playing the leader was Lissot. But check this out. Fabi versus Ferruja. <laughs> Our two tournament, uh, well, leaders, if you will, at the very yes. top. And, and let's go to Bucharest mm -hmm. with uh, Christian with MDL. Maxim, a very difficult game for you. You were on minus one, and after the opening, uh, it was a difficult position. He was putting a lot of pressure on you, but you were your resilient self and managed to turn it around. How do you feel right now? Yeah, of course, it feels great to, to win. I didn't like my position at all. 
I don't know where I went wrong in the opening, but um, this end game turned out to be a lot more difficult to play than I thought at first. And then I found a setup that I didn't like at all with this knight on b7. Let's take a look. But at least... So uh, he surprised you with this Alapin? Yeah, yeah, this Alapin I didn't expect at all. I probably... When's the last time you checked the Alapin? <laughs> no, I check, it on, too much, but... I check it on occasions. Really? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Like, not in this tournament, but I definitely checked it last year, like, maybe even this year, so... Yeah, yeah. But uh, still, it's difficult to remember the details. Yeah. And, well... And he was also playing extremely fast. Yeah, extremely game. fast and quite well, because... I just thought, here yeah, I should be all right, but then after knight fd2, I realized, yeah, it's not so easy, because... Yeah. Probably this suggestion by computer to play a5. I didn't want to commit to a5, but mm. turned out in the game I had to, so... Uh, you play knight f6, knight b3. Yeah. What was it about the position that you didn't feel comfortable with? No, simply, he keeps all the pieces. Um, my pawns are sometimes weak, and I don't have so much space for my, mm. for my minor piece. So, yeah, I really didn't like... Is at all, so that's why I decided at some point to just allow a pair of bishops and try to get some counter play with this knight c5. Play with the knights. <laughs> yeah, and this was ugly, but. Had to be done. Had to be done. And at this point, it looks innocuous, right? You open up the h file, but it doesn't seem like you're doing anything on no, the h file. No, it doesn't, but then suddenly. It did. So anyway, like, my plan was to exchange pair of rooks anyway. I want rook d8, for instance. Mm -hmm. And if bishop e7, I guess I want rook c7. They played a bit carelessly, like very fast also to put pressure on time. But yeah, suddenly it becomes tough because... And bishop d6, I realize I have knight d7. And here I thought bishop c7 he has to bail out, but of course it's tempting to... Mm, to continue to, playing, yeah. Yeah. Bishop c7, I take, I take, I play f6. I thought maybe, maybe I'm even trying. I mean, I, I didn't think so, but like my knight is coming to c5, so it's very pleasant. Mm -hmm. And uh, if bishop e7, yeah, knight e5, bishop g5, I thought this was quite important, but he just wins. Yeah. Very nice. And then after b3, I mean, at first, like, I saw this move, but I didn't consider it seriously. And I was a bit down on time, so I, I was feeling uh, I should have, uh, instead of taking walks, maybe. <laughs> but I was expecting bishop c7 at the same time, so. Um, and that's quite unusual for you. You're not very often in time trouble situations. My position was sh <laughs> sh shitty, yeah, like there's no other word. <laughs> Yes. Pardon my French. Yeah, hard my, that's a good one, yeah. So anyway, then I realized I have f6. And yeah, when I saw that after bishop e8, I have knight e5. And suddenly, like, normally it felt like, you know, when I exchange bishop against knight, his knight on g2 is covering everything. Mm -hmm. But once my pawn is on e5, which seems ridiculous at first sight, but then I always get e4, e4 and the knight on b7 gets into play. And then, uh, well, I don't know because I, I don't know if it was always winning, if he had a draw, like this, I really don't know. But, uh, but at, this point, at the very least, when it get, got to here and he thought for a while, I realized, yeah, I'm, I'm winning with this rook h3 check at the end. Quite and, important and, and detail, yeah. so interesting, right? Because after rook to d6, I was trying, I was looking uh, in the playing hole at the position, and in fact, I had no idea how to assess it. And then I come back and I see minus 3.6 on the engine. Oh, I mean, I knew winning. I have zero chance to lose, first of all, yeah. and that I have what looks like a decisive attack. Like, so you so assessed it as much better for pro you? Yeah, probably winning, but of course I had to prove it, and it was not that easy yeah. to intricate. <laughs> I mean, to, uh, and to intricate all the details, but... And you repeated once, very professional. Uh, and, uh, I, it, just because Jan got, got up, so I thought I'm going to win time. <laughs> That's <laughs> very professional. Yeah. <laughs> yes, rook takes b6, take on f3. Be careful not to get checkmated on g2. Yeah. And uh, when was it 
clear for you? Was it, at this point, I would assume you were already kind of sure about the victory. I mean, I was not completely sure. First of all, there was a move on King Isri, but I knew I, I knew that you know his pawns were stopped. Um, but yeah, and I mean, I have I need Rook H3. I think Rook H8 is a draw. No, may actually not. I thought I thought it was. Um, well, then Rook H2 is uh, Rook H3 check is unnecessary flourish, but of course it's nice to to bring his king to F2. <laughs> yeah, Maxim, uh, a big victory with the black pieces, and especially uh, sweeter whenever you win against such a strong opponent such as uh, Jan. He's a world championship challenger twice. He has uh, a luggage filled with opening preparation. Um, congratulations. We'll see you in a couple of days. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye. you, Christian. And our congratulations to MBL. Uh, wow. Uh, Still a huge, huge turnaround. We saw two huge turnarounds, and our standings have been really shaken up. Our, you know our pairings. But let's get some final thoughts about, uh, oops. Uh, I had a good day. No, we're not doing well, Yasser. I had a great day. Uh, I don't know, Vara. I don't know. What dinner? <laughs> Christian and Daro are very happy. <laughs> Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I've done better. Let's just put it like that. Uh, final thoughts of a very eventful first half of the tournament to begin with. We've had five rounds under our belt, but most especially the turnarounds of today. Absolutely. Huge turnarounds. And Ali Reza could have very simply lose the game, but instead he won. Same thing for MVL. Uh, he managed to win this position. I couldn't believe that he could ever win that position, but the Nepo just simply self-distract. And Fabiano still at the top with a plus two, but now with Ali Reza coming up, I think it's going to be a very interesting matchup. They face each other next, and uh, that could be the big game of the tournament. So I'm looking forward to, to see how they're going to come back after the rest day and see some interesting games. We're going to go to Christian in Romania. Well, guys, what uh, a day. And I told you at the beginning of the broadcast, this is the day before the rest day. And you know these players are going to take uh, extra risks. And this is exactly what we've seen so far. Ali Reza against Ding. What a game that was. What a complex game in which, uh, I have to say, none of the players actually knew uh, who's better and why. And to be honest, nobody knew unless you have an engine and unless you have hours and hours of analysis at home. So that was such a complicated game and I cannot blame Ding for not playing knight d4 and playing knight fe4 is such a trivial decision that makes uh, uh, such a big difference and that was just an incredible game and of course this one between Jan and MVL. Jan, right now, it feels like he's collapsing for the moment. He's definitely going to have to take this rest day and try to uh, stir the ship, get back into this tournament because back-to-back -back losses, it's never easy to recover from, especially when uh, you're already bringing such uh, a damaged, let's say, machine from the World Championship match because, you know, that took its toll on him. So. This one is going to be very difficult for Jan, but we also know how resilient he uh, can be. He's uh, shown that time and time again. Guys, we have an open tournament in front of ourselves for the next four rounds. Tomorrow it's a rest day. I'm going to uh, take my rest. I would assume you guys are going to enjoy your rest day as well, and I will see you in a couple of days. Thank you, Christian. Indeed, uh, everyone here in St. Louis is looking for tomorrow rest day. But that round six promises to be epic. Do join us for round six. And in the meanwhile, good night. Have a great day. Thank you for watching. This has been a presentation of the St. Louis Chess Club. Any reproduction or distribution of this content without the express written consent of the St. Louis Chess Club is prohibited.